Mercury Theatre on the Air presents Orson Welles as Count Dracula in his own version of Bram Stoker's great novel, Dracula. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Arthur Seward. I'm here tonight to bear witness to the truth of certain events which you may find it hard to believe, but I ask you to believe them. I have here certain documents, telegrams, clippings from the press of the day, memoranda, and letters in various hands. All needless matters have been eliminated, so that a history almost at variance with the possibilities of contemporary belief may stand forth as simple fact. I present you first with excerpts from the private journal of Jonathan Harker. I, Jonathan Harker, lawyer's clerk, article to Peter Hawkins, Esquire of Exeter, England, am writing this journal in the hope that if misfortune overtakes me, it may one day come to the eyes of those who love me. I set out from London on the last day of April to visit one of our clients in Eastern Europe. On May the 3rd, I arrived in Budapest and came after nightfall to Klausenburg on the borders of Transylvania. At Bistritz, there was a letter of welcome for me from our client, informing me that his carriage would await me at the Borgo Pass. It was signed... Dracula. Bukovina! Couch for Bukovina! The road was rough, but still we seemed to fly over it with feverish haste. When it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement among the passengers. They kept speaking to the driver and looking at me and urging him on to greater speed. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather string. The mountains seemed to come nearer to us on either side. Coachman! Coachman! What is it? Where are we? You are nearing your destination, young hare. This is the Borga Pass. There were black, rolling clouds overhead, and in the air the heavy, oppressive sense of thunder. Now, we were through the pass. The young hare is not expected after all. You are early tonight, my friend. A calèche with four horses are drawn up beside us. Let me help you, sir. The coachman smiled, and the lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth as white as ivory. We began to move. I looked back. The coach and its load of passengers had vanished from sight. We swept into the darkness of the past. I struck a match. It was within a few minutes of midnight. And then... A dog began to howl somewhere far down the road. The wind was rising, moaned and whistled through the rocks, and the branches of the trees stacked together as we swept along. It grew colder and colder still, and fine powdery snow began to fall. The baying of wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though, as though they were closing round us on every side. We kept on ascending, always ascending. The howling of wolves was growing less. Presently, it ceased. Altogether, And just then, the moon broke through the black clouds, and by its light, I, I saw round as a ring of wolves running alongside the carriage, in silence, with white teeth and lolling red tongues, with long, sinuous limbs and shaggy hair. Welcome to my house. I must have fallen asleep. The carriage had pulled up in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle. The coachman was nowhere to be seen. Welcome to my house. Come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. Count Dracula? I am Dracula. His face was strong, very strong, aquiline. The mouth, so far as I could see under the heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking with peculiarly sharp white teeth. Mm. You hear me, Mr. Harker? Uh, the wolf? The children of the night, as you say, Mr. Harker. The wolves. Listen. 
Mm. Come now. There are many things you must tell me tomorrow. Of England and of the estate there you have purchased for me. Ah, uh, yes. The estate is called Carfax, I believe. Yes, that is so. But now I will detain you no longer. You will find your room in readiness. And I advise you not to leave it during the night. This castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. I explored. There are doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all of them locked. The door to the great hall, the door to the courtyard, every door in the castle is closed, bolted against me. The castle of Dracula is a prison, and I am a prisoner. The next night, I couldn't sleep. So after a few hours, I got up and lighting my candle, I placed my shaving mirror on the dressing table and was just beginning to shave. You seem restless, Mr. Harker. I hadn't seen him, although the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. I turned to the glass again. Count Dracula was close to me, and I could see him over my shoulder, but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. It was blank. I started and cut myself on the side of the throat. The blood was trickling down my neck. Ah! Count, my mirror! <coughs> The blood! The blood! Wipe the blood from your face, Mr. Harker. And take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. When I awoke, I found most of my things were gone. My passport, my notes, my letter of credit. I could find no trace of them anywhere. And... My door is locked from the outside. June 20th. There is work of some kind going on in the castle. Now and then I hear the faraway muffled sound of mattock and spade. And last night, the second of the predated letters which Dracula made me write, the second of that series which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth went forth. Dracula. Yes, my young friend. Well, what of me? When am I free? When can I leave this place? Free? Mr. Harker, you're always free. You want to leave? Would you like to leave tonight? Yes, yes, in God's name. My dear young friend, not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will. Come, follow me. Hmm. The door seems to be bolted. How strange. The door is locked. Well, in God's name, open it. As you will, Mr. Harker. You English have a proverb which is very close to my heart. Welcome the coming, speed the parting guest. Good night, Mr. Harker. <laughs> shut the door! Shut the door! I tell you, shut the door! Shut... The door is shut, Mr. Harker. I take it. You will remain. <laughs> Morning, June the 30th. These may be the last words I ever write in this diary. Oh, God preserve my sanity. I have never seen Count Dracula by day. At sunrise, at the first cock crow, he is gone. I... I don't understand these things. I only know that the wolves obey him, and that he is a man with hair on the palm of his hands, with sharp teeth, and no blood in his face. He casts no shadow. He cannot be seen in a glass. And he moves like a bat across the sheer face of the castle walls. He eats no food and is mortally afraid of the crucifix. As I write this, I hear in the courtyard the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips. And there is in the passageway below a sound of heavy boxes being set down. Boxes shaped like coffins. And I know what they hold. Boxes are filled with holy earth from the chapel beneath the castle. It's the last box being nailed down. And now I hear the heavy feet tramping again. The door shut. The chains rattle. In the courtyard and down the rocky way, the roll of heavy wheels, the cracks 
cracked his whip. Help! 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 The wagons have gone. I'm alone in the castle. I'm alone in the castle. I'm alone in the castle. I'm alone. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Seward. Mr. Harker's journal terminates at this point. I now present in evidence a clipping dated August 8th of that year from the Yorkshire Telegraph from our correspondent in Whitby. One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record is experienced here today. The weather has been somewhat sultry, but Saturday evening was fine. The band was playing. The piers were crowded with holiday makers. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and there was a dead calm... There were but few lights at sea. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner under full canvas, which was seemingly going westward. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. And there, with all sails set, was the foreign schooner rushing with terrific speed toward the shore. A searchlight was turned on her. And there, lashed to the helm, was a corpse with drooping head which swayed horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. A moment later she crashed. And then a strange thing was seen. At the very instant she touched, a huge dog sprang up on deck from below and running forward jumped from the bow onto the sand and making straight up the east cliff toward the graveyard vanished into the night. The coast guard going aboard at dawn found the dead man fastened to a spoke of the wheel. Tightly clutched in one hand was a crucifix. The man must have been dead for quite two days. In the pocket of the dead man's coat was found a bottle, carefully corked, containing a roll of paper. This proved to be an addendum to the ship's log. It was found on board only a small amount of cargo and that of a most unusual nature. Apparently the ship carried nothing but earth. Common earth. Packed away in wooden boxes. Shaped much like coffins. Log of the Demeter. Russian flag, Black Sea, to Whitby. July 6th. Finished taking in cargo, a queer cargo, boxes of earth. At noon, set sail, east wind, fresh, crew, four hands, two mates, cook, and myself, captain. July 11th. Entered Bosporus. At dark, passed through Dardanelles. Mate reported in morning that one of crew, Balyodin, was missing. Took Larbert to watch eight bells last night. He was relieved by Chilean. Yeah, came to his bunk. something aboard oh. the ship. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Don't laugh, Captain. In the rain last night. Oh. A tall, thin man go up companion way and along the deck forward and disappeared. When I go to the bow, no one. And the hatchways all closed. July 22nd. Rough weather last three days. All hands busy with sails. No time be frightened. Past Gibraltar and out through straits. All well, July 24th. Last night, another hand was lost. Disappeared. By Galician. Leave all March, midnight. Then we never see him again. Oh, double watch now. If I don't take watch alone no more. Double watch. Double watch. July 29th. Had single watch tonight as crew too tired to double. When morning comes... Hey! Hey, Milo! Barrow me! Barrow me! He's barrow me, Milo! Barrow me, God! Oh, barrow me, God, like the us! Like all the us. The mate and I have agreed to go armed henceforth, July 30th. Last night, we are nearing England. Weather fine. All sails set. Captain! Captain! The man in the watch is sails are missing! Most missing! Now, only self and mate and one hand left to work ship. August 3rd. Two days of fog and not a sail sighted. At midnight, I went to relieve the man at wheel. And when I got to it, found no one there. It's here! I know it now. I saw it. Like a man, 
tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bars looking out. I gave it the knife and my knife went through it. What? Empty as air. What is it? What are you talking about? It's here and I'll find it. It's in the hold. In one of those boxes of earth. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. And see. He is mad. Stark raving mad. It's no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes. They are in voice that's common earth. <laughs> he's, he's there. Down in the cold. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him. That's all that's left. That's all that's left. August 4th. I am all alone on my ship. And still the fog. I dared not go below. I dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed. And in the dimness of the night, I saw it. I saw him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a sailor in the blue water. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail. And along with them I shall tie that which it dare not touch, my crucifix. I... I am growing weaker, and the night is coming on. God and the Blessed Virgin help a poor, ignorant soul trying to do his duty. <coughs> Telegram, keyword perfect to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. Lucy was ten in alarming condition. Cannot diagnose. Come at once. Seward. Telegram. When helping Amsterdam to Seward, Percy. I'm on my way to you. Please arrange the examination immediately. My arrival from Helsing. Ladies and gentlemen, I must now explain that six months before the events recorded here, I had become engaged to a young lady, Lucy Westenra. We were to have been married in the spring. My old teacher, Professor Van Helsing, arrived at four the next afternoon. I took him at once to Lucy's house. She lay in a bed asleep. She was ghastly, chocolate pale. The red seemed to have gone even from her lips and gums. And the bones of her face stood out. Young miss is bad. Very bad. She must have blood or she will die. Yet she is not anemic. The qualitative analysis of her blood gives quite normal conditions. It is strange. I do not like to think how strange. Look! My God, her throat, look! The black velvet band that she always wore had dragged up a little and showed a red mark on her throat. Just over the external jugular vein were two punctures, not large, but not wholesome looking. The edges were white and worn looking. Well? Well, what is it, Professor? What's wrong with her? Speak frankly, you can tell me the worst. I wish I could, Stuart. I wish I could. But I do not dare. But won't you tell me any, anything? I will tell you this. Your young lady is in a danger greater than death. You must believe me. If you leave her for one moment and harm befalls, you will not sleep easy thereafter. September 8th. I sat up all night with Lucy. Arthur, I'm afraid. My dear, you can sleep tonight. I'm here watching you. Nothing can happen. And I promise if any sign of bad dreams, if I see anything, I'll wake you at once. You will? Will you really? Then I'll sleep. I sat all night by her bedside. She did not wake once during the night, although a bows or a bat or something flapped almost angrily 
against the window panes. September 11th. Still quoting from my private journals. It was this time that I received a message from Perfleet. It read 10.20 p.m. St. John's Hospital. Serious complications. Case 891. Your immediate presence, London. Imperative. I had no choice. Sometime later, a paper was found among Lucy Westenra's belongings. I write this and leave it to be seen so that no one may by any chance get into trouble through me. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the window was closed, as Dr. Van Helsing had directed. About two in the morning, I awakened. I went to the door, called out. Arthur! Arthur! There was no answer. Something's broken the window. I'm in the room, alone. I dare not go out. The house seems empty. The air is full of specks, floating, circling in the draft from the window. And the light burns blue and dim. What am I to do? Something very sweet and very bitter all around me. Nothing sinking into deep water. And there's singing in my ears. You shall be flesh of my flesh. Blood of my blood. Ah. September 12th. Late. Only resolution and habit can let me make an entry tonight. We found her sprawled on the floor. There was a draft in the room from the broken window. Her throat was bare, showing the two wounds, looking horribly white and mangled. We are too late, my friend. We have failed. God's will be done. She's dying. Yes. She's dying. Stay beside her. It will make much difference, mark me. Whether she dies conscious or in her sleep. It was late in the afternoon before she opened her eyes. Arthur, oh, my love, I'm so glad you've come. I took her hand and knelt beside her. Her breath came and went like a tired, peaceful child. And then the light from the setting sun fell on her face and then, insensibly, a strange change came over her. Her eyes grew suddenly dull and hard. Her breathing was heavy. The mouth opened and the pale gums drawn back made the teeth look large and sharp. Arthur, oh, oh, my love. I'm so glad you've come. Kiss me. Bend down and kiss me. Not for your life. Not for your living soul and hers. <laughs> Lucy! She's dead. Poor girl. There's peace for at last. The end. Not so. It is only the beginning. Wait and see. The Westminster Gazette, September 25th. A Hempstead mystery. The Kensington horror, the stabbing woman, and the woman in black are vividly recalled to mind by a series of events that have taken place recently in the neighborhood of Hempstead. Several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or failing to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children have given us their excuse that they have been with a beautiful lady who offered them chocolate. In each case, the child was found to be slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wound seems such as might be made by a rat or a small dog. The Hampstead Horror, another child injured by the beautiful lady. We have just received intelligence that another child missed last night was only discovered late in the morning. It has the same tiny wound in throat. Well, Stuart, 
What do you think of that? You mean to tell me, my friend, that you still have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of? Nervous prostration, following great loss and waste of blood. And how was the blood lost or wasted? You are a clever man, my friend, and a good doctor. But you do not believe that there are things that you cannot understand. You are wrong, Stuart. Are you aware of all the mysteries of life and death? Can you tell me why in the pampas there are bats that come at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry those veins? Hmm? How in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on trees all day and then when the sailors sleep on deck because it is hot, flit down on them and then in the morning are found dead men as white as Miss Lucy was? I understand none of these things. After tonight, Stuart, if you dare to come with me, perhaps then you will understand. September 29th. Before dawn. Now it is done. And I would sooner die a thousand deaths than live again through what I did this night. We will spend the night, you and I, here in this churchyard where Miss Lucy is buried. We enter the tomb, then we open the coffin. You shall yet be convinced. Take care, Van Helsing. Miss Lucy is dead, is it not so? Then there can be no wrong to her, but if she is not dead... With some difficulty, we found the West Denver tomb. I took up my place behind a yew tree. On one side of the tomb, Van Helsing on the other... Killed and frightened. Suddenly, I saw something moving between two yew trees. A dim, white figure which held something at its breast. The figure stopped. I could not see the face, for it was bent down over what I saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a sharp little cry, such as a child gives in sleep, or a dog as it lies before the fire. And dreams. Then the thing saw us. She drew back with an angry snarl. The lovely blood-stained mouth grew to an open square. If ever a face meant death, I saw it at that moment. Then suddenly she turned and vanished in the direction of the tomb. Child is not harmed. We leave him in a safe place where the police find him. There's more to do. Come! Now we were in the tomb. Then in the coffin. The thing lay... Like a nightmare of Lucy, the pointed teeth, the blood-stained mouth. Then Helsing never looked up. From his bag, he took out a book, his operating knives, a heavy hammer, and a round wooden stake, some two or three inches thick, sharpened to a fine point, and hardened over a fire. Stuart! The life of this unhappy woman is just begun. When she become what you call undead, there comes with a change the curse of immortality. She cannot die, but must go on age after age adding new victims because all that die from the praying of the undead become themselves undead and prey on others. So the circle goes on, ever widening as the ripples from a stone thrown in the water. But if this lady, this undead, be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall be again free. Tell me, what am I to do? Take this stake in your left hand. The hammer in your right. Yes. Place the point over the heart. Yes. Then, when I begin the prayer for the dead, in God's name, strike. <laughs> Are you ready? Now. Domine Jesu Christe, Fili de Vivi, qui manus tuas ex voluntate patri. On the morning of July 11th, a man was found on the border of Transylvania. He talked wildly of wolves and boxes of earth and blood. He gave his name as Jonathan Harker. In the hospital at Clausenburg, he improved sufficiently to make possible his removal to England. I'm still quoting from my own personal papers. But though his condition remained so serious that he was committed for observation to a private ward in my hospital at Percy. Here he did so well 
that in three weeks he was completely recovered. It was during this time that his wife, Minna Harker, brought to the attention of Dr. Van Helsing and myself the journal that her husband had kept while a prisoner in the castle of a certain Count Dracula in Transylvania. I have before me the record of a meeting that took place in my study in Perthleet, transcribed by Mina Harker. October 1st. Meeting began soon after 8. Jonathan next to me. Dr. Seward opposite to Van Helsing at the head of the table. My friends, there are such things as vampires. Had I known at first what now I know, one so precious life had been spared to many of us who love her. The vampire which is amongst us is of himself so strong that he can direct all the elements. The storm, the flood, the thunder. He can command all the meaner things. The moth and bat, the owl and the fox and the wolf. How then are we to begin our strike to destroy him? How shall we find his place? And having found it, how can we destroy him? My friends, it is a terrible task that we undertake. To fail here is not mere life or death. If we fail, we become as him. Foul things of the night as him. What do you say? I answer for myself. Come me in. I'm with you. The professor laid a small golden crucifix on the table. We took hands, and our solemn pact was made. My friends, we too are not without strength. The vampire flourishes on the blood of the living. Without this, he cannot live. He throws no shadow. He makes no reflection in a mirror. He can transform himself to a wolf, to a bat. He can come on moonlight rays as elemental dust he can see in the dark. He can do all these things. Yet he is not free. His power ceases at the coming of the day. Then, until night, he must remain in the shape in which he finds himself, and except in his coffin home, in those earth boxes he cannot rest. When we can confine him in his coffin, then, my friends, if we obey what we know, we will destroy him. At that moment, something flapped wildly against the window, then... Did you hit it? I don't know. We looked out of the window. Against the black sky, we could see nothing. Data on our position. From the Count's castle in Transylvania to Whitby came 50 boxes of earth. All of these, to our certain knowledge, were delivered at Carfax. Recently, 12 of these boxes have been removed. First step ascertain whether all the rest remain in the deserted house next door or whether any more have been removed. We must trace each of these boxes and sterilize the earth with holy water so that he can no longer seek safety in it. And we must hurry. The events of the next few days are described in Jonathan Harker's journal. October 2nd, 5 a.m. Just returned from the empty house. Left Mina here at home. Well, we've done our work at Carfax. The place was filthy. The air stagnant and foul and alive with rats. We counted the boxes. Only 38 of them. And over each one, the professor went through his same mysterious work. It was dawn when we got back. I found Mina asleep. She looks paler than usual. October 2nd. Soon after they left, I fell asleep. I remember hearing the sudden barking of the dogs. And then there was silence. I got up and looked out of the window. There was a thin streak of white mist moving across the grass along the wall of the house. It dawned on me that the air in the room was heavy and dank and cold. The gaslight came only like a tiny red spark through the fog. I could see through my eyelids. The mist grew thicker and thicker. Then, as I looked, the spark divided and seemed to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes. You shall be flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, blood of my blood. <sighs> October 2nd, 8 p.m. 
They're on the track. Twelve boxes were delivered last week to an empty house at 347 Piccadilly. My dear friend, until the sun sets tonight, Dracula must retain whatever form he now has. We have this day to hunt out all his lairs and sterilize them. Then he will have no place where he can move and hide. But we have only until sunset. The house in Piccadilly was empty. Like the one at Pursley, the same sickening smell was in the air. On the table we found a clothes brush, a brush, and a comb, and a basin. The latter containing dirty water, which was reddened as if with blood. The boxes are back here. Eight, nine, ten... Eleven. Only eleven. There's a twelfth box somewhere. Gentlemen, it is after six. The sun is setting. We've no time to lose. He will return at any moment. Open the boxes. Quiet. Be ready. It is he! The window! You waste your bullet, gentlemen. You think you baffle me. You with your pale faces all in a row like sheep in a butcher's. You think you have left me without a place to rest. But I have more. The time is on my side. The one you love is mine already. I have known her. Already my mark is on her throat. Flesh of my flesh. Blood of my blood. She is with me always. Over land. Or sea. October 4th morning. Another meeting in the study of Turkey. We must find that last remaining box, gentlemen. We must find it. As long as that earth exists in pure... As long as there remains one place of refuge for Dracula, there is no safety and no peace for any soul in England. And for the undead, never peace so long as he lives. Blood of my blood. Blood of my blood. Mina! How do you know that? How do you know that? Quiet! With me. With me always. Over land and sea. Mina, darling, how did you know that Dracula said those... I don't know. The word just came... Strange. There are times when somehow I feel that I'm with him. At sunset? Yes. Just at sunset. And again at sunrise. Dr. Van Helsing, if I could... If at that time, you... Have you the courage? Courage for what? What do you mean? Dr. Van Helsing here will question her. I will question her, yes. In a state of hypnosis. The one you love is already mine, he said. She is with me always, over land or sea. Ah, Count Dracula. Perhaps she will betray you if she is really with you, this one we love. Who knows? If she is really with you, over land or sea. Blood of my blood. Nina. Yes. Answer me, Mina. Are you with him? Yes, I am with him. Where are you? I do not know. It is all dark. What do you hear? The lapping of water. I can hear it on the outside. Then you are on a ship? Yes. What else do you hear? There is the creaking of an anchor What chain. are you doing? Still. Oh, so still. It is like death. It is like death. Here is a report from Matt and Peabody. Ship brokers. Dated October 5th, according to Lloyd's List, the only sailing ship that left for the Black Sea yesterday was the Tsarina Katrina, bound for Varna. Some hours before she sailed, a man came alongside, all in black, driving a cart with a great box in it. This he lifted down, single-handed, and carried below. No one remembers having seen him after that, as heavy mist came up over Doolittle Dock until sailing time. 
for the rest of London Harbour remained completely clear. Our plans are made. The average sailing time from London to the Black Sea is three weeks. We can travel overland to the same place in three days. We shall be there waiting for him when he arrives. October 15th, arrive barn about five o'clock. Mina seems stronger. Every morning before sunrise and just before sunset, she speaks to Van Helsing in a trance. Are you with him, Mina? Tell me, are you with him? I am with him. What can you see? Nothing. All is dark. What can you hear? I can hear the waves lapping against the ship and the water rushing by. The wind is high. I can hear it in the shrouds and the bow throws back the foam. So, the Tsarina Katrina is still at sea, hastening on her way to Varna. The Count cannot cross warning water, so he cannot leave the ship without being observed. What do you hear, Mina? Lapping waves and rushing water. A whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams from Lloyd. Not yet reported. 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 Rushing water and creaking mud. Darkness. Darkness and wind. October 24th. Telegram. Lloyd, London to Harker. Zarina Katrina reported this morning. From Dardanelle. Lloyd, London to Harker. October 28th. Zarina Katrina in heavy fog reported entering Galat's Harbor at 1 o'clock today. Galat! Galatz is 38 hours from here, and the first train for Galatz leaves at 6.30 tomorrow morning. My friends, we have lost. I am with him. I can see nothing, nothing. I can hear men's voices calling in the roar and creak of the water. Evening. We are due between two and three in the morning, but already at Bucharest, we are three hours late. Something is going on. I can see it past me like a cold wind. I can hear far off confused sounds. Men talking in strange tongues. Tears falling water and the howling of wolves. A man come aboard with an order an hour before sunup to receive a box for a party by the name of Dracula. Got his papers, all right. Uh, Emmanuel Hillsheim, his name was. Mr. Hillsheim? Yes. You unloaded the box yesterday. I gave it to Kyloff by order. Kyloff. Mr. Kyloff? I lost. This morning they find him dead inside the churchyard of St. Peter. They find him dead. With his throat torn open. October 30th, evening. There are two ways in which Dracula can get back to his own place. By land or by water. We've examined the map and find the most likely river is the Ceres. You and I, see, we will charter a steam launch and follow him up the river. Van Helsing and Mina will take the train to Veresti, and from there they from will... From there go... we shall go in the track where Harker is went, from district over to Borgo. If you have not caught him before, we shall be awaiting Dracula there. <laughs> We arrived at Veresti at noon, then Helsing and I. Bought a carriage here, and we start in an hour. Our enemy is still on the river. October 31st. We can run at good speed up the river at night. There's plenty of water, and the banks are wide apart. November 1st, evening. No news all day. We hear that a big boat went up the river before us, going at more than usual speed. November 4th. All day driving. The country gets wilder as we go. By morning, we shall reach the Borgo Park. November the 4th, evening. We've left the launch. We've got horses, and we follow on the track along the river. We are armed. Look! Quick! There they are now! Heading west! With the dawn, we could see the Slovaks some miles before us, dashing along the river with their wagons. On it is the great box. Ladies and 
afternoon. We reached the Burgo Pass. Then help me. Look, look. We could see a long way all around us. Far off, beyond the white waste of snow, was the river like a black ribbon curling. Between us and the river, not afar off, came a group of men, mounted slow by train along. In the midst of them was a wagon which swept from side to side. On the wagon was a great box. Look! We see two horses, following fast, coming up from the south. Stuart and Parker, the slow box with their heavy wagon, are losing their ground. Now the horsemen are not more than a mile behind. Now the wagon is quite close to us. We can see the great box swaying gravely. Now they are almost upon us. Now has happened a strange thing. The wagon smashed into a great rock dead in the snow, lost its front wheels, and turned over on its side, jammed against the stone. The horses tore loose from their traces and bolted, and the slow bucks scatter and vanish after them. Then silence. Silence like comes uh, after ringing a bell. Look. His face. It is Dracula. Sprawled out stiff and twisted in the smear of his own holy earth. The box, in falling, has emptied the dirt onto the snow. His face is old looking. The skin is like paper. Dr. Seward, there's no time. Look at the sun. Sunset. In one minute there's darkness and he is forever lost to us. Have you the stake of wood and the hammer? Yes. Now, Seward, pray for us. Kneel down and pray. Harker, the stake of wood over his heart. Be not afraid, Harker. Do not look into his eyes. The hammer. Now, Harker, strike. Strike. Flesh. Flesh of my flesh. Guilt of my guilt. Death of my death. Speak and be manifest in the instant. Of your master's peril. Elements of darkness. Rain. Evil wind. Mist. And mold. And tempest. Strike! The others couldn't. But somehow I can hear him. Speaking. Behind his eyes. Claw. Wing. Tooth. Scale. Kiss you of flesh, death of my death, dead and undead. The hand of the living is over your master. Console him, my children. This instant is no longer than the space between two heartbeats. But the night is not here, and I am lonely. Come to your master, my children. Beguile him now in the instant of his peril. Beguile him with the sound of your names. Claw. Wing. Tooth. Scale. Tissue of flesh. Strike! Harker, strike! There is one very dear to me who has not answered. My love. Mina. There is less than a minute between me and the night. You must speak for me. You must speak with my art. Give them to me! Jonathan, give them to me! That stake of wood and the hammer! Harker! I shall never forget that moment. The look on poor Mina's face as she stood there, the angry scar standing out on her throat, her eyes like living coals in the last red of the sunset. She had torn the stake and the hammer out of my hands with the strength of an animal. Mina, do you know what you've done, woman? Do you know what you've done to us? You've released him, the evil is free. Look! The sun! As we look down at Dracula... The eyes saw the sinking sun, and the hate in them turned to triumph. Flesh of my flesh, come to me, my love. Come into the night and the darkness. You have served me well, my love. My bride, my... Ladies and gentlemen, all the evidence in this case is now before you. I've added nothing. 
And to the best of my knowledge, I've omitted nothing that might help to throw light on the extraordinary events of the year 1891, which culminated on that terrible evening in the Borgo Pass. There remains only this one last report. When Mina Harker seized the stake and hammer from her husband, I believe she was under some form of hypnosis. She herself remembers nothing. But whatever influence was at work on her, she must at the last moment, have rejected it. For at the exact instant the sun disappeared, it was Mina Harker who drove the stake through the heart of the thing that called itself Dracula. At that same instant, even as we looked, the wound on the side of her throat was no more. As for Dracula, before the scream of the creature had died from our ears, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. In that final moment of dissolution, there was in the face a look of peace such as I never could have imagined might have rested there. Tonight's production of Dracula by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre was the first of nine CBS broadcasts in which this brilliant group will bring to life a series of great narratives, all presented in the immediacy of the first-person singular. In presenting them each Monday evening at this time during the summer season, the Columbia Network is bringing a complete theatrical producing company to the air for the first time. And now here is the director to tell you about next week's Mercury Theater production, Mr. Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, what are your favorite stories? If there is one you're particularly fond of, and would like to hear on the air, will you please write me about it? Next week, the Mercury Theater is going to tell you Robert Louis Stevenson's exciting yarn about pirates and the sea, Treasure Island. Until then, just in case Count Dracula has left you a little apprehensive, one word of comfort. When you go to bed tonight, don't worry. Put out the lights and go to sleep. It's all right. You can rest peacefully. That's just the sound effect. There. Over there in the shadow, see? It's nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. I think it's nothing. But always remember, ladies and gentlemen, there are wolves. There are vampires. Such things do exist. is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Man in Black, here to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, we bring you Mr. Orson Welles. Mr. Welles will appear as star of the suspense drama called The Dark Tower, from the play by George S. Kaufman and the late Alexander Wolcott. 
But before we raise the curtain on this evening's tale of suspense, here is a message from your host, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Let us picture a scene in the fashionable restaurant El Patio in Havana, Cuba. From the next table, we hear a Cuban judge of fine wines describe in glowing terms the wonderful climate and soil of our own California. When his American guest points out that his Cuban host has never been to the United States, the Cuban answers, Well, it's true I've never visited your California, but from only such perfect wine country could come sherry of such superb quality as that we have enjoyed. Roma, California sherry. Yes, by their example, wine connoisseurs of many other lands tell you that in Roma wines are all the great qualities that must be present in a wine for great enjoyment. It's for this reason these wine experts of other lands import Roma wines from great distances to be enjoyed as a rare luxury. But for you, this luxury of other lands becomes a daily pleasure because you can enjoy any of Roma wine's many different taste-appealing wine types without additional charge for import duties and expensive shipment from great distance. These two great Roma wine features, superb quality and small cost, have made Roma Wines America's largest selling wine. I'll spell out the name for you. R-O-M-A. Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now with the Dark Tower and with the performance of our star Orson Welles as that noted actor Damon Wellington, scion of the celebrated royal family of stage and screen, we again hope to keep you in suspense. You dare, you dare call me a ham. Violet, I will prove to the world there are no brains within that thick Teutonic skull. I'll cleave it open like an overripe melon. Who thus profanes the rehearsal of my lines? Enter, if thou art man of woman born. I fear thee not. Hello, Damon. Van Weston, you old son of a gun. I heard you were back from the coast. What news on the Rialto from that cesspool of the arts known as Hollywood? Have they turned my picture to the wall at the Brown Derby yet? No, it's still there. I despise myself for wanting to know, of course. It's marvelous to have you back, Ben, old boy. Seen Jessica yet? Yes, I've seen her. Isn't she looking fine? Feeling better than she has for years, I think. You got a great thing in this play, Ben. Changed quite a bit from the original, of course. Sort of a satire on the family. Perhaps it might be more dignified to say that the family is a satire on the play. Yes, I heard about it. For instance, those lines you heard me declaiming as you entered actually happened to me once. You know, that German, what's his name, who directed Macbeth, he called me a ham. And I chased him out of the theater and for four city blocks in full costume with a two-edged sword. (laughs) Damon. There's a little thing I like in the second act, too. Jessica asked me why I don't stop drinking, and I say, what? Would you have me subsist entirely on food and reach the gargantuan proportions of an Orson Welles? That ought to needle a boy wonder. (laughs) Amen. Damon, can't you stop clowning for a minute? Of course I can. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave. Damon, please. Please be serious. What's the matter, old man? You know as well as I do what's the matter. No, frankly, I can't say that I do. To me, the world looks rather well. Does it? And Jessica, feeling better than she has for years, is she? Well, isn't she? Of course not. How could she be? And why shouldn't she be? Damon, don't you realize there's been a murder? Oh, to be sure, so there has. And a good thing, too, if you ask me. What of it? What of it? Can't you see the thing is hanging over this house like a... like a curse? I hadn't noticed anything hanging over this house, profane or otherwise. And what about Jessica? Oh, I suppose it's bound to upset her a little, but she's really in fine shape, Ben. It's going to be marvelous in this play. There's more at stake in this than a play, Damon. The thing has never been solved. Perhaps it never will be. Perhaps that's just as well. But Jessica can't remember, don't you understand, Damon? She can't remember. Well, well, then, Jessica can't remember. Listen to me, Damon. I wouldn't mind it if it was just that other people thought she might have done it. But they would do that anyway. But, but... She does. Ah, oh, come on, Ben. I don't believe it. I've talked to her, Damon. I know. Oh, I Damon, see. I love Jessica more than anything else in the world. You know that. Yes, Ben, I do. But this way, I... I couldn't... 
You couldn't marry a murderess. Hmm? I should think it'd be rather exciting. Now that you mention it, I rather wish I had. Instead of some of those I did marry. Damon. I'm sorry. Pretty serious to you, isn't it, old man? Did you think it wouldn't be? Well, to tell you the truth, Ben, I hadn't thought about it at all. That's the trouble with being an actor. As long as your heart's good, you don't give a hang about the rest of the play. Yeah. You told Jessica? Yes, we had a long talk. How did she take it? You know Jessica. She carried it off, of course. But... Uh, ben, you know, in spite of all our histrionic bickering, I'm rather nuts about Jessica myself. I know you are, Damon. I have no very fundamental objections to you, either. I would describe you, my dear Benjamin, as adequate. Thanks. So I think perhaps you and I'd better have a nice, long, heart-to-heart -heart talk. What good will talking do? I think if you'll do the listening and let me do the talking, you'll see. Lend me your ears. I will a tale unfold. <laughs> Jessica, as you know, had been in a sanitarium for nearly a year. She hadn't been on the stage in more than two years. The dark tower was to be her first attempt to work again. All that time. I know it isn't the greatest play in the world, but it has a surefire box office appeal. Jessica needed that to get her confidence back. Well, we were just polishing up a few last-minute changes here at the house. David Torrance, the producer, you know, he was there with us. And, of course, there are the usual little... And another thing, Damon. When you kick me in the middle of the second act... Where? You know perfectly well where. Is it absolutely essential that you boot me halfway across the stage? What do you want me to do? Pull my punches? That's one of the high spots in the show. It may be a high spot to you, darling, but it's just a black and blue spot to me. Very well. Henceforth, I shall appear for the second act on crutches. You know, Uncle David, that's not a bad idea. Oh, now, Damon, let's be serious. There's a lot of work to I'm do. I'm quite serious. I could throw them at her. You might try throwing me a cue once in a while. It's the use of having a play if you just make up the lines as you go along. The critics thought my ad-libbing very witty, remember, dear? Oh, Damon, you're such an insufferable ham. A ham? A ham? Me? A now, ham? Now, now, children, please. I uh, fail to see why I should permit that little minx to insult me with impunity, David. How dare you speak to me that way? You started it. I did not. You started You called me a ham. You are ham, ham, ham! Minx, minx, minx! Stop that brawling. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east. And Martha is the son. I quite agree. What? That you're a ham. Gad, I'm beset by harpies. David, haven't you any control over these hirelings of yours? Oh, I'm only the producer, my dear Martha. You at least are a member of the family. And you at least can quit. <laughs> We're terribly sorry, Aunt Martha. We've been a nuisance, I know, and I apologize. Damon, eh? I even apologize to you. Don't be silly, Jim. I've been much the worst, I know, but... I've really been terribly keyed up working again, and, you know, Ben is coming east for the opening. <clears throat> Love rears its ugly head. Don't be hurried, Damon. It's all right. I couldn't even be angry if he was. Anyway, I'll have a husband to protect me by this time next week. I can lick him with one hand tied behind me. Damon, seriously, I know I owe you an awful lot. Me? I hadn't actually realized how far I'd gone. These last six months have been like coming alive again. The play and Ben. Thanks, Damon. Good Lord. Now I think I'll dress for dinner. Let's all go out to the... I'll get it. Aunt Martha, where would you like to go? To a rest home. Hello? Who? No. No, he's not here. He's not here, I tell you. Dead. <laughs> oh, darling, what is it? It was for Stanley. For Stanley? Yes. Yeah. Never mind, darling, it's all right. Just some fool who didn't know. Of course. Uh, Damon, you take David and Martha out to dinner, will you? I think I'll 
lie down for a little while. Oh, come on, Jess. You mustn't let a little thing like that upset you. I know, but I'm awfully tired. Please. Jessica! You'd uh, better leave her alone for a while, Martha. Oh, I suppose so. It was for Stanley Vance, the husband, huh? Yes. He's dead, you say? Might as well tell him about it, Martha. I was always for telling about it. Well, you don't have to. I'd rather. He was the cause of her breakdown, of course. Should have been an actor. That's why Jessica married him. She married him because he forced her to marry him. Uh, He controlled that girl's mind like some sort of fiendish hypnotist. My dear Martha, I've always said that if Jessica was fool enough to marry a psychoanalyst... Damon, stop playing the heartless brother. You saw what Stanley did to her. I was in Hollywood. Perhaps that's why Damon went to Hollywood, huh? Well, what could one do? She was legally married to the man. She'd listen to no one but him. Here's what happened, David. She went to this fellow to be psychoanalyzed, and in the process, something happened. I don't know what it was, but Vance acquired a power over Jessica's mind that was utterly inhuman. He married her quite frankly to have her support him. Then he found he'd overplayed his hand and sent her into a complete mental collapse. When he found he couldn't snap her out of it, and she was no longer a source of revenue to him... He simply decamped. Hmm. You say Vance is now dead? We heard the happy news about six months ago. Some public benefactor had shot him. I've always meant to look that fellow up. From that very day, she began to get better. From the moment she heard the news, it was as though a spell had been lifted. Hmm. And now she's practically all well. You know, it's odd at that someone phoning for him after all these months. Probably the sheriff just catching up. Oh, I wonder who that could be. Damon, you, you don't suppose... I'll go. It may be a peasant with a petition. Good evening. My dear Martha, you are positively psychic. The Honorable Stanley Vance. Thank you. I trust the shock will not be too great. One knoweth not the place nor the hour when the bridegroom cometh, does one? My luggage will be here shortly. Listen to me, Stanley Vance. Good evening, Martha. I regret to arrive so unceremoniously. I have been ill. So we have been told. We have been assured, however, that your illness was fatal. Damon, I thought I... Stanley. Jessica. My poor, poor darling. Stanley. Oh, but you're ill, my dear, aren't you? You're ill. You should be resting. You're tired and exhausted, aren't you? Terribly. Terribly tired. Yes. I am tired. Oh, great. Terribly tired. I'll take you up to your room, darling. I take it we still have the same room, Martha. Listen to me, Stanley Vance. The poor girl, you can see how weak she is. If you think you're going to stay under this roof for a single minute, get out! Very well. Get out! Very well, if you insist on being inhospitable, Martha... You'll pack your things, Jessica. We'll go to an hotel. Yes. Yes, Stanley. Jessica. But I'm so tired. Will you help me, Stanley? Of course I will, my dear. Come along. Stanley. Yes, Martha? All right, Stanley. You win. Ah. You're asking us to avail ourselves of your hospitality, Martha. Yes, You can stay. That's very sweet of you, Martha. Isn't it, darling? Yes. Yes, Stanley. But somehow, someday, there'll be a time of reckoning for you, Stanley Vance. And until it comes, keep out of my sight. The pleasure will be all mine. Come, darling. We'll go to our room now. Yes, Stanley. Damon. Yes, my aged auntie. Damon, what are we going to do? I don't know what you're going to do, Ducky. But I'm going down to the Lambs Club and have a quadruple scotch and soda. You may think it heartless of me, but during the next few days I simply stayed away. I think you'll understand my reasons later. As for Jessica, she was, of course, completely in his power again. And about a week later, there appeared upon the scene... A gentleman who was destined to play a very substantial role in our little drama. I think you've already met him, at least on one occasion. I'll get it, Jessica, darling. Hello? 
No, Mr. Damon Wellington isn't here. Can I take a message, please? Mr. Max Hartsfeld. Hartsfeld. Uh, I'll tell him you called, Mr. Hartsfeld. I really couldn't say. Well, you can come up and wait if you like, of course, but I can't promise he'll see you. Very well, goodbye. Jessica? Yes, Stanley? Do you know any friend of Damon's named Max Hartsfeld? No, Stanley. He seemed extremely eager to see him. He said he'd come up here and wait. Oh, I see. That's no matter. Tell me, darling, have you been feeling a little stronger these last few days? Yes. I think perhaps I am, Stanley. But of course you're not ready to go back on the stage again, are you, darling? No. Of course not, Stanley. Poor darling. No more love, no more... Well, my little lovebirds... How are you two? How are you, Jessica? A little stronger, I think. Am I a little stronger, Stanley? Of course you are, my dear. Uh, Jessica, I think you'd better leave us now. There's something I want to talk over with Damon. Yes, Stanley. I'll see you again very shortly, darling. Yes, Stanley. Well, Damon, I've been wanting to talk to you for some time. Really? I wish I could say the same. I suppose you realize, Damon, that... It's out of the question for Jessica to go on in the play in her present condition. Uh, kind of the point where you Vance have a pressing engagement with a pin-up girl, and I have got to change into my zoot suit. <sighs> now, seriously, Damon, I know that you somehow connect me with Jessica's condition. By an odd coincidence, I do. What of it? I know it would make you and everyone very happy if Jessica could go on in the play. Aha, uh -huh, the light at last illuminates maddled wits, so it's a shakedown. A shakedown, is it, Stanley? My dear Damon, I really don't know what you're talking about. Look here, about. my larcenous in-law. I've been shaken down by experts on every conceivable count, including the Man Act in my time, and I can smell them a mile away. What you propose is that for certain financial considerations, you will leave this happy home, Jessica will recover, and she can go on in the play. The answer is No. There won't be any play without her, Damon. Are you suggesting that my name is not sufficient to draw the suckers? I can get a dozen people to play Jessica's part. Margaret O'Brien, Marjorie Maine, Daisy, Agnes Moorhead. Makes no difference to me, anybody at all. Don't try to bluff me, Damon. After all this build-up, you won't dare go on without Jessica. You little know me, stinky. You may consider your little farce as having closed on opening night. As for Jessica, I'm very much afraid that she's made her bed, and now she'll have to lie in it. There's no cure for her short of murder with yourself as a victim. And I do not propose to put my neck in the hangman's noose. Good night. I think you'll see things my way a little God later, Damon. Did. By the way, did I have any calls? Oh, yes. Uh, Max Hartsfeld called. Max Said he was Hartsfeld. coming up here to wait for you. Good heavens, when? He's on his way now, I imagine. Look. Tell him I'm out, will you? Going to Hollywood or something. A fellow's been pestering me all week. Wants to buy into the show, and I simply don't want to see him. Oh, he wants to buy into the show. Yes, he does not share your lamentable lack of faith in my talent, Stanley, and he's dying to buy into the show. But does he know Jessica won't be able to uh, appear? Of course he does, you idiot. Everybody does. Don't you read the trade papers? And now, good night, repulsive. I have other fish to fry. Toodaloo, flat top. Jessica. Oh, Jessica, my dear. I'm coming, Stanley. Tell me, Jessica, The Dark Tower, the play you are going to appear in with Damon, you have an interest in it, don't you? Yes. Yes, I think I do. An equal interest with Damon? With Damon, yes. Uh, how much do you suppose that interest is worth, Jessica? A hundred thousand dollars, I think. A hundred thousand dollars, huh? Yes, that was it. Have you thought about what you're going to do with it now that you can't appear in the play yourself? No, Stanley. I haven't. You see, I'm not at all sure the play will be a success without you, Jessica. I don't know, Stanley. And so it might be wise to sell your share of it before it opens. Don't you agree, Jessica? Yes. Yes, I do agree. And Jessica... 
If I could find a buyer, and I think perhaps I can, it might be best if I were to handle the details for you. Don't you think? Yes, Stanley. You handle it. The fact of the matter is, there's a man coming up here this evening, a friend of Damon's, Max Hartsfeld. Do you remember I asked you about him? Yes. It won't be any trouble to you, darling. All you'll have to do is sign the necessary papers. Oh. Excuse me. Is this the residence of Mr. Damon Wellington? Mr. Hartsfeld? Yes. Oh, come in, please. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Wellington is at home? No, and we don't expect him, but he's discussed with me the reason for your visit, and I think perhaps you and I can reach a satisfactory agreement. And you are... Uh, Stanley Vance. I'm Miss Wellington's husband. This is my wife. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? I'm very glad to... Uh, sit down, please, Mr. Hartsfield. May I have your hat and coat? Thank you. And your gloves, please. Uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, eccentricity, perhaps. I always keep them on. Oh. <laughs> uh, now, Mr. Hartsfeld, <laughs> Damon tells me that you wish to buy an interest in the new Wellington play, The Dark Tower. Yes, I, I've been seeking an interview with Mr. Wellington. Yes, so he's told me. However, <laughs> Damon has very definitely made up his mind not to sell any part of his interest in the play. You are sure of this, Mr. Vance? Oh, yes, quite sure. I had a long talk with him about it only this evening. I <laughs> see. I will not conceal from you that this is a source of great disappointment to me, Mr. Vance. I have such a deep admiration for the talents of Mr. Wellington. I mentioned a few previous theatrical enterprises. Now, at last, I hope... Uh... I quite understand your feelings, Mr. Hartsfeld. And I think that I may be able to help you. Yes? Yes. You see... Damon owns only half of the Wellington interest in the play. <laughs> My wife, Miss Jessica Wellington, owns the other half. And she, we, if the offer were sufficiently attractive... <laughs> and indeed. Uh, you, you are willing to sell then, Miss Wellington? Yes, whatever Stanley says. Good. Then perhaps we should get down to detail, huh? <laughs> yes, Mr. Vance. And Miss Wellington, I'm afraid you will think me very rude. Not but, at all. Uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, since the talents of Miss Wellington's brother uh, must be considered the very essence of our bargaining, and since you are acting as her agent in any event, I wonder if she would forgive me if I asked that you and I conclude this part of our business <laughs> alone, Mr. Vance. Oh, of course. <laughs> Jessica will understand perfectly. Won't you, my dear? Yes, Stanley. Run along then, darling. I'll call you when we need you. Yes, Stanley. <sighs> Now, Mr. Vance, I imagine you will wish to know a little more about the man with whom you are dealing. Here's my card. I'm staying at the Waldorf. I've written the room number on the card for you. Oh, there's no need, really. <laughs> yes. But before we discuss terms, there is one other thing. Yeah? I wonder... You do not know me, do you, Mr. Vance? Know you? I, I... You do not know why I've been looking forward with such pleasure to an interview with you? Alone. I know, I... I... Well, it's very simple. It's very simple, really, Mr. Vance. It's, uh, it's just that I'm... <laughs> I'm going to kill you. To kill me? Really, Mr. Hartsfeld? With these two hands. And before you die... Huh? Before you die... I want you to know the reason. Uh... Jessica... No. No, no. <laughs> so you see, Ben, there is your murderer, Mr. Max Hartsfeld. And I hope you're duly grateful to him. An elusive fellow, Hartsfield. The police have been trying to find him for two weeks. They never will. He... Uh, left no fingerprints, you see. Uh, he always kept his gloves on. It's uh, an eccentricity. Damon. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do you mean you? Uh, my dear Mutton. My dear Muttonhead. Listen, darling, the whole thing's perfectly clear. It's as plain as the putty nose on Max Hartsfield's face. I still can't get it into my head. Benjamin, if you don't know who Max Hartsfield is by now, you are the only person within the sound of my voice who does not. You mean you impersonated... Then it wasn't Jessica. Jessica? <laughs> she never could have done it. 
The girl has talent, but no genius. But Damon, murder. Murder, he says. Dear friend, you share with me a guilty secret. Your lips are sealed. Come. In the words of Hamlet, never so help you mercy. Note that you know aught of me. Swear by my sword. What? Swear! I swear. Well said, old mole. Well, I think that winds up the case, Watson. Uh, Jessica will receive by registered post a signed confession by Max Hartsfield, bound in vellum. That should end her worries. You may consider it as my wedding present. It will be a work not without literary merit, although written lefty. I should prefer it to be published posthumously. I look forward to a long and brilliant career in the theater. I should not care to terminate it abruptly upon so paltry a characterization as the late Max Hartsfeld. Music, curtain. <laughs> And so closes The Dark Tower by Alexander Woolcott and George S. Kaufman. And starring Orson Welles, tonight's tale of Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. If we could bring to this microphone a man typical of all Roma wine dealers, this is what he might tell you. I sell a lot of the good Roma wines. They are, you know, America's largest selling wines. My Roma wine customers, I've noticed, are sociable people who enjoy entertaining friends. Talking with me, they give a lot of credit for the success of their entertaining to the enjoyable Roma wines they serve. They're thrifty people, too, these buyers of Roma wines. What else could offer so much enjoyment for so little cost? Only pennies a glass by actual check. Now, that doesn't leave much for me to add, except this, perhaps... If you are not already one of the millions enjoying Roma wines regularly, make your own taste test of any of Roma wine's many different taste-delighting California wine types, such as the delicious tangy Roma sherry, or the hearty Roma burgundy, or the sweeter, heavier Roma port, and discover for yourself why Roma wines are winning international praise voiced in this phrase. Roma wines are truly magnificent. Let me repeat the name... R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen. Next week's suspense will, as is its policy from time to time, do the unexpected in the way of casting. Because you're going to hear the country's leading comic juvenile, Mr. Eddie Bracken, as a dramatic actor. I look forward to hearing that. I know you do, too. Ensure your baby's future by ensuring your country's future. Buy war bonds for your baby today. Don't forget then, next Thursday, same time, you will hear Eddie Bracken in... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight... We escape to a lonely lighthouse off the steaming jungle coast of French Guiana and a nightmare world of terror and violence as we bring you again in response to hundreds of requests Three Skeleton Key, starring Vincent Price. <laughs> Thank you.
picture this place. A gray tapering cylinder welded by iron rods and concrete to the key itself. A bare black rock, 150 feet long, maybe 40 wide. That's at low tide. At high tide, just the lighthouse rising 110 feet straight up out of the ocean. And all about it, the churning water, gray-green scum dappled, warm as soup, and swarming with gigantic bat-like devilfish, great violet schools of Portuguese man-o-war, and yes, sharks, the big ones, the 15-footers. And as if this weren't enough, there was a hot, dank, rotten-smelling wind that came at us day and night off the jungle swamps of the mainland, a wind that smelled like death, a wind that had smelled the slow and frightful death that came one night to this bare black rock. Set in the base of the light was a watertight bronze door. And in you went. And up. Yes, up and up and round and round, past the tanks of oil and the coils of rope, casks of wicks, racks of lanterns, sacks of spuds and cartons and cans, and up. And up and up, round and round. Over the light storeroom was the food storeroom, and over the food storeroom was the bunk room where the three of us slept. And over the bunk room was the living and cooking room, and over the living and cooking room was the light. She was a beauty, big steel and bronze baby with the sun gleaming through the glass walls all about, bouncing, blinding little beams off the big shining reflectors, glittering and refracting through her lenses. The whole gigantic bulk of her balanced like a ballerina on the glistening steel axle of her rotary mechanism. She was a sweetheart of a light. And at night, she'd lie there on the stone deck of the gallery with her revolving smoothly and quietly over your head, easing her bright white eye 360 degrees around the horizon. You'd lie there watching to see that the feeders kept working, that everything ran right. And it wouldn't be bad, the other two fellows snoring in their sacks two levels down. You'd smoke your pipe to kill the stink of the wind, and it wouldn't be bad. About those other two, Louis and Auguste. What a pair. Louis, he was head man, was a big fellow from the Basque country. Black beard, little hard black eyes, and a pair of arms that I tell you those arms were as big around as my legs. Yes, head man he was, and what word he let go was law. A silent fellow, and although I spent my first two weeks trying to strike up a real conversation... The most I could ever get out of him was... Jean, I took up this profession because I don't like people. They want to talk too much. It's quiet work, light tending. Let's keep it that way. You, you're getting to be as bad as August. I thought maybe for once they'd send me somebody... Who that was Louis. And when he accused me of becoming like August, I quieted down because August was the talkingest man I'd ever met. The talkingest and the ugliest. He was hunchbacked, stood four feet high, had red hair and big blue eyes. It seems he'd been an actor in Paris. Yes, indeed. Played in over 200 different productions, dear boy, at the Grand Guignol. Oh, but it was monstrous horrible, the way we used to scare the audiences. I I was hated. Yes, yes, they used to throw things and hiss and bare their teeth at me. Finally, it got too bad. I couldn't stand it any longer. I gave up the theater. My nerves, you understand. Yes, gave it up completely. I really did. Couldn't stand it any longer. It all started one morning at 2.30. I was on watch, lying on the cool stone deck, pulling on my pipe, staring out at the blackness, the phosphorescent combers, and the big yellow stars, when out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something show up for a second, something the light had touched far off. I waited for her to come around again, and when she did, there it was. Three master, a big one, about a half mile off and coming down out of the north-northwest, coming straight for us. 
You must understand, our light was where it was for a very good reason. Dangerous submerged reefs surrounded us and ships kept clear. But this one, this sailing vessel, was coming straight on. I went over to the gallery door and yelled, Louis! Louis! Couldn't understand it. I waited for the light to come around again. What is that? Ship headed for the reefs! Coming right up! I had the glasses out now. I couldn't read her name, but I could see her quite plainly. All sails set, the foam creaming away under her bow, her beautiful lines. A Dutch ship, I guessed her. But why didn't she turn? Every time it passed, our light hit her with the glare of day. Ship? Where? North, northwest. The light will touch her in a moment. Can't they see? Look at her. She just keeps coming on. Yeah, the square heads. What is it? What is it? Watch north, northwest. I know. I know what it is. Huh? What? The Dutchman, the flying Dutchman. We did a play about her once. Oh, what a performance. You ghastly, gallian, hag-ridden, cursed ribbon. Must on... Shut and up, on. will you? She's loving. Yes. Sloppy way to come about. She's derelict, that's it. Derelict? Abandoned. The crew left her for some reason or other. But instead of sinking, she's gone on. Running before every wind. She'll not run long. Not with these reefs to break her up. A beautiful ship. Now, why would men leave a beautiful ship like that? She didn't ram us, although we all expected it. But as we waited for the crash, she luffed again, caught some odd gust and went about. We watched her the rest of those black hours, heeling and rocking, pushed and pulled by every stray wind, every freak current. Watched her until the dawn came, till the sea turned from black to a pearly gray. And on she came again, heading for us. We all had our glasses trained on her now. August, you can kill the light. Right, Chief? She doesn't look so good by daylight. Think she'll ground this time? What? I say, do you think she'll ground this time? Hmm? This is impossible. Absolutely impossible. What? Here, take my glasses. They're better than yours. All right. And what is it you... I had to focus, and then my breath froze in my throat. The decks were swarming with a dark brown carpet that looked like a gigantic fungus, but undulating. And on the masts and yards, the guys and all were hundreds, no thousands, no mi- I don't know, an endless number of enormous rats. See them? Yes, I see them. Now we know why she's derelict. Yes, now we know. What are you two doing? Here, give me a look. Yes, give him the glasses. Take a good look, chatterbox. Give you something to talk about. She's still heading for us. Yes. Uh, She's going to turn. She'd better turn soon. Suppose she doesn't. You mean suppose she piles up on the key? It's low tide. Yes. Yes, it is. Where's all the conversation, August, huh? Here, want the glasses again? Want another look? No, no. She's still coming on. Go away! Go away! Turn, will you? Turn, I say, I pray you, turn! She's cracking up. The rats. Look, on the water. Like a carpet. They're swimming. Sure, they're swimming. Those are ship's rats. But they're swimming for the rocks. The door below. It's open. Come on. Down we went, racing down the stone stairs, taking them three and four at a time. Scared? You bet we were scared. August, you get the windows. Maybe they can climb. We don't know. Right, Chief. But hurry, hurry. Look. See them? No. Oh, yes, I do. Up at the other end of the rock. Look at the millions. They smell us. Here they come. Close the door. I can't, I can't. It's stuck. Here, let me. Oh, move, you move. He made it. Holy. That was close. One got in. Look, there. Get him. Watch him. He's kicking. Uh, uh, 
was as big as a tomcat, bigger. And his eyes were wild and red, his teeth long and sharp and yellow. He went for a starving, ravenous, and we fought him, fought that one rat all over the room. It was, oh, believe me, I do not exaggerate, it was like fighting a panther. Got him. We better get aloft. As we ran up the winding staircase, we passed the tiny windows of the various levels, and at every one was a thick, wriggling, screaming curtain of brown fur. I was ahead of Louie, and I dreaded each successive level. Suppose they had found a way in. Look at them. Will you look at them? It's a nightmare. Will you look at them? The air of the gallery was thick and fetid with the stink of them. The light was dim, brown, filtered through the crawling mass that swarmed over the glass all about us. We could not see the sky, nothing, nothing but them. Their red eyes, their claws, their wriggling, hairy snouts, and their teeth. The rats. They screamed and howled and threw themselves against the glass. They were starving. And we three, we stood very quietly. Very, very quietly in the center of the classroom under our beautiful light. And we waited. What can we do? What can we do to you? Take it easy, old man. Take it easy. I can't. I it, just can't. It won't do any... It won't do any good to stand here and shake. Uh, that's right. Anybody want a cigarette? Yes. Yes, I have one. Thank you. Good boy. We've got to keep calm about this thing. Here's a light. <laughs> yeah, they don't light the fire, do they? <laughs> Guess not. Give me another match. <laughs> you don't like that much, do you? I don't rile them, August. <laughs> Give me some more matches. I'll strike them and strike them and strike them until they get scared and go away. <laughs> they won't go away. Not until... Let me see, Chase. Not until what? Not until they've been fed. You can take just so much horror and then you get used to it. And they were interesting to watch, you know. They couldn't understand the class. They could see us and they could rush at us, but that thin, invisible barrier held them off, stopped them. From time to time, we caught a glimpse of the rocks below. More rats down there, swarming brown velvet in the bright tropical sunlight. And then the tide began to rise. If only it had drowned some of them. Ships rats don't drown. <laughs> no, sir, you cannot drown one of them. They're all climbing up the tower. This bunch around us is getting thicker. Yeah. Say, what's the time? Quarter six. Uh, you've got first watch, John. Right. Uh, wake me at ten. I will. Come along, August. It was getting dark. One side of the room was lit a soft, filtered red. Sunset through the rats. Oh, very pretty. I set the wicks, checked my fuel, and then lit the lamps. It caught them. Lit them in their gigantic wriggling web of pale, hairless bellies, twitching red tails, bright eyes. Then I started the rotary motor. Light drove them mad as she swung slowly and smoothly about. She blinded them in the fierce stabbing bar of light, moving continually about, ever turning, ever touching, ever moving around and around. And they twitching and shuddering, eyes flaming when they were struck by the light. The bright light moving and behind on the dark side of the room, so close, so close, I dared not turn my back, but you cannot help turning your back when you're in a room made of glass. On the dark side of the room, you could not see them, but only their eyes. Thousands of points of blank red light, blinking and twinkling like the stars of hell. Louis relieved me at ten, but I didn't get much sleep that night, and when I came up into the gallery early next morning... 
There stood August, his back to me. He was bowing to the rats, waving his arms and making a speech. I am going to play once again that magnificent role which made me the toast of the Paris theater. Pray, Lotte, the evil genius of the medieval underworld. I am he who did guide the dark soul of the Marechal into the nether parts. <laughs> Do not be frightened, little children. I will he not hurt turning. you. I much. stood staring at him hard. Horror struck, but he didn't notice me. The man had gone mad. He kept turning, telling his stories to all the rats, leaving no one out. August! August! Ah, another one. A late comer. Take a seat on the aisle, dear patron. August! Move stop over it, there. Stop it. Let the gentleman be but seated. He didn't come, stop. Come, he went on, bowing and scraping to the rats, his big blue eyes rolling and winking, his wild red hair waving about him. I grabbed him by the arms and slapped his face. He looked at me like a child. And then his face screwed up. He looked as though he were about to cry. Go below, go on. Oh, very well then. Later, my dear audience, later. Matinee today. Sure, he was crazy. But I guess we all were. A few hours later, he came back up and caught Louie and me teasing the rats. Yes, sounds horrible. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> We could get right up against the glass and make faces at them. It drove them crazy. They would scratch away trying to get at our eyes. Louis was even cuter about it. He'd pull a piece of bread out of his pocket and press it against the glass. The rats would scramble into a solid ball, biting each other, clustering like grapes. From time to time, a whole knot of them would slip and fall 110 feet to the surf below. Look at the sharks! They're eating them. <laughs> yeah, the sharks are our friends. Here, here. I'll get another bunch together. <laughs> here, my beauties. That's it. Pile of kill each other. <laughs> there they go! August joined in, too. Oh, very ingenious, August. He learned that if he spread eagled himself against the glass, they'd bunch and bundle against his figure. Then he'd leap back. Look! My portrait in rats! It went on all day. And then... I was lying in bed. It was about midnight. I was very tired, and I was just beginning to fall off to sleep when I became conscious of a new sound. Couldn't figure it at first. I got up, lit the lamp, and went to the window. Even as I looked at it, I saw one of the panes begin to sag in. They had eaten the wood away. Louis, Louis, come uh, quick! What? Well, what is it? They found a way in. I held the glass with my hand. Now they were all going crazy, and assured of the success of this maneuver, were all nibbling away at the wood. Louis ran below and then returned with a large sheet of tin. We spread it against the window and hammered it into place. Even as we did so, we felt the heavy body scudding against the other side as the window gave way. That ought to hold. If it doesn't, we're done for. Rats can't eat tin. No, they can't. What was that? I don't know. It came from below. The storeroom window. Oh. They're in. They're swarming up the stairs. Drop the trap. Right. Two of them got in. Let's go after them. We didn't have to go after them. They came at us. I leaped to one side and grabbed a marlin spike, swung and smashed one in midair. No! I whirled to see oh. Louie with the other. It had ripped his hand open and the blood was pouring all over the place. He held his hand aloft and kicked at the snarling rat. I stepped and swung and got him. My hand! He got my hand! That's both of them, Louie. I'll, I'll get you something to tie that up. Blood! Look at it! My, my blood! I'm bleeding! Now, don't worry about it, Louie. Here, look. I'll, I'll wind this kerchief around it. It'll be okay. Blood! There, now. It's not bad. Just the flesh. And then I became conscious of another new sound. They were gnawing their way through the wooden trap door. I watched the wood fascinated. Even as I did, it began to give way, and a bristling, whiskery nose showed through. 
Louis, Louis, we've got to go up. Next level was the middle quarters in the kitchen. I slammed the trap door there, too. But it, too, was wood. Uh, my blood. What are we going to do? I don't know. We'll be through this one in a moment. The gallery. The trap door in the gallery is metal. Good. Come on. We made it. We lay across the trap door exhausted. While below us, the rats took over the entire tower. I could hear them howling and fighting over our food supply, our water, our leather. And all about us, the others screamed and glared in at us, swayed in a tangled mass, hypnotized by the ever-turning light. By morning, the air in the little room was horrible. Until now, we'd been getting air from the tower below. Now that was sealed off. And so was all our food and water. We lay exhausted, panting, waiting, waiting. And the hours crawled on. I was almost dozing from fatigue when I saw a sight that brought me too fast. <laughs> Would you like to come in, my beauties? Would you? I hold the powers of life and death, and I can let you in, you know. August was standing by the glass, and in one hand he held a wrench. He was tapping the glass gently, not quite hard enough to break it. I eased myself to my feet, and slowly, very slowly, tiptoed toward him. All I have to do is tap just a little harder, Ooh. and... Uh, I found a coil of wire in the tool kit and I trussed him up, fastened him to a stanchion in the center of the room. Louis was of no help. He lay on his side looking at his bloody hand, weak and sick as a baby. So there I was, a lunatic and a coward for company, and all about watching our little drama, The Rats. <laughs> the day dragged by. The supply boat wasn't due for another 12 days. I don't know what they could have done if they had come. We had only one way of summoning them, and that was to shoot off distress rockets, but the rockets were four floors below. And even if they'd been right there in the gallery, I couldn't have opened a window to fire them. That night, I tended the light, but its flame was devouring our oxygen. The following day, we lay, thirst-tormented, starving, waiting, waiting, and the following night, I again tended the light, but the small supply of spare wicking we kept in the gallery had become exhausted, and quite suddenly, about midnight, the light went out. There was nothing I could do. Wicks were stored three levels below. Nothing I could do. Nothing... From time to time, I'd strike a match to see the clock. And when I did, it lit up the million red eyes about us. All about us. Watching. Waiting. Below, it had grown quiet. They'd cleaned us out, and now they, too, were waiting. All waiting. And then, the rats, quite suddenly, were silent. And then I heard it. And then I saw the sky and the stars. The rats were gone. I went to the glass. Out there on the water, a small freighter, a banana boat, showing a few lights, came softly and innocently at us. The light was out. They didn't know. I wanted to open the windows to call out to them, to warn them somehow, but I was afraid. What if, what if the rats were hiding from me, tricking me? So I waited. She grounded very softly on a reef not 200 yards from the quay. Grounded so gently that the man playing the cornet, was he a passenger or crewman off watch didn't even stop playing. 
They tried washing her back off. I could have told them to save their fuel. The tide was rising, would have floated her free. And I waited. That's all. That's the story. The sun came up and there wasn't a rat on the whole key. Every last one of that terrible army had left us, gone back to sea on their new ship. August, insane asylum, he never recovered. And Louis, they took him into Cayenne where he died of blood poisoning from his bite. Uh. Oh, yes. Well, that's the whole of it. And if you'll excuse me now, I must go set my traps. No, no mouse traps. No rats in this lighthouse, I should say not. Life in the lights isn't bad. But sometimes when I see a strange vessel approaching, I get a little nervous, sure. Somewhere on the seas, there's a little banana boat without a crew. That is, without a human crew. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented Three Skeleton Key by George Tadeus, adapted for radio by James Poe and starring Vincent Price as Jean. Supporting Mr. Price were Harry Bartell as August and Jeff Corey as Louis. Sound effects on Three Skeleton Key, created by Cliff Thorsness and executed today by Mr. Thorsness, Gus Bays, and Jack Sixsmith, have been awarded the best of the year by Radio and Television Life magazine. Harry Essman was at the control panel, and special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are swimming for your life in the dangerous waters off the Florida Gulf Coast about to be smashed by a launch carrying a vicious criminal who must kill you or die himself. And on shore 500 yards away, the police are waiting to arrest you for murder. And there can be no escape. Next week, we escape with an exciting tale of temptation and death on the Gulf Coast of Florida as John and Gwen Bagney tell it in Danger at Matagumba. Goodbye, then, until the same time next week when once again we offer you Escape! A patch of weeds, a boxer's biography, and a mild, lukewarm bath. They're all clues that lead the police of Jackson, Michigan, to a killer in the gangbuster story on CBS this Saturday night. It's the case of the double push to be heard on most of these same CBS stations this Saturday night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. In our starring Hollywood cast this evening is Mr. Peter Lorre, who appears as a mysterious gentleman called George Ravel. Miss Wendy Berry plays our worried heroine, Marjorie. Mr. George Zuko is the lawyer, Alex Stevens. The story called The Moment of Darkness is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold a solution until the last possible moment. And so, with a moment of darkness 
and with the performances of Peter Lorre, Wendy Berry, George Zuko, and our other players, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. The Train Bleu crack express train from Paris to the French Riviera, which in these carefree days before the war used to make the journey from Paris to Nice overnight. At the Gare du Sud on this particular mild spring evening, the train with its glistening wagon lits or sleeping cars waits in a station filled with smoke and the iron coughing of engines. You can hear the excited crowd at the slamming of compartment doors. You can see the guard standing by with his watch in hand, with his horn ready to blow as a signal. En voiture, messieurs les voyageurs! En voiture! À bientôt! You better get in, Emily. The train just about ready to start. The commotion there. The last moment just before the signal, a girl in a light summer dress carrying a small suitcase hurries along the platform towards car number 10. The girl is blonde and evidently English, and as she hurries towards the guard... En voiture! Dépêchez-vous, mesdemoiselles. Hurry up, please. Yes, yes, of course. Is this carriage number 10? Oui, mademoiselle, numéro 10. Hurry up, please. Thank you. I'll get in. Et at least a mile long. Car 10. Compartment number 6. Compartment number 6. Compartment... Uh, oh, here it is. Yes, come in. Mr. Stevens, I... Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. That's quite all right. Won't you come in? I, uh, I thought this was Mr. Stevens' compartment. It is his compartment. I'm sharing it with him. He, uh... He is on the train, isn't he? Oh, yes, yes. He's going to look for some luggage that failed to turn up. In the meantime, won't you come in and sit down? Thank you. As an old friend of Toby Stevens, why do you smile? <laughs> Nothing. It's just odd to hear a dignified man like Mr. Stevens called Toby. That's all. Well, it suits him. As an old friend of his anyway, may I introduce myself? I'm Ken Blake, on vacation from the American consulate in London. How do you do? My name is Gray, Marjorie Gray. I, uh, I most particularly wanted to have a word with Mr. Stevens. Miss Gray, will you pardon my impertinence if I ask... Ask what? Whether it's about your Aunt Hester at Monte Carlo and the man who seems so determined to scare her to death. You know about that? Yes, a little. After all, that's why Toby's left his law practice and come all the way from London. He said... Mr. Stevens. Marjorie. Great Scott, what are you doing here? I came up from Monte Carlo especially to see you. I thought I'd find you in Paris, but when I got to your hotel, they told me you'd gone. Cook said they'd reserved a compartment on this train for you. So, well, here I am. But why? Before you see Aunt Hester, Mr. Stevens, I want to know what you meant by that letter you wrote me. I meant exactly what I said, Marjorie. I'm going to expose this faker, George Revel. <laughs> Excuse me, if you two want to talk, I'll just clear out of here. Oh, no, Ken, stay where you are. Really, Mr. Stevens? You've made an impression on her, Ken. When the girl suddenly becomes thoroughly British after spending half her life on the Riviera, well, you made an impression. Don't talk like that, Toby. She won't get annoyed with you for saying it. She'll just get annoyed with me. Marjorie, this is Ken Blake. We've met, thanks. I asked him to come along with me, and for a very good reason. Indeed? Ken was for years at the American consulate in Paris. He knows all the heads of the Surete General, that's the Scotland Yard of France. And in particular, he knows the great detective Flamond, who's the chef de Surete. I thought Kent might be very useful when we nab Ravel. But I tell you, Ravel is dangerous. Dangerous, my eye. Something's going to happen. I know something dreadful's going to happen. Now, let's face the situation, Marjorie. Your Aunt Hester is middle-aged, wealthy, and... Uh... Oh, if only Uncle Paul hadn't died. He was the decentest person I ever knew. But he did die, my dear. And Hester can't be consoled. She can't eat, she can't sleep, she can't think of anything except getting in touch with his spirit. Along comes this faker Ravel to give seances. I wonder if he is a faker. You're not falling for this Tommy Rot, surely. Really, Mr. Blake? If I'd asked for your advice in this matter... I beg your pardon, Miss Gray. When we get to Nice, I'll take the first train back to Paris. Oh, no. No, wait, please. I, I didn't mean to be rude. It's nice of you to help us, but 
It's the whole atmosphere of Monte Carlo. Oh, well, that's quite all right, my dear. We understand, of course. There's Aunt Hester in that villa over the Mediterranean. There's Ravel, all thin and quiet and swarthy, with those somber-looking eyes of his. He, he seems to dominate her, just as Mr. Stevens used to. Dominate her, my dear? That's rather a strong word for an easygoing old buffer like me. The things Ravel does at those seances are terrifying. I don't know whether he's an imposter or not, but I am sure nobody else can do what he does. Now, there, Marjorie, is where you're wrong. I can. You can? Yes, I promise to duplicate in front of your aunt every single trick Ravel ever performed. Oh, but that's impossible. Is it? Wait and see. I'll put it up to Mr. Blake. It isn't merely that Ravel is tied up, tied hand and foot in a chair while these horrible things are going on. I know there are people who can get out of ropes and back into them again. But Ravel lets you take one precaution that shows there can't be any trickery. Oh, and what is that precaution? Just before the lights go out, he takes a piece of white paper. Well? He puts one under each foot. You take a pencil and draw an outline around the shoe on the paper. If he moved the millionth fraction of an inch, it would show in the outline later. But it never does. <laughs> well, look here, Toby, that's a bad one. Why does it strike you as being so funny? Because I can do it, too. Just give me a moment of darkness, that's all. You mean he gets out of his shoes or something like that? No, he could hardly get out of his shoes and back into them without disturbing the outline. Then he doesn't leave his chair after all. On the contrary, he can be all over the room. Well, how in Satan's name does he do it? My dear fellow, there's nothing simple. The Villa Bijou Monte Carlo the next evening. On the lighted terrace, that white villa overlooking the olive groves and the sea, three people are seated at their ease enjoying the night air. Below glitters the town, a white palm garden. But even its lamps are dimmed by the firework illuminations from the Promenade des Anglais. When the Principality of Monaco celebrates its ruler's birthday, Great rockets go hissing upwards to burst and bloom in colored fires against a black sky. Yeah, I don't like those fireworks. The noise upsets me. I wish they'd stop. Never mind the fireworks, Hester. You've heard my proposition. Give me an answer. Oh, what's more? You spill broth on your jacket at dinner. You're the clumsiest eater I ever saw. Here, here. Let me take a handkerchief to it. Please, Aunt Hester. Won't you answer, Mr. Stevens? Why don't you two let me alone, both of you? We're only trying to help you. Don't you believe that? Oh, yes, I, 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 I believe it. But I'm happy. I talked with my husband twice last week. Now, look here, Hester. This has got to stop. Why? Ravel's a fraud, and I can prove it. If Monsieur Ravel is a fraud, uh, what is he gained by this? Has he not asked for money? I don't know. Has he? No. Not a penny. You haven't changed your will by any chance. People do queer things sometimes that even their solicitors don't know about. Oh, no, dear, I haven't changed my will. When I die, uh, Marjorie inherits everything. I am a lonely woman. I'm getting old. I haven't got much to look forward to. Now, why don't you go your way and let me go mine? Suppose Ravel is a fraud. Just suppose it. Well, all right. Have your way. You wouldn't like to think you'd been deliberately tricked and imposed on now, would you? Oh, no, no. Of now, listen, Hester. If I prove to you these so-called miracles were really tricks that I can do myself. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Alex, Alex Stevens. I ought to prove that here and now. Would that shake your faith a little? Mm, yes, I, I suppose it would. I. But how did you become so clever all of a sudden? How did you become so gullible all of a sudden? You used to scoff at this sort of thing. You used to be gay and lively and go to the casino. Well, that was before Paul died. You're shivering, Marjorie. If you feel cold, put on a wrap. I'm, I'm not cold. It's... It's only... Only what? Oh, I've got a kind of presentiment that there's something dreadful hanging over us. I can't tell what direction it's taking or who's in danger. But I'm sure it's going to burst. Just as sure as I... My George, look at that rocket. Yes. Red and gold stars. And a deathly white blaze like the life we're living. You can see every leaf in the garden. Every blade of grass. And we can also see... Look there. Ravel and Ken Blake coming up the path. This, this Ken Blake, Mr. Stevens... Are you sure he's quite honest? My dear Marjorie, Ken's all right. I've known him for years. I thought he came here to help expose Ravel. But he and Ravel are as thick as thieves. What sort of game is going on here? The 
game, mademoiselle? You spoke of a game? Yes, Monsieur Ravel, I did. So did I, friend Ravel. Are you ready for my demonstration tonight? Demonstration? In the seance room, upstairs. You claim you can bring back the dead. Pardon me, monsieur, I claim nothing. When I'm in trance, I cannot tell what happens. But I can. I'm going to make ghosts walk by perfectly natural means. You know, Monsieur Stevens, I, I don't understand your logic. Logic? Yes, you wish to, uh, how do you put it, expose me? But how will you expose me by these childish tricks? If I show you a counterfeit ten-pound note, does that prove there's no Bank of England? I'm not going to argue subtleties with you. You can always beat me there. <laughs> I'm a plain, ordinary man with a little common sense to back me up. No, 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 come on, my friend. Not an ordinary man, surely. Just exactly what are you hinting at? Uh, yes, I, I, I'd like to know that, too. Oh, Madame Hester, believe me, I didn't mean to upset you. I, it would, I, I wouldn't upset you for anything. No, I'll bet you wouldn't. Well, I kiss your hand, Madame. I'm, I'm all apologies. Well, let this gentleman do what he likes. But I warn him, it is dangerous. Dangerous? How is it dangerous? That's the first time you've spoken, Mr. Blake. Why have you been so quiet? Please, Marjorie, please now. Be a good girl and stop interrupting. I'm sorry, Aunt Hester. But he's been muttering to himself and moving from one foot to the other and and looking guilty. Confound it, I'm not looking guilty. Aren't you? No, it's a hot night. I don't like this business at all. Why will a seance be dangerous? Why? Because we shall be tampering with evil forces. Evil forces, my foot. Oh, you doubt it? Yes. (laughs) This brave Monsieur Stevens is challenging the unseen world. He's mocking at forces he does not understand. Believe me, Monsieur, they are not mocked without danger. I'll risk that, thanks. Well, up in a seance room, with a door bolted on the inside, we shall be at their mercy. The evil forces, the elementals, will wax and grow strong. They can take us in their grip. As I take this walking stick and... You've got strong hands, Monsieur Ravel. The hands of evil spirits are stronger. Much stronger. I'm afraid. I wonder if we ought to do this. I've been wondering the same thing. What does your aunt say? I I, I don't know what to say. I'm so confused. And I want to break down and cry. Well, I suppose we'd better do it or Alex Stevens will never let me hear the end of it. For the last time, monsieur, will you be warned of danger? No. Very well. Oh, Madame Hester. Uh, yes, monsieur, for then. Do you believe that I'm an imposter? No. No, dear, of course not, but... Uh, but in uh, your heart, you're not yet convinced. Uh, well, I... I, I, don't, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not such a fool as some people seem to think. But if something did happen, something to show... There are living forces beyond this world. It would convince you utterly? Oh, yes, I... I I suppose it would. (laughs) Then uh, shall we allow Monsieur Stevens to go on with his demonstration? I have a feeling we shouldn't do this. I'm afraid! Upstairs at the Villa Bijou... There is a small, bare, deeply carpeted room. Its only furniture consists of a round table, five chairs, and a large cabinet phonograph. There is only one door, and there are no windows. In one chair, a little way back from the table, sits Mr. Alexander Stevens. He is tied hand and foot, the outline of his shoes drawn with pencil on pieces of paper, so that he cannot move. Now then, friend Raphael, have you quite finished tying me up? Yes, and I bet you you won't get out of these knots, sir. Well, we'll see about that. Are the rest of you ready? Yes, yes, all right. Oh, dear, I I wish I'd put some smelling salts in my handbag. Well, what do you want us to do now? We'll have conditions exactly as they are for Mr. Ravel. I'll sit in this chair back from the table. You four sit around the table, clasping hands to form a circle. All right, let's get on with it. Ken, will you start the gramophone? (laughs) <laughs> I believe it's customary, Mr. Ravel, to have hymns played at the beginning of the seance to establish the proper frame of mind. Yes, monsieur, that's true. You fool. What did you say? Oh, uh, nothing, monsieur. Please continue. Start the gramophone, Ken. When you've done that, turn out the lights on that switch by the door. 
Then join the circle. Clasp each other's hands tightly and don't let go unless... Unless what? Well, unless something gets me. Be careful, monsieur. Go on, please. Start the gramophone. All right, here goes. Now the lights, Ken. Switch off the lights. Lights? Yes, yes, yes. There you are. It's pitch dark. I can't see my way back to the table. Here, Ken. Here's my hand. Thank you. Mine on the, on the other side, Mr. Blake. Thank you. I've got my bearings now. Are all of you clasping the hands of the next person? Then quiet and wait for what's going to happen. Ken, look. Look where? Over there, where Mr. Stevens is sitting. What about it? There's a luminous spot in the dark, about the size of a shilling. It's... Shh, it's... shh, quiet, quiet, please. Did anything touch the back of your neck? No. Ah! What was that? Where's Eric Stevens? I know it. This was not on a program, madame. Break the circle and get those lights on. The luminous spot is still there. Oh, hurry, Ken. I can't see my way in the dark. I don't know which direction the lights are. Wait a minute. Here's the wall. If I grope along here, I ought to find the switch. Yes, yes, here it is. Lights. Ah! Quiet. Quiet silence, mademoiselle, if you please. What's wrong with Mr. Stevens? What's that sticking out of his chest? the handle of a dagger. And a good deal of blood has soaked through his coat, too. <laughs> well, Monsieur Blake, will you turn off this gramophone? Yes, certainly. But you're not saying that Toby Stevens is dead. I'm afraid he is, my friend. That's a direct heart wound. Perhaps ten seconds of intense agony, and then the end. Or oh, is the door still bolted from the inside? Yes. And we are all alone, here, the four of us. This rash gentleman, one imagines, did not kill himself. He's too well tied up. I know who killed him. Mr. George Ravel. You did, with luminous paint. I killed him, mademoiselle? With luminous paint? I mean, that was part of the trick. You tied him up. You were the only one who touched him. And? What of that, mademoiselle? Luminous paint doesn't show up in the light. You smeared a little of it on his coat. That showed you exactly where to strike in the dark. I commend your good sense, madame. But there are two excellent reasons why I had nothing to do with this. The first reason I, I must keep to myself, but the second reason can easily be proved. Well, what is it? Well, up to the time that man screamed, you yourself were holding my right hand, and madame Hester was holding my left hand. Did either of you let go at any time? No. No, that, that is, I didn't. What about you, Aunt Hester? No, no, Marjorie did. I didn't let go either. He never moved. Hold on. Wait a minute. Well, monsieur, speak up. I was holding Marjorie's hand on one side and her aunt's on the other. And they didn't move either. Nobody let go or left the circle. That's true. Consequently, none of us could have killed Toby Stevens. Yes, it is true. Somebody must have sneaked in here. Oh, no. As you said yourself, the door is bolted on the inside. Then who the devil did kill him? Well, that's the question. Has anybody ever seen that dagger before? No. It, it looks like one of those curio things you buy in the shops. Yes, and uh, with the design of wooden scroll work on the handle. No fingerprints will show. Nothing else. Except some musical instruments. <laughs> a tambourine, an accordion, and a speaking trumpet. You know, I, I blame myself for this. You ought to. Why? Because you killed him. Don't ask me how, but I know why. Indeed, mademoiselle. You found my motive. Yes, yes, I have. You've got Aunt Hester fully believing in you now, haven't you? Easy, Marjorie. In another minute, you'll be talking about forces and elementals and heaven knows what. <laughs> you'll be saying it was a spirit hand that killed Mr. Stevens because nobody else could have. Please, Marjorie, brace up. Someone's got to send for the police. Why don't you send for the police, Ken? Couldn't you help us there? Help you? How? Mr. Stevens said you knew the heads of the Sûreté. He said you knew this man, Flamand, who's supposed to be the greatest detective in France. Oh, but this isn't French territory. Monte Carlo is the independent state of Monaco. I'm sorry, Marjorie. Ordinarily, I might have helped. You mean you won't help us? I'm sorry, Marjorie. I can't. Then I've got to help myself. George Ravel, you killed Mr. Stevens! But how? Yes, how? <laughs> Oh, 
24 hours later, 24 hours of blind puzzling. In the railway station at Nice, nine miles from Monte Carlo, the night express for Paris is already underway. The guard has blown his signal and the great wheels grind. A young man, hatless and worried, pushes through the crowd past the already moving train. No, monsieur. C'est défendu. Vous êtes trop tard. Too late. Nothing. I'm getting aboard this train. Prenez garde, monsieur. Prenez garde. I'm sorry to have caused you any trouble, guard. But do you happen to know whether... Marjorie. Ken Blake. What are you doing on this train? Exactly the question I wanted to ask you. Walk along the corridor with me, will you? All right. Marjorie, you little idiot. What's the idea of running away? If it's any of your business, Mr. Blake, I'm not running away. I'm merely going to Paris. You were told to stay in Monte Carlo. Don't you know you can land in jail for this? They'll put you in jail too, won't they? Yes, I suppose so. But what's the idea of going to Paris? Well, first of all, I had to get Aunt Hester away from that man, Ravel. She really thinks he can call up ghosts now. Is your aunt on this train? Yes, in that compartment there. Second, I'm going to Paris for some real help. I'm going to the Sûreté. I'm going to see this man, Flamand. You won't find Flamand in Paris, Marjorie. And you'll certainly never get him to arrest Georges Ravel. Oh? And why not? Because, my dear idiot, Georges Ravel is Flamand. What are you saying? The man who calls himself Ravel is really Flamand, the head of the whole French detective bureau. He made me promise not to tell anybody. And that's why you've been looking so guilty for two days. Yes, I tried to tip you off today, but the police were with us all the time. So he is a fake spiritual medium. Mr. Stevens was right about that. And I still say I'm right about the other thing. Whoever he is, Ravel killed Mr. Stevens. But how and why? Oh, I don't know. This alleged detective. Did he tell you why he was masquerading as a medium in Monte Carlo? No. All I know is that we're in one sweet mess. We've left town without permission... They'll probably stop the train and send us back in a patrol wagon. Oh, no, 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 my friend. That won't be at all necessary. Ravel! Yes, mademoiselle. Ravel or uh, Flamand. <laughs> well, since you know me as Ravel, call me that. You, you knew that I was on this train? Oh, naturally. Look here, old man. I kept quiet about you because you swore it was a matter of life and death. But will you answer a couple of questions now? Oh, with pleasure. Why did you pose as a medium? Because the Monarchan government employed me to trap a murderer. So I had to work hard, you see, undercover. All right. Why was Toby Stevens killed? Stevens was killed because he was a blackmailer. A blackmailer? Yes, mademoiselle. Does that surprise you? Yes. Oh, yes, of course. Very much. I tried to warn Stevens, but the fool wouldn't listen. And then, well, I wasn't quick enough. Stevens was murdered, of course, by one of us four in the seance room. Well, that's impossible. Hmm? Impossible? Oh, no. The trick was baffling because of its simplicity. I'm sure you killed him. <laughs> one moment, mademoiselle. Let me show you what I mean by trick, baffling, because it is so simple. Take, for example, the pencil outline drawn on a paper around the medium shoes. Did Stevens tell you... How I did that? No. On this train two nights ago, he, he started to tell us, but... And then he just stopped in the middle of it and laughed. <laughs> you see, the medium leaves his chair. Well, he makes tambourines rattle and ghost forms appear. Yet the pencil outline is not disturbed. Now, how does he manage it? Well, how does he manage it? Well, quite easily. He returns to his chair... He turns over the two pieces of paper. He takes another pencil and draws an outline of his shoes on the reverse side of the paper. <laughs> you look at it. And... and imagine it's the same outline we drew. Precisely. So easily are people misled. And it was the same way with a murder. But there couldn't have been any trick about the murder. None of us left the circle. We were all clasping hands when we heard that scream. Don't you agree? Hmm? Oh, yes, I agree. I can't stand this any longer. When we heard Mr. Stevens utter that horrible scream... What I... makes you think it was Stevens who uttered that scream? I... I beg your pardon. What makes you think it was Stevens who screamed? Well, wasn't it? Oh, you assumed it, yes. We, we all assumed it. But up to that time, Stevens wasn't even hurt. Wasn't hurt? 
You see, the source of sound cannot be located in the dark. It was the murderer who uttered that appalling cry. In a few seconds of darkness, before the lights went on, the killer simply leaned across and drove that dagger into Stevens' chest. And you proved that? Yes. If Stevens had been hit at the time of the scream, blood would have blotted out the spot of luminous paint. Yet, Marjorie Gray saw the paint shining after the scream. That's true, Marjorie. I heard you say so. You put the luminous paint there, Ravel. You were the only person who touched him. Oh, no. There was one other person who touched him. Who was it? Another person in full sight of you said Stevens had spilled broth on his coat and swabbed at his chest with a handkerchief. You mean... I mean, of course, the real murderer. You were Aunt Hester. Yes, Marjorie. You are Aunt Hester. Aunt Hester! Keep back, all of you. Oh, so you managed to find a revolver. Marjorie, I poisoned your Uncle Paul. I poisoned my husband. And Alex Stevens knew it. You can't get away, madame. <laughs> Keep away from that door. I never believed in spiritualism. I let myself be influenced by a medium because Alex Stevens would try to stop it. He was getting money out of me. He wanted no other influence. Don't open that door, madame. But I am opening it. Oh, Aunt Hester, don't! I told you I wasn't a fool as I looked. I had the knife in my hand. Back. Stop her, kid! Stop her! No! Well, mademoiselle, <laughs> she has committed many crimes, but now she has paid for them all. <laughs> So closes The Moment of Darkness, starring Peter Laurie, Wendy Berry, with George Zuko. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when Agnes Moorhead and Ray Collins will star in a study in terror titled The Diary of Sophronia Winter. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Wilbur Hatch, Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
lightning flash. Do you see? My eyes are dazzled. What should I be seeing? There, in the center of the cloud. What? An open turret, drawn by a fierce black heart. And a child clinging in terror to the man. There he goes. The storm breathes. drama, The Storm Breeder, was especially adapted from the classic William Austin story for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Tolan and Fred Gwynn. I'll be back shortly with Act One. For the strange, weird, unforgettable fragment of American history brought to you here, we are indebted according to William Austin, to one Jonathan Dunwell of New York. Mr. Dunwell was a judge, and as such, a general officer of the court by profession, but by inclination, an antiquarian and a collector of American history. It is his manuscript we bring to life. In the summer of 1820, business called me to Boston, I sailed in the packet to Providence, and when I arrived there, I learned that every seat in the stage was engaged. I was fortunate enough to find a seat with the driver. It being a pleasant night, and he quite intelligent, we were chatting pleasantly when all of a sudden the horses drew their ears on their necks flat as a hare's, and the whole business of Peter Rudd began. What's the matter with the horses? Have you a sir, too, with you? Oh, I need no overcoat. My jacket is enough. Uh, you'll need one soon. You see the horse's ears. Well, as a matter of fact, yes. I was just about to ask why. They see the storm breather. The who? Well, you'll find out, sir. Keep your eyes ahead. I am. The road seems empty, and the weather is lovely, not a cloud in the sky. Yeah, but you will see him soon. For the weather that follows will blot out the sun. Are you pulling my leg, driver? I were, Mr. Dunwell, sir. Dear sir, wind, wind this bracket about you. But the sun is shining, and I'm very... to what I say. Protect yourself as much as you can. Approaching us was a weather-beaten chair, once built for a shaved body drawn by a great black fiery horse, traveling at least at the speed of 12 miles an hour. Seated in it were a child and a man who glanced at us as he passed in such dejection of spirit and hopelessness that my heart seemed to suspend beating momentarily. In the moment that he passed us, our horse's ears sprang forward and bent so that they nearly met. Who, uh, who was that man? Nobody knows. And the child? Nor her. No both are familiar to me. I must have passed them more than a hundred times on near as many routes. Without ever exchanging a word? Not a word. In the beginning, he used to stop and inquire the way to Boston, even when he was traveling directly away from the town. But since he never seemed to follow my directions, I have ceased communication with him. So that was the reason for the strange, fixed look he turned on you. It could be. And now he's gone. Disappeared as if neither he nor that frail, shivering child had ever been. Does he never stop anywhere? Never longer than to inquire the way to Boston. I see no signs of this promised storm. But look in the direction from which this man came. The storm follows him. I get you're right. There is a little black cloud speck in the east, but not much more than the size of my hat. Aye, that there's the seed storm. With luck, we may reach Polly's tavern before it strikes. But to mark my word, the wanderer and his child will go on through rain and thunder and lightning to Providence. To the town we are coming from, you mean? Yes, sir. I would guess the real Providence is as far out of his reach as the Boston. He never seems able to find either. Rub that saddle blanket about you. Here it comes. Hey, hey. Did you have? Did you have? Mark you in his lightning flash. Do you see? My eyes are dead. 
Dazzle. What do you mean? Watch as it comes, Hector. There! In the center of the cloud. What? Don't you see? An open carriage drawn by a black horse and the child clinging in terror to the man. Now look! Do you see? I see nothing but the lightning and the boiling blackness of the cloud. No matter, perhaps as well for you. The whole past, we go full out. Hey! Get you up! Move, then! Move! Within a few minutes, we had broached a rise, and sliding and slithering came down into the hollow to Polly's tavern. In spite of the summer weather, a steam of damp arose from our clothes and those of other travelers. And the whole common room seemed to be awash with discussion of the storm breeder, whom almost all of them seemed to have met on the road. Ah, the name is Darlington of Boston, in the import-export trade. Uh, Jonathan Dunwell, recently seated as judge in our circuit courts, bound from New York to your fair city. Well, sir, my pleasure and privilege to meet so distinguished a gentleman. I'm afraid your city is fast surpassing ours in credit and notoriety. Not entirely, sir. I'm afraid a citizen of your city is the focus of all conversation tonight. The storm breeder. Uh, Did you chance on him? No, as it happens, not today. But too many times. Too many times? I could wish to see neither that man nor his horse again. For they seem not to belong to this world. Well, how's that? I saw them plain, father and daughter, passing us on the road. Uh, Did you speak? No. I have seen him wet and weary many times before tonight. And no one who has ever once seen him can ever be deceived again as to his identity. You know him by name? Yes, sir. Peter Rugg. Peter Rugg. But who is this mysterious man? Ah, uh, that is more than anyone can tell exactly. Save that he is a famous traveler. Though held in low esteem by all in for he never stops to eat, drink, nor sleep. <laughs> but why does the man never stop anywhere? Long enough to speak to anyone, at least. By those who know the most about him, say the least. It is asserted that sometimes heaven sets a mark on a man. For judgment or for trial. I'm thinking of the one time Rugg spoke to me. I was in Connecticut, time, on a winding road, my horse as weary as myself. It was toward dusk, and all of a sudden, from behind me, traveling at that reckless clip for those roads, a fiery black horse pulling an open chaise caught up to me from behind. Uh, Will you tell me how far it is to boat? One hundred miles. One hundred? How can you say so? I was told last night it was but 50, and I have traveled all night. Problem is, sir, you are traveling from Boston. You must turn back. How can you tell me so? It is all turn back. Boston shifts with the wind. One man tells me it is to the east, the other west. You and the guideposts all point the wrong way. I think perhaps you're tired. And your little girl, too. Why not stop and rest? You're wet and weary. Yes, foul weather since I left home. Stop then up ahead of the inn and refresh. No, no, I cannot stop. Do you see what follows me? I must ever stay ahead of it. So I must reach home tonight. I... I pray you are mistaken in the distance to Boston. I wish I were... May I, uh, may I make some bold as to inquire if you are Peter Rugg? I think we've met before. My name is Rugg. I meet so many. Uh, I have lost my way. I am wet and weary. I would take it kindly if you would direct me to Boston. Where do you live in Boston? On what street? Why... Middle Street. Everyone knows the house with the great shade maple across from the cemetery. When did you leave Boston? I'm 
I, I cannot tell precisely. It seems a considerable time. What, sir? How did you and your child become so wet? It has not rained in these parts today. Uh, the shower caught me back on the road a piece. It always catches me, unless I keep moving. Moving. Uh, would you advise me to take the old road or the turnpike? Oh, why? The old road is over 120 miles. The turnpike for 97. You impose on me. It, it is wrong to trifle with a traveler. You know it is only some 40 miles from Newburyport to Boston. But this is not Newburyport. This is Hartford. Well, do not deceive me, sir. Is not this river I have been following, the Merrimack? Oh, no, sir. You are just outside Hartford. And this river is the Connecticut. Then have the rivers changed their courses? Has the cities their places? Am I forever... Uh, but again the clouds are gathering and the storm is at my heels. God curses me for that fatal road. He will talk no longer. His impatient horse leaps off, his flanks rising like wings. That's the last time I saw the ill-fated Mr. Rod. Amazing. But you say he gave his address as Middle Street. That is correct, Mr. Uh, I should say Judge Dunwell. The house with the great maple shade tree across from the cemetery. So he said. Do you know Boston well enough to locate it? Oh, no, sir. And my business seldom carries me that way. But mine does. I think for curiosity's sake I must go to Peter Rugg's home. I tried to find out why it is so difficult to return to. Twenty years, you said, you've been seeing him on the road. Oh, all of that. And the last was the only time we spoke. I should like to meet the man face to face. If for no other reason than to find a better fate for that little girl long since turned woman. When I get to Boston, I shall make it my first order of business. Which is exactly what I did. It was not easy, for the maps were inaccurate, and there was more than one middle street. But finally I found it. The great tree smothering the house so that it lay in a shadowy gloom. The paint was peeling. The windows cracked and cobweb-ridden. But the path to the door was cleared, and I was sure that someone or something still lived there. It was with a strange trepidation I walked through the weeds and lifted the heavy knocker. At last, with a deep breath, I let it fall. Then, in utter silence, bathed in the shadowed gloom, I waited to meet whatever waited behind that door. The house abandoned by its master for countless years. Is it possible that any evidence of him has remained? Or his family? Does some heartbroken woman still wait for that lost child? or even for the storm breeder himself. Who and what is Peter Rugg? Phantom? Or reality? Or legend? We shall have to await those answers with Judge Dunwell until I return shortly with Act Two. Judge Dunwell was never fated to have an answer to his knock on the door. For in the very moment that something old stirs and rustles within the house, outside it, the small noises are smothered by the arrival of the familiar black chaise and the snorting, prancing steed that draws it. Whoa, my foot! Whoa! Don't you recognize home at last? 
At the sound of the arrival, instinctively I had withdrawn deeper in the shadows, finding perfect concealment behind a clump of overgrown rhododendra. Twilight was just upon us. As a confident and somehow younger man than I remembered Peter Rudd to be, strode up the path, just in time for the door to open. The little girl sat timid and immobile on the seat of the carriage, as if knowing the hopelessness of it all. Somewhere, low thunder grumbled. Mistress Rugg, your husband is sorry to have been delayed, but circumstances beyond... Uh, uh, I... I beg your pardon, madam, but I am looking for Mistress Catherine Rugg. Who? Who did you say? My wife, madam. The Mistress Rugg. Oh, Lord bless you, sir. She ain't here. Ain't been here in this world for 50 years. What do you mean? I mean, she's dead and gone like all birds. Dead and gone and buried and lost. But that can't be. I'm, uh, I'm tired and worn, but this... Uh, I know my own house. I live here. Oh, no, you don't. Not now you don't, whoever you are. I can show you deed and title which says that it's mine. It is true. It seems as though it might be on the wrong side of the street. I I don't know. It's it's, it's hard to... Uh, uh, forgive me, madam. I'm confused. Everything seems misplaced. The streets change. The people change. The, the town changed. And what is strangest of all, Catherine Rugg has deserted her husband and child. Oh, pray tell me. Has John Foy come home from sea? Who? John Foy, my kinsman. He could give me some account of Mrs. Rugg. I never heard of John Foy. Where does he live? Just above here on Orange Tree Lane. Oh, bless you for a stranger. No such place in this neighborhood. But that can't be possible. The street's gone. Orange Lane is not the head of Hanover Street near... Bamberton's Hill. There is no such lane now. You, you cannot be serious. Woman, you mock me. The next thing you will tell me is that there is no King George. However, be that as it may, you must see, madam, that both my daughter and myself are wet and weary. I, I must find a resting place. Can you direct me to Boston? But this is Boston. The only city of Boston I know. But not the one I know. <laughs> yes, Lightfoot, coming. Coming. I am wrong, of course. I don't know how I could have mistaken it, but this is a much finer city than Boston. And Boston must lie at a distance, my good woman, since you are ignorant of it. Yes. It's the same old story. I must away. No. Mr. Rugg, wait. Wait. Who are you, sir? Oh, a thousand pardons, Mr. Croft. May I, may I present myself? Judge Jonathan Dunwell of the circuit courts, but recently come to Boston. A judge? Have you some business with that man? Not legal business, but I... I hope to meet him here and question him. I am obsessed with a desire to know exactly who and what he is. I'm ashamed for allowing you to stand so long in the rain. Come in and warm yourself by my fire. May I offer you some more sherry, Your Worship? No, no. You are more than kind to have given me what I have against the chill. Heaven help that poor man in an open carriage. And that child beside him. And the child. That a man named Rugg once owned this house is all I know. The factor who arranged for my father to take it over is supposed to have made sure all papers are legal. How I wish I could have stopped him, learned more about him, tried to solve the mystery of him. The mystery of him? Well, I cannot help there, but I should... Think the factor who sold us this house should know more of him than anyone, if he is still alive. Could you give me his name and address? 
I shall not rest till I have followed this strange affair to its depths and its beginnings. Understand the hour is late, Judge. Yes, I, I do indeed, Mr. Felt. You you know the history of Peter Rugg, sometime of Middle Street in this district? Uh, yeah. I, I will be brief. He rented a property of mine in his youth. He was married to a fine young woman who bore him a, 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 a daughter, as I remember. Jenny. So I believe was the name. With no matter, an offspring. And then without so much as a buy your leave, he ran off with the child, leaving the wife to die, as I believe or remember. Yes, 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 yes. She, she died. Why? Well, damn it, she was deserted. Fortunately, Rugg left no creditors. He owned his horse and chaise and... After she died, it was all soon forgotten. Yeah, soon, soon forgotten. I suppose, suppose he died. No. To the best of my belief, he is now alive and living. I have lately seen him and his horse and chaise, and his child. Oh, is that so? That's so. Well, now, I wouldn't presume to argue with a man of your standing that Peter Rugg could still be alive. I... I will not deny, but Jenny Rugg, if you saw her, I've seen her, the, the, the Boston Massacre was 1770, was it not? I fortunately avoided it, but history records that date. So, on that date, Jenny was ten years of age, and if living, that would make her, let's see, sixty. Now, give or take a year. Do you know what you're saying? <laughs> if Peter Rugg is still alive, which I take is possible, he could be only ten years older than myself. And I was only eighty last March. It was obvious that Mr. Felt was in his dotage. So despairing of gaining any further intelligence from him, I returned to my lodgings at the Marlborough Hotel. If Peter Rugg, I thought to myself, has been traveling since the Boston Massacre, there is no reason I can see now that he shouldn't travel to the end of time. And I might have left it there had I not descended to the tap room for a nightcap and there encountered Mr. Derwin. I ran up against a man whose grandfather knew our elusive friend, Mr. Rugg, and can now tell you the whole story, such as it is. Then by all means begin. It seems that, if my informant is worthy of credit, Peter Rugg, a man in comfortable circumstances, with one daughter and a wife, lived in Boston on Middle Street. He was a man generally esteemed, save for one thing. Don't keep me on tenterhooks. What? An ungovernable temper. So violent that the wig would rise from his head. And while his fits were upon him, he had no respect for heaven or earth. A sorry spectacle. Some of it hard to believe. Less hard to believe than his punishment for it. Well, what does that mean, sir? Well, whilst visiting in Concord one day late in autumn... With his daughter in the chaise, drawn by his favorite horse, a great black beast named Lightfoot, a tremendous storm overtook them, driving them for shelter as dark fell under the roof of a friend of his, a Mr. Cutter, who urged him to tarry the night. Which any man in his right senses under the circumstances would do. And he did not heed his pleas? Far from it, Judge. Instead... The vein standing out on his neck and at his temples, he screamed to high heaven, Let the storm increase! Let God and the devil wreck their worst! I will see hope tonight, or never see it more! And with that, he clapped whip to his horse and disappeared. 
disappeared into the raging night. Never to return home? Never. Incredible. There was an apt. Supernatural. Why? The man is a cousin. Whether by God or, or by the devil, I know not which. Still, 50 years of wandering in search of his home. How could it be possible? Well, now, as to that, there are two theories. One I heard from my informant. His grandfather said that on the day after he left Concord 50 years ago, his friends and neighbors started inquiries. But it appeared that Peter Rugg had stayed no place in Boston. His wife had a strange tale. What tale is that? Sitting by the window, waiting on that wild night, there was a sudden sound like an earthquake. And indeed, the whole house rumbled underneath her as if about to cave in. Peering out through the storm, she saw a strange sight. What sight was that? Coming hell for leather down the street was Peter Rugg in his carriage, straining back on the reins in a vain effort to stop his horse and crying, No, I could not! wanted to leave his wife and never come home at all. That there was another woman somewhere. That scarcely fits the facts as we know them. Well, then, there is the other theory. Which is? Perhaps best told by the woman who had the experience. Now, she's the wife of the toll gatherer on the Charlestown Bridge. Would you care to hear her tale for yourself? Well, sir, it's many years ago by now. My old man has gone to his rest. Lord save him who could spare me out. In those days, we were both young and spry, and many the evening I used to keep him company here for Tollgate. Those days were when? Oh, I am just 50 years ago. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to have interrupted. Go on with your story. But I, I remembered how annoyed Ethan was by this big black horse and the chairs and the man and the little girl. He used to tell me how they continually were in contempt of the race crossing the bridge without stopping or paying. And were they always followed by bad weather? Why, bless you, sir, that is the truth. My Ian used to say they brought bad luck. And you say you saw them? One evening we heard them thundering up, and I said, This time they ain't going to take it out on you, Ethan. You're too easy going. So when he called them to halt, and they kept on, I had grabbed up a three-legged stool. Heavy it was, but I was young and strong, and I hurled it square into the horse's belly. And tell the judge what happened then. Right through that horse, as if it were a shatter. He never even broke stride as the stool went skipping across the bridge. No, sir, that was a haunt. A ghost rider with bad luck right in the dust of his wheels. So, Judge Dunwell, what is your judgment? I don't know. Neither explanation fits the pattern of my mind. And I have a feeling that I am not yet done with Peter Rugg. Nor will be till his fate is truly revealed to me. And the judge's instinct was right. Neither he nor we are yet done with the haunting tale of Peter Rugg, the man 
or ghost who wanders so hopelessly in search of home and rest. I'll return shortly with Act Three. It was to be five years before Peter Ruggs and Judge Dunwell's paths crossed again. For some time, the judge had tried to track down the sometimes elusive person or legend, whichever he was. Then, being only human, Peter Rugg had almost passed from his mind until... until the rest of the judge's story, which you are about to hear now. In the autumn of 1825, I attended the races at Richmond and Virginia. There was great excitement and the races were well attended, for it was a match race between two recognized champions, a roan called Dart and a light gray mare called Butterfly. At a signal, the gun sounded, and they were off. I was glued to the race. There seemed no way of choosing which horse might win. When suddenly there was an extra wave of excitement from the already madly cheering crowd. To my open mouthed astonishment, appearing as if from nowhere in the rear, was a majestic black horse of unusual size, drawing an old weather beaten chair. Effortlessly, as if his heavy non racing vehicle, encumbered as it was by two occupants, didn't exist, he overtook the racing horses shortly before the winning line. And in concert, both Dot and Butterfly, as the horse passed them, lay back their ears and pulled up short, so that no contest was called. And the winning black horse and his carriage passed the finish line and faded away over the hill. In the clubhouse later, I was fortunate enough to have an introduction to one John Spring, the owner and rider of Butterfly. Damn it, sir, that was no horse that overtook my man. No one can outrun Butterfly. No horse, that is. Why, I had bet all I have she would show her heels to Dorf. Well, no doubt she would if the Good bar- horse, make no mistake. Good horse would start a great one. Oh, but not to outrun my Butterfly. That, that ox or whatever animal it was that frightened off our horses. Why, that, that makes no contest, sir. No contest. And yet it looked like a horse. In no fashion, sir. Nor was it. In no fashion. And that I can prove. How is that, Mr. Spring? By my own observation and countless others, sir. Would you like to see? I would indeed. Well, then, follow me. Now, you remember? Yes, but here, both of them pulled up and let that interloper go by and disappear. Yes, the the view is unfamiliar from this point, but I I do remember it was shortly before the finish line. Exactly, sir. Both horses have to pull them up, walk deliberately to this spot of soft ground. Butterfly dropped her head and then lifted it, wickering and fried. Dart followed by doing the same and snorting in a sort of anger. All of us looked to what they had examined. See you then there for yourself, Judge. I was looking at the hoof marks of the black horse which had carried on to the finish line and beyond. Horse? From the evidence of my eyes from the stands, yes. From the same evidence as I looked at the soft ground... Mr. Spring's strange claim had real validity. These were not the marks of a horse's hooves, but the evidence of another breed of animal or being. The hooves were cloven. Judge Dunwell! Mr. Derwin, your business takes you far afield. In the nature of things. Not like what happened today at the races. You saw? Oh, yes. I was stunned, weren't you? I thought Peter Rock had vanished. Oh, no, not either. In the years since we met, I have come across him time and again. And gotten soaked to the skin because of him. 
in New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and the last time, but shortly, in Delaware. Have you spoken? The last time only. Tell me, if you will, what took place. Well, sir, on his throat, he checked his horse with some difficulty. A more beautiful horse I'd never seen. Sir, your face seems familiar. Perhaps I may engage your help. If you are, as may be, traveling to Boston, I should be glad to accompany you, for I have lost my way. My little girl here is weary, and I must reach home tonight. Ah, that would be impossible, sir. For you are in Concord, in the county of Sussex, which is in the state of Delaware. But Concord, that is only 20 miles from Boston, and my horse Lightfoot could carry me to the Charlestown Ferry in less than two hours. Uh, You mistake, sir. Um, You are a stranger here. I am well acquainted with Concord, and this town is nothing like it. Because this is Concord in the state of Delaware. Huh? Uh, What do you mean by state? Why, one of the United States, man. Uh, States? Uh, Do you mock me? Because my heritage is Dutch? I know well I am not in Holland. As a gentleman, I beg you not to mislead me. Tell me, quickly, for pity's sake, before my horse swallows his bit, he is so starved. Set me on the right road for Boston. If I could, and I did, it would be 500 miles from here. 500 miles, you say? Nay, I will listen no more. This beats the Connecticut River. Get up, my foot. Get up. I can explain his last mark. I met him, as you may remember, outside Hartford, when he persisted in mistaking the Connecticut River for the Charles. So our wandering homeseeker is still abroad. Man or spirit, I shall not rest until he can. But how to help him? The courts were closed until the winter session. It seemed to me that the judgment on Peter Rubb was too great, too inhumane, too unreasonable for the extent of his small crime. I made it my business wholly for once to try to catch him again. But I always seemed fated to be just too late. At the toll gate on the turnpike between Alexandria and Middleburg, he had passed and paid no toll. But the toll gatherer was grateful, for he brought rain behind him to relieve a drought. Back in Virginia at the toll bridge, an irate gatekeeper told me that annoyed by the number of times Rudd had passed that way refusing to pay, he had stood in the way of the vehicle, and it had passed right through him, or over him without so much as touching him. On the ferry boat across the Hudson, a Mr. Hardy who collected fares showed me a fare that a man had given him, insisting it was 30 shillings. It might have been once. It was a half crown, coined by the British Parliament, dated 1649. Then I knew I had caught up with Peter Rugg again at last. I found him in his rig at the bow of the boat. Greetings, Mr. Rugg. Huh? Judge Dunwell, we have met on the road before. That could be possible, sir. May I say that since you are a stranger here, my house is your home. Uh, Dame Rod will be happy to see her husband's friend. Uh, Step into my chair, sir, if you will. Uh, Move over, Jenny, for the great man. We shall be in Middle Street very shortly. For many reasons, I will take advantage of your kind invitation. I sneaked a glance at my companions. Both were dressed in incredibly old-fashioned garments of fine cloth, but showing great wear. Rug himself, at least in the face, was little more than skin drawn over the skull and cheekbones. Jenny was so bundled up she suggested only to my sad and horrified eye what her wizened, dried-out face proclaimed. A small Egyptian mummy. 
Only Lightfoot looked bigger, sleeker, and more magnificent than ever. Uh, this is not Boston, sir. Then, mayhap it is New York. <laughs> How can it be New York, sir, when that place is 200 and more miles from Boston? But I, I thought I was home. Mr. Rudd, look to the west. Only the size of a blackberry now, but that looks like an angry storm on our trail. Ah, it is in vain to escape. I know that cloud. It brings new wrath to spend on my head. Go now, kind stranger, whoever you are. Leave me to my fate. No, not this time, Peter Rudd. Give me the reins. This time, perhaps we can outrun the storm. I took them from his slack hand sliding over him and pushing him back to huddle with his daughter. And it needed only one flick to send that strange horse on his way like the wind. As we careened around the first corner, I noticed that his front hooves had been split on some hard road somewhere, but were healing. So Mr. Spring had been at least half right about the cloven hooves. I remembered little of that nightmare ride for Boston. How many days passed, where we stayed, or ate or slept. I only know that no matter how fast we traveled, that mushrooming black cloud stayed on our heels every step of the way. And then at last, we were in Boston, on Middle Street. A crowd was gathered. The great elm still stood, although barren now of leaves, fire blackened. And all that remained of the house was a heap of rubble. All else burnt to the ground, as I knew it to be, for the fire had taken place Two years before. You men of the North End, this is holy ground. The city needs this land. And let not the name of Peter Rock dampen your ardor. No! I hold renting title to this place. No, hush, Mr. Rugg. Listen for a moment longer. Let no man tried to tell you that Peter Rugg is long since dead and gone to his reward. No, 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 no. Let us make the seek the right and title to this land which is free and clear. But how can this be? Who has burned my house to the ground? And who are all these strange people? I, I thought I knew every man in Boston, but I do not recollect at this moment that I ever saw one of these. Who are these strangers? Listen to me, Peter Rugg. The only stranger here is you. You have suffered many years under an illusion. Look, look behind. The cloud, the storm. Your nemesis is gathering. Then I must flee. Away from home again. Oh, if you do, you have no home. If I stay, there is none left. Don't you see that for over 50 years, the tempest which you so profanely defied at monotony has driven you before it like a straw in the wind? And now it is too late. Your wife, your house, and all your neighbors have disappeared. You have no home left here. You've been cut off from one age, and you can never be fitted to the present. You can never have another home again in this world. You or your daughter, unless... Yes. Quickly, for the storm is almost upon us. Unless what? Unless you stop fleeing it. Let it catch up with you and perhaps pass you by. Then mayhap at long last you can find rest. Oh, rest. Sweet, blessed rest. Oh, my father, forgive me. And take me and Jenny Oh. The great black clouds and teeming rain engulfed us all. My last view of Peter Rugg was standing with his arm about his daughter. His face lifted to the rain. And wonder of wonders, at last the child's head, too, was lifted. In the intensity of it, they were lost. And suddenly the storm passed. For a moment, in its last fringe, I saw the two of them, eyes on heaven. And then, as if they had never been, chaise, horse, harness, father and daughter were gone. Where? I do not know. I can only hope home at last. Judge 
done well, lived out a long and fruitful life, dying quietly in his bed one night. We do not know what his last thoughts were, but certainly one of them must have been that in all the last 40 years of his life, he never again met or heard of Peter Rugg. in all history or literature than the soul condemned to wander, lost, alone, cut off. And I do have to wonder a little if Peter Rugg didn't make his own penance. What we fear in life we should not run from, especially if we can't outdistance it. Turn and meet it face to face. It's surprising that the reality is never as bad as the imagined. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Fred Gwynn, Anne Petoniak, Arnold Moss, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... From New York, where the American stage begins, NBC presents Best Plays, transcribed with John Chapman. of hour-length dramas based on famous theatrical books begun by the late Burns Mantle, now edited by the distinguished drama critic of the New York Daily News, John Chapman. Mr. Chapman. Good evening. Almost 600 years ago, a man named Geoffrey Chaucer coined a phrase. He couldn't spell very well, apparently, so what he wrote must have sounded to him something like this. Mordra wall out, certain. It wall not file. We've been practicing up on spelling and pronunciation during the last few centuries and have figured out that what Chaucer meant was murder will out, certainly. It can't miss. And so it can't. It rarely misses in the theater. The season of 1940-41 was an excellent one for murder, and for comedy in the best plays of the Broadway theater. Owen Davis had adapted a novel by Francis and Richard Lockridge, Mr. and Mrs. North, about an attractive young couple blundering their way into the detective business, and this play was a hit. Joseph Kesselring wrote another one about murder by the dozen, which he originally titled Bodies in Our Cellar. This turned out to be Arsenic and Old Lace, which had 1,444 performances. Only six other plays in the history of the Broadway stage have run longer. In the company on the first night of January 10, 1941, were Boris Karloff, Jean Adair, and other fine comedians. Now, in this best play's performance, we have Mr. Karloff and Donald Cook as two strangely different brothers. Mr. Cook currently is starring in the Broadway hit The Moon is Blue. Our company also includes Jean Adair and Edgar Staley from the original production... And Evelyn Varden is the nice little lady who likes to give all our guests elderberry wine. The performance is beginning. On a quiet street under the arching elms in the town of Brooklyn, New York, 
The old Brewster home stands in dignified and over-decorated glory. The gas mantles are still in the hall, although electricity was installed several years ago. It's tea time, and Miss Abby Brewster pours. The minister is visiting, and Miss Abby and her nephew Teddy are most attentive. Won't you have another biscuit, Dr. Harper? Oh, no, Miss Abby. I always eat too many of your biscuits just to taste the lovely jam. But you haven't tried the quince. We always put a little apple in with it to take the tartness out. We'll send you over a jar. Teddy, more tea. What? Bless. Bless. Miss Abby... I've been meaning to speak to you about your nephew, Mortimer, I mean. Oh, yes, I understand he's taking Elaine to the theater again tonight. Teddy, your brother Mortimer will be here a little later. Delighted. We are so happy it's Elaine that Mortimer takes to the theater with him. Uh, Miss Abby, I'll be frank with you. I do not entirely approve your nephew's unfortunate connection with the theater. A drama critic is constantly exposed to the theater, and I fear some of them do develop an interest in it. Well, not Mortimer. You need have no fear of that. Why, Mortimer hates the theater. Really? Oh, yes, he writes awful things about the theater. But you can't blame him, poor boy. He was so happy writing about real estate, which he really knew something about. And then they just made him take this terrible night position. My, my. But as he says, the theater can't last much longer anyway. And in the meantime, it's a living. Oh, now, who do you suppose that is? I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, hello, Miss Brewster. How are you, Officer Brophy? Come in. Thank you. Oh, Afternoon, sir. Sir, what news have you brought me? Uh, Colonel, I have nothing to report. Splendid. Thank you, sir. At ease. Yep. We've uh, come for the Christmas toys, Miss Brewster. That's a splendid job you men do fixing toys for the children. Yeah, well, it gives us something to do when we sit around the station. You get tired playing cards. Then you start cleaning your gun, and the first thing you know, you've shot yourself in the foot. Uh, Teddy, dear, go upstairs and get that big box from your Aunt Martha's room. Delighted. That's right, dear. Up the stairs. How is Mrs. Brophy today? Pneumonia. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Ah! Oh, she's much better now. Um, A little weak still. Well, I'm going to tell Sister Martha, and she'll bring you over some beef broth for her. And I'll be right back. Oh, don't bother, Miss Abby. You've done so much for her already. Ah! Uh Oh, hey, Colonel. You promised not to do that. But I have to call a cabinet meeting to get the release of those supplies. Uh, He used to do that in the middle of the night. The neighbors complain about him. Oh, he's quite harmless. Oh, sure, sure. I suppose he does think he's Teddy Roosevelt. There's a shame a nice family like this hatching a cuckoo. The grandfather made a million dollars. Uh, patent medicine. Well, Officer Brophy and Dr. Harper... How nice. Oh, uh, hello, Miss Martha. I uh, I come to get the Christmas toys. Oh, yes. Teddy's Army and Navy. They wear out. Oh, you're back, Martha. Uh, how is poor Mr. Benitsky? Well, dear, it's it's pretty serious, I'm afraid. Uh, the doctor was there. He's going to amputate in the morning. Can we be present? No, dear, I asked him. But he said it's against the rules of the hospital or or something. Oh, oh here's Teddy with the Army and Navy. Oh, thanks, Colonel. This will make a lot of kids happy. What's this? What's this? What's this? The USS Oregon? Oh, no, Teddy, dear. Put it back. But the Oregon goes to Australia. Uh, thank you again, ma'am. Pinch, pinch. Yes, sir, Colonel. Dismiss? Yes, sir. I shall retire to field headquarters. The blockhouse. The stairs are over San Juan Hill. Uh, have you ever tried to persuade him he wasn't Teddy Roosevelt? Oh, no. Oh, he's so happy being Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, once a long time ago, remember, Martha, we thought if, we, if he could be George Washington, it might be a change for him. But he stayed under his bed for days and just wouldn't be anybody. And we'd so much rather he'd be Mr. Roosevelt than nobody. Well, if he's happy... <clears throat> 
I'd better be running along. Give our love to Elaine. And Dr. Harper, please don't think too harshly of Mortimer because he's a dramatic critic. Somebody has to do these things. Uh, goodbye. Did you just have tea? Isn't it rather late? Yes. And dinner's going to be late, too. So? Why, Teddy? Yes, Aunt Abby? Good news for you. You're going to Panama and dig another lock for the canal. Delighted. That's bully. Just bully. I shall prepare at once for the journey. Oh. Abby, you mean... Yes, dear? While I was out? Yes, dear. I just couldn't wait for you. I didn't know when you'd be back and Dr. Harper was coming. But, dear, all by yourself. I'll run right downstairs and see. Oh, no, no, there wasn't time. Then where did you... Martha, look in the window seat. The window seat? Mm. Go ahead, dear. Lift the lid. Oh, Abby. Abby! Isn't it just too delightful? And to think you managed it all by yourself. <laughs> Almost home, Elaine. Now make up your mind. Where do you want to go for dinner? No, I don't care, Mortimer, really. Well, suppose we wait till after the show. Well, that'll make it pretty late, won't it? Not with a little stinker we're seeing tonight. Well, I was hoping it'd be a musical. They seem to have a humanizing effect on you, darling. After a serious play, we joined the proletariat in the subway, and I listened to that lecture on the drama. It wasn't until we saw a musical that you took me home in a taxi, and, uh... Notice my legs. Elaine, uh, where could we be married in a hurry, say, uh, tonight? <laughs> now, I'm afraid Father will insist on officiating. Now, I'll bet your father could make even the marriage service sound pedestrian. Are you by any chance writing a review of it? <laughs> Sorry, darling. Occupational disease. <laughs> yeah, here we are. The Bruce Dimension. <sighs> Thanks, darling. Is that Teddy at the door? Yes. Well, what's he doing in shorts and a sun helmet? Hello, Mortimer. How are you, Mr. President? Bully, thank you. Just bully. What uh, news have you brought me? Just this. Mr. President, the country is squarely behind you. Yes, I know. Isn't it wonderful? Well, goodbye. Where are you off to, Teddy? Panama. Well... Uh, Panama's the cellar. He digs locks for the canal down there. Oh. You're very sweet with him. Uh, Teddy always was my favorite brother. Favorite? With him more of you? There's another brother, Jonathan. We don't talk about him. He left Brooklyn very early, by request. Jonathan was the kind of boy who liked to cut worms in two with his teeth. What became of him? I don't know. He wanted to become a surgeon like Grandfather, but he wouldn't go to medical school first, and his practice got him into trouble. Oh. Well... Goodbye, darling. I'll uh, run over and say goodnight to Father. Before I go out with you, he likes to pray over me a little. Mm -hmm. I'll be right back. I'll cut across the cemetery. Hello, Mortimer. Oh, hello, Aunt Abby. Uh, did you see my chapter on Thoreau? I want to show it to Elaine. No, I haven't seen it, dear. We thought you'd like a little something before you leave. Martha's getting a piece of the Lady Baltimore cake. Dr. Harper was here to tea. He's uh, concerned about Elaine going to the theater so much. <laughs> He'd love tonight's horror, Murder Will Out. Oh, dear. Well, I think I'll open a bottle of wine. It'll be nice with the cake. Yeah, I can see it all now. The same old thing. When the curtain goes up... Uh, where is that chapter? Uh, the first thing you will see, uh, maybe in the window seat, uh, will be a dead body. Uh, sure, just like this one. A, a dead... A dead body. A dead body. There is a happy land far, far away. Lady Baltimore cake is so nice with a little wine, don't you think, dear? Uh, Aunt Martha uh, and Abby. Hmm? Yes, dear? You, um, you told me you were going to make plans for Teddy to go to that uh, uh, sanitarium, Happy Dale. Yes, dear, it's all arranged. Teddy has to sign the paper. Uh, he's got to sign them right away. Well, you've got to know sometime. I'm frightfully sorry, but I I've got some shocking news for you. 
Teddy's killed a man. Nonsense, dear. There, there, there's a body in that window seat. Yes, dear, we know. Oh, well, you... Did you know? Now, uh, Mortimer, just forget about it. Forget you ever saw the gentleman. Forget? We never dreamed you'd peek. But, but who is he? His name is Hoskins, Adam Hoskins. That's really all I know about him, except that he's a Methodist. Well, what's he doing here? What happened to him? He died. Uh, Martha, men don't just get into window seats and die. No, he died first. Well, how? Oh, Mortimer, don't be so inquisitive. The gentleman died because he drank some wine with poison in it. How did the poison get in the wine? Well, uh, we put it in the wine because it's less noticeable. When it's in tea, it has a distinct odor. You put it in the wine? Yes. And I put Mr. Hoskins in the window seat because Dr. Harper was coming. Oh, so you knew what you'd done. You didn't want Dr. Harper to see the body. Well, not at tea. That wouldn't have been very nice. Now you know the whole thing, Mortimer, just forget about it. I do think Martha and I have the right to our own little secrets. Butter plate, Martha, butter plate. Yes, of course, dear. Oh, oh, Abby, while I was out, I dropped in on Mrs. Schultz. She's much better. Yes, and uh, she would like us to take Junior to the movies again. Well, we must do that tomorrow or the next day. Yes, but this time we'll go where we want to go. Junior's not going to drag me into another one of those... Carry pictures. Uh, Aunt Martha, Aunt Abby, wh what are we going to do? What are we going to do about what, dear? There's a body in that window seat. Yes, Mr. Hoskins. Well, good heavens, I can't turn you over to the police. What am I going to do? Well, for one thing, dear, stop being so excited. And for pity's sake, stop worrying. We told you to forget the whole thing. Forget? My dear Aunt Abby, can't I make you realize that something has to be done? Now, Mortimer, you behave yourself. You're too old to be flying off the handle like this. But you can't leave him there. We don't intend to, dear. No, Teddy's down in the cellar digging the rock. You you mean you're going to bury Mr. Hotchkiss in, in the cellar? Hoskins, dear. Oh, yes, dear. Of course, that's what we did with the others. Oh, no, no, no. You can't bury Miss... Others. The other gentlemen. When you say other... Do, do you mean others? I... I, I... More than one others? Oh, yes, dear. Let me see. This is um, 11, isn't it, Abby? No, dear. This makes 12. Oh, I think you're wrong, Abby. This is only 11. No, dear, because I remember when Mr. Hoskins first came in, it occurred to me that he would make just an even dozen. Well, you really shouldn't count the first one, dear. Oh, well, I was. I was counting the first one. So that makes it 12. Now, hello. Uh, oh. Hello? Al? Oh, my, it's good to hear your voice. Twelve. Eleven. Shh, shh, shh. Al? Oh, uh, checking up. Well, I know I didn't pick, uh, pick up the tickets. Yeah, I'm glad you called. Now, uh, get a hold of George right away. He's got to review the play for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll explain later. Now, now, let's see. Where were we? Twelve? Yes. Addie thinks we ought to count the first one, and that makes it twelve. Well, all right, now, all right. Who was the first one? Mr. Midgley. He was a Baptist. He came here looking for a room. He was such a lonely old man. All his kith and kin were dead, and it left him so forlorn and unhappy. And we felt so sorry for him. And then when his heart attack came, and he sat in that chair looking so peaceful, Remember, Martha? Mm -hmm. We made up our minds then and there that if we could help other lonely old men to the same peace, we would. He dropped dead right in that chair? Oh, how awful for you. Oh, no, dear. Why, it was rather like old times. Your grandfather always used to have a cadaver or two around the place. Well, I know, but... You, uh, you see, Teddy had been digging in Panama, and he thought Mr. Midgley was a yellow fever victim. That meant he had to be buried immediately. So we all took him down to Panama and put him in the lock. And that's how it started? Of course, we realized we couldn't depend on that happening again, so... Uh, you remember those jars of poison that have been up on the shelves in Grandfather's laboratory all these years? You know your Aunt Martha's knack for mixing things. You've eaten enough of her piccalilli. <laughs> <laughs> well, dear, for a gallon of elderberry wine, I take one teaspoonful of arsenic, then add half a teaspoonful of strychnine, and then just... A pinch of cyanide. Should have quite a 
kick? Yes, as a matter of fact, one of our gentlemen found time to say, how delicious. Yes, he did. Oh, well, well, we'd have to get things started in the kitchen for supper. I wish you could stay, Mortimer. I'm trying out a new recipe. I couldn't eat a thing. Hello, darling. I keep you waiting. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's you. Uh, You run along home, Elaine. I'll call you up tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, you know, I always call you every day or two. Uh, Well, we're going to the theater tonight. Oh, no, no, we're not. Uh, Elaine, uh, something has come up. Now, uh, now you run along home. What's happened? If we're going to be married. Married? Have you forgotten that not 15 minutes ago you proposed to me? I did. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, well, as far as I know, that's still on. Now, now you run along home. Uh, Listen, you can't propose to me one minute and throw me out of the house the next. Well, I'm not throwing you out of the house, darling. Uh, Will you get out of here? Of course. Uh, Now, you get out, and I'll I'll call you in a few days. Mortimer, you... Mortimer! Phew. Hello, Al. What? Uh, George is in Bermuda. Oh, well, get somebody. Uh, Get the office boy. Uh, You know, the bright one, the one we don't like. All right, then. Get the printer. He knows what I write. A third machine from the left. Yeah, but Al, he might turn out to be another John Chapman. Yeah, all right. All right. Was that Elaine, dear? And Mother. Aunt Abby. Uh, sit down. But Mortimer. Uh, sit down. There. Well, dear? You can't do things like that. Now, I don't know how to explain this to you, but it's not only against the law. It's wrong. It's not a nice thing to do. People wouldn't understand. Abby, we shouldn't have told Mortimer. Well, what I mean is, well, well, this has developed into a a very bad habit. Now, Mortimer, we don't try to stop you from doing things you like to do. I don't see why you should interfere with us. Uh, Hello, Al. Oh, all right. Well, all right, I'll see the first act and tear it to pieces. All right. Now, look, I've got to go to the theater, but before I go, will you promise me something? Well, we'd have to know what it was first. Will will you do this for me? What do you want us to do? Don't do anything. I mean, don't do anything. Don't let anyone in this house and leave Mr. Hoskins right where he is. Why? We were planning on holding services before dinner. Services? Certainly. You don't think we'd bury Mr. Hoskins without a full Methodist service, do you? Why, he was a Methodist. Well, can't that wait till I get back? Oh, then you could join us. Oh, you'll enjoy the service, especially the hymns. Remember, Martha, how beautifully Mortimer used to sing in the choir before his voice changed? And remember, you're not going to let anyone in this house while I'm gone. Uh, Have you got some paper? Uh, Here's some stationery. Will this do? Oh, that'll be fine. I can save time if I write my review on the way to the theater. Come in, Doctor. I'm right behind you, Johnny. Well, this is the home of my youth. As a boy, I couldn't wait to escape from this place. Now I'm glad to escape back into it. Yeah, Johnny, it's a fine hideout. The family must still live here. There's something so unmistakably Brewster about the Brewsters. I hope there's a fatted calf awaiting the return of the prodigal. Yeah, I'm hungry. Oh, look, Johnny, a drink. <laughs> Elderberry wine. A good omen. Here's to you, Johnny. Who's that? Who's that? Who are you? What are you doing here? Why, Aunt Abby, Aunt Martha. It's Jonathan. You get out of here. But I'm Jonathan, your nephew, Jonathan. Oh, no, you're not. You're nothing like Jonathan, so don't pretend you are. You just get out of here. But, Aunt Abby, I am Jonathan, and this is Dr. Einstein. And he's not Dr. Einstein, either. Not Dr. Albert Einstein, Dr. Herman Einstein. His voice is like Jonathan's. Have you 
been in an accident? No. My face. Dr. Einstein is responsible for that. He changes people's faces. Abby. Abby, I've seen that face before. Oh, do you remember when we took the little Schultz boy to the movies and I was so frightened? It was that face. Oh, Martha. Oh, easy, Johnny, easy. <laughs> now, no, don't worry, ladies. The last five years, I give Johnny three new faces. His last one, well, I, I saw that picture too, just before I operate, and <laughs> I, I was intoxicated. You see, Doctor? You see what you've done to me? Even my own family. Johnny, Johnny, you're home. These are your lovely aunts. They know you. <laughs> well, Jonathan, it's been a long time. Um, where have you been all these years? Oh, England, South Africa, Australia... And the last five years, Chicago. <laughs> Dr. Einstein and I were in business there together. Oh, we were in Chicago for the World's Fair. Yes, we found Chicago awfully warm. Yeah, it got hot for us, too. Oh, well, it's wonderful to be in Brooklyn again. And you, Abby, Martha, you don't look a day older, just as I remembered you. Sweet, charming, hospitable... And dear Teddy, I remember him so high. And did he get into politics? You know, Doctor, my little brother was determined to become president. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Jonathan, it's very nice to have seen you again. Bless you, Aunt Martha. It's good to be home again. Well, Martha, we mustn't let what's on the stove boil over. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. If you'll excuse us, Jonathan, unless you're in a hurry to go somewhere. Martha! Oh, yes, I'm coming, Abby. Well, Johnny, where do we go from here? The police have pictures of that face. I got to operate on you right away. We got to find some place for Mr. Spinalzo, too. Don't waste any worry on that rat. But, Johnny, we got a hot stiff on our hands. You can't leave a dead body in a rumble seat. We shouldn't have killed him, Johnny. He was a nice fellow. He gives us a lift. And what happens? He said I looked like Boris Karloff. That's your work, Doctor. You did that to me. Now, no, Johnny, we, we find a place somewhere. I, I fix you up, Chris. Tonight. Now, Johnny, I, I got to eat first. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm weak. Jonathan, we are, we're glad you remembered us and took the trouble to come in and say hello. But um, you, you were never happy in this house, and we were never happy while you were in it. So we've uh, just come in to say goodbye. But, Aunt Abby, I promised Dr. Einstein that if ever we came to Brooklyn... I'd bring him here for for one of Aunt Martha's home-cooked dinners. Yeah. I'm uh, sorry. I'm afraid there wouldn't be enough. Oh, Abby, it's a pretty good size, pot roast. Pot roast? I think the least we can Thank do is... Thank you, Aunt Martha. We'll stay to dinner. Uh-huh. Well, we'll, uh, we'll hurry it along. And, uh, Jonathan, if you want to freshen up, why don't you use the washroom in Grandfather's old laboratory? Huh? Is that still there? Oh, yes. Uh, come along, Martha. We're all in a hurry. <coughs> well, we get a meal anyway. Grandfather's laboratory. Hmm? Doctor, a perfect operating room. Oh, too bad we can't use it. Oh, I'll handle this. Why, this house will be our headquarters for years. You mean it? Oh, that would be beautiful, Johnny. This nice, quiet house. And those aunts of yours, what sweet ladies. I love them already. I get the bags from the car. Doctor, we must wait till we're invited. And if they say no... Doctor, two helpless old ladies. Oh, <laughs> oh it all comes to a beautiful dream. It's so peaceful. That's what makes this house so perfect for us. It's so peaceful. <laughs> Richard Lockridge, co-author of Mr. and Mrs. North, took a sporting view of arsenic and old lace on that January 1st night in 1941. His own play was to open two nights later. But here he was, the drama critic of the New York Sun, 
bound to report truthfully on what he thought about arsenic. Lockridge wrote, It is a noisy, preposterous, incoherent joy. You wouldn't believe that homicidal mania could be such great fun. This was gallant of him, and accurate, too. Now our second act of Arsenic and Old Lace begins. Martha, you haven't lost any of your skill. Why, thank you, Jonathan. And now I know you and Dr. Einstein both want to get where, where you're going. But, my dear aunts, I'm so full of that delicious dinner, I just can't move a muscle. Yeah, it's so nice here. <laughs> well, after all, it's, it's very late. I found it. I found it. Did you lose something, Teddy? I found it. The story of my life, my biography. You see, here we are, both of us. President Roosevelt and General Gothels at Culebra Cut. That's me, General, and that is you. My, how I've changed. Well, you see, that picture hasn't been taken yet. We haven't even started work on the Culebra Cut. General, we will both go to Panama now to inspect the locks. Uh, no, Teddy, not to Panama. Yeah, Panama's a long way off. Nonsense! It's just down on the cellar. The cellar? Yes, we let him dig <laughs> the Panama Canal in the cellar. General, as President of the United States, I demand that we inspect the locks immediately. Teddy, I think it's time you went to bed. I beg your pardon? Who are you? I'm Woodrow Wilson. Go to bed. No, you're not Wilson. But your face is familiar. Let me see. Yeah. Perhaps I meet you later on my hunting trip to Africa. Yes, yes. You look like someone I might meet in the jungle. Teddy? It's your brother, Jonathan, dear. He's had his face changed. Oh, so that's it. A nature figure. And uh, perhaps you had better go to bed, Teddy. Jonathan and his friend have to go to their hotel. General Gotels, inspect the canal. But Jonathan... Inspect the canal. All right, Mr. President. We go to Panama. Bully. Bully. Follow me, General. Oop. I have to wear a sun helmet. It's down south, you know. Of course. Well, boy, I... Ah, uh, there be... I must correct your misapprehension. We have no hotel. We came directly here. This is my home. But, Jonathan, you can't stay here. Aunt Abby, you have a most distinguished guest in Dr. Einstein. I'm afraid you don't appreciate his skill. <laughs> in a few weeks, you'll see me looking like a very different Jonathan. Oh, but he can't operate on you here. Ah, I forgot to tell you. We are turning Grandfather's laboratory into an operating room. We expect to be quite busy. Hey, hey, shutting down in this head. Dr. Think... Einstein, my dear aunts have invited us to live with them. Oh, you fixed it. Well, you're sleeping here tonight. Aunt Abby, please get our room ready. But... Now. Well, come along, Martha, dear. Johnny, when I go down in the cellar, what do you think I find? What? The Panama Canal. Ah, the Panama Canal. It's a hole, Teddy Doug, six feet long and four feet wide. Down there? And it just fits Mr. Spinaldo. Oh, 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 rather a good joke on my aunts. <laughs> They're living in a house with a body buried in the cellar. <laughs> Come on, we'll bring it in through the window. <laughs> Poor dear Mr. Hoskins, he's been so patient in the window seat. I think Teddy had better get Mr. Hoskins downstairs right away. Abby, I will not invite Jonathan to the funeral services. Oh, no, we'll wait until they've gone to bed and then come down and hold the services. The general was very pleased. He says the canal is just the right size. He says that... Teddy, uh, Teddy, there's been another yellow fever victim. Oh, dear me. This will be a shock to the general. But I'll have to tell him. Army regulations, you know. Uh, no, Teddy, we must keep it a secret. Yes. A state secret? Yes, a state secret. Promise? You have the word of the President of the United States. Cross my heart and hope to die. Now, Teddy, you must take the poor man down to the canal. And we'll come down later and hold services. You may announce that the President will say a few words. Where is the poor devil? 
He's in the window seat. Oh, seems to be spreading. We've never had yellow fever there before. Ah, well, up we go. He died for his country. Open the cellar door, Aunt Abby. <laughs> Honey, are you out there? Wait. I'll lift up Mr. Spinal's house. Wait, I can't see good, Johnny. It's so dark. Oh, yes. uh, what happened? Someone left the window seat off and I fell in. Well, get out. And take Mr. Spinal's home. Uh, oops. I, I lost the leg. What's that? Here. Johnny, somebody's coming. Get him in the window seat. Quick. All right, all right. Give me a hand in through the here, window. Here, here. Are you in? Yes. Miss Abby? Miss Martha? Miss Abby, it's so dark in here. <gasps> Who are you? Elaine Harper. I li- live next door. Turn on the lights, Doctor. Yeah. Oh, who are you? Where are Miss Abby and Miss Martha? Perhaps we'd better introduce ourselves. This is Dr. Einstein. Dr. Einstein, I... I suppose you're going to tell me you're Boris. I'm Paul. Jonathan Brewster. Oh, you're Jonathan? Oh, you've heard of me. <laughs> Just this afternoon. Well, I'd be running along oh, home no, now. I, I think she's dangerous. She's seen us. They really let her go, Jimmy. She saw us. Remember that. Stay away from me. Take your hands off me. Oh, Teddy. It's going to be a private funeral. Teddy, tell these men who I am. Please. What? That's my daughter, Alice. Oh, no. Ah! Oh, your Daddy. handkerchief. Oh, help. Get it out of the cellar, Get quick. This way, come, please. Yes, what's going on down there? What are you doing? We caught a burglar, a sneak thief. Go back to your room. Look out, Charlie. She got away. Oh, let go of me. Elaine. Mortimer, where have you been? At the Henry Miller Theater. Well, who's this? This is your brother, Jonathan. And this is Dr. Einstein. Well, I know this isn't a nightmare, but what is it? I've come back home, Mortimer. Jonathan? Jonathan? You always were a horror, but you have to look like one? Mortimer, have you forgotten the things I used to do to you when we were boys? Remember the times you were tied to the bedpost, to the needles, under your fingernails? It is, Jonathan. Oh, I remember. I remember you as the most vicious, venomous form of animal life I ever knew. Now, don't you boys start quarreling again the minute you've seen each other. Jonathan, you're not wanted here. Now, get out. Well, I'm sleeping here tonight in your room. Uh, John, here, maybe we better sleep down here, hmm? On the window seat. Window seat? Window seat? Yeah, the window seat. Oh, the window seat. Well, uh, maybe I'd better sleep down here. Oh, we wouldn't trouble you. We insist on sleeping down here. Doctor, we'll go up and get our bags. You can have the room in a moment, Mortimer. Mortimer. Well, what's the matter with you, dear? I have almost been killed. You've almost been... Abby. Martha. Oh, no. It was Jonathan. He mistook her for a sneak thief. Uh, would you like some coffee, dear? Oh, great idea. Coffee, sandwiches. I haven't had any dinner. Well, we'll get it ready. Come, Abby. Uh, no wine. No, no, dear. I'm sorry, I'm so late, Elaine, but it's after 12, and I... 12? Elaine, you've got to go home. What? Mortimer, I want to know where I stand. Do you love me? I love you very much, Elaine. I I love you so much, I I can't marry you. Have you suddenly gone crazy? Oh, I don't think so, but it's just a matter of time. You see, insanity runs in my family. It it practically gallops. Now, just because Teddy is a No, 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 it goes way back. The first Brewster, the one who came over on the Mayflower. You know, in those days, the Indians used to scalp the settlers. He used to scalp the Indians. Well, but darling, this doesn't prove you're crazy. Well, look at your aunt. They're Brewsters, aren't they? And the sanest, sweetest people I've ever known. Well, even they have their peculiarities. Mortimer, you're not even looking at me. Come away from that window seat. Yeah, right away, Elaine. Uh, uh, oh, another one. Uh, Elaine, you've got to go. Something very important has just come up. Up from where? We're here alone together. Elaine, if you love me, will you get the devil out of here? Uh, Mortimer. Will you kiss me good night? Why, of course, darling. Quickly. Oh. Mm. 
Well, good night, dear. I, I'll call you in a day or two. Oh, you, you, the critic. And Martha, Aunt Abby, come in here. Yes, dear. What is it? Oh, where's Elaine? You promised me. Who is that in the window seat? No one, dear. Look. And it is not Mr. Hoskins. Well, who can that be? Are you trying to tell me you've never seen that man before? I certainly am. Now, Aunt Abby, don't try to get out of this. That's another of your gentlemen. Mortimer, how can you say such a thing? That man is an imposter. And if he came here to be buried in our cellar, he's mistaken. But, Aunt Abby, you put Mr. Hoskins in the window seat. Now, this man couldn't have just gotten the idea from him. By the way, where's Mr. Hoskins? In Panama, waiting for the services, poor dear. We haven't had a minute with Jonathan in the house. Oh, dear, we always wanted to have a double funeral, but... But I will not read services over a total stranger. A stranger? Aunt Abby, how can I believe you? There are 12 men down in the cellar, and you admit you poisoned them. Yes, I did. But you don't think I'd stoop to telling a fib. <laughs> Jonathan, I want a word with you. Aunt Abby, Aunt Martha, I think Jonathan is leaving at once. Oh, no, Martha. Oh, yes, and you're taking your cold companion with you from the window seat. The window seat? You're my brother, and I'm going to give you a chance to get away. And if you don't take it, I'm going to call the police. Mortimer, remember, what happened to Mr. Spinalzo can happen to you, too. Oh, dear. Come in. Why, Officer Brophy. Oh, hello, Miss Martha, Miss Abby. I... I saw your lights on, and I thought there might be sickness in the family. Oh, come in. Come in, officer. This is my brother, Jonathan. Oh, hat. Hey, he looks familiar. Ain't I seen him somewhere? I don't think so. Yeah, it's too bad Jonathan can't stay, isn't he? Well, uh, if everything's all right... Oh, uh, don't, don't, don't go, officer. Stay and have some, have some coffee and a sandwich. Well, if you say so. Yeah, we'll all go into the kitchen while Jonathan collects his things. All his things. Come along, officer. Yeah, sure. Say, Mr. Brewster, I've been meaning to ask you about a play I've been writing. Doctor, this affair between my brother and me has got to be settled. Now, Johnny... We're going to sleep right here tonight. With a cop in the kitchen and Mr. Spinalzo in the window seat? That's all he's got on us. So we take Mr. Spinalzo down and we dump him in the bay and come right back here. Hide the suitcases in the cellar. Go on. I think we should get out, Johnny. Johnny, come quick. What is it? That hole in the cellar. We got an ace in the hole. Still here, Jonathan? I, I thought I told you. We're that... staying. You think I was bluffing? You think I won't tell Officer Brophy what's in the window seat? Officer Brophy. If you tell Brophy what's in the window seat, I'll tell him what's in the cellar. The cellar? There's an elderly gentleman down there who seems to be very dead. Well, what were you doing in the cellar? Ah, what's he doing in the cellar? No, thank you, ma'am. That, that's all the coffee I can drink. Oh, oh Mr. Brewster, uh, I'd like to tell you the plot of that, that play. Uh, no, no, Brophy, no, you can't stay here. You've got to go and call in the yeah, precinct. Yeah, but I, I want to tell you about this here play. Yeah, well, we'll talk about it later. Yeah, yeah, all right. later. How about the back room at Kelly's? Fine, fine. I'll meet you at Kelly's later. Great, Mr. Brewster. I'll be there. Unless I drop dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is that you, Mortimer? It's Jonathan, Aunt Abby. Mortimer went out. Where are you going? To Panama to bury Mr. Spinalzo. But he can't stay in our cellar. Well, there's a friend of Mortimer's downstairs waiting for him. He and Mr. Spinalzo will get along fine together. They're both dead. They must be Mr. Hoskins. You, you know about what's downstairs? Of course we do, and he's no friend of Mortimer's. He's one of our gentlemen. Your gentleman? Besides, there's no room for Mr. Spinalzo. The cellar's crowded already. Crowded? With what? There are twelve graves down there now. Twelve graves? And that leaves very little room, and we're going to need you, it. 
You mean you and Aunt Martha have murdered... Murdered? Certainly not. It's one of our charities. So you just take your Mr. Spinalzo out of there. You've done that here in this house and, and you buried them down there? Johnny, we've been chased all over the world. They stay right here in Brooklyn and do just as good as you do. What? You got 12... And they've got 12. I've got 13. No, Johnny, 12. 13? There's Mr. Spinal. Yeah. Then the first one in London, two in Johannesburg, one in Sydney, one in Melbourne, two in San Francisco, one in Phoenix. Phoenix? The filling station. Oh, yeah. The three in Chicago and the one in South Bend. That makes 13. But you can't count the one in South Bend. He died of pneumonia. He wouldn't have got pneumonia if I hadn't shot him. No, Johnny, you got 12 and they've got 12. The old ladies are just as good as you are. Oh, they are, are they? Well, that's easily taken care of. All I need is one more, that's all. Just one more. Now, well, here I am. Where have you been? Yeah, I've been over getting a doctor's signature on Teddy's papers. Mortimer, what is the matter with you? Running around getting papers signed at a time like this. Do you know what Jonathan is doing down there? He's putting Mr. Hoskins and Mr. Spinalzo in together. Oh, well, let him. Is Teddy in his room? Teddy won't be any help. Well, you had to go and tell Jonathan about those 12 graves. If I can make Teddy responsible for those, I can protect you, don't you see? No, I don't see, and we pay taxes to have the police protect us. We'll call them. Oh, but you can't. They'll find out about Mr. Hoskins and the other 12 gentlemen. Mortimer, I don't think the police would pry into our private affairs if we asked them not to. No, no, you, you can't do this. I won't let you. Well, if Jonathan and Mr. Spinalzo are not out of this house by morning, we're going to call the police. There. It's all done, Johnny. Mr. Hoskins and Mr. Spinals are all put away, neat and tidy. We're all done. You're forgetting, Doctor. My brother, Mortimer. No, no, Johnny, no. Tonight, and the way we do that tomorrow, or the next day. Oh, tonight, no, now. Johnny, please, I, I'm tired. Tomorrow I've got to operate. Uh, uh, tonight we go to bed, huh? Doctor, it's going to be done tonight. Uh, Johnny, I know that look. Okay, but uh, the quick way, huh? The, the quick twist, like in London. No, Doctor, this calls for something special. I think perhaps... The Melbourne method. Johnny, no, not that. Two hours. And when it was all over, the fellow in London was just as dead as the fellow in Melbourne. Get your instrument. No, Johnny. Get them. We operate tonight, Doctor, on Brother Mortimer. <laughs> Mortimer, hand me my bugle. Uh, no, Mr. President, just sign these papers. I cannot sign any proclamation without consulting my cabinet. Uh, but this must be a secret. A secret proclamation? How unusual. Uh, Japan oh, mustn't know until it's signed. Oh, Japan, eh? I'll sign it right away. I'll take it into the closet. A secret proclamation has to be signed. A secret. But at once, Mr. President. I'll have to put on my signing clothes. The interview is at an end. Thank you, Mr. President. Sign it right away to... Oh, no! Close the door, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> now, won't you sit down, Mortimer? Don't oh, chew on the handkerchief. It's imported lace. <laughs> Doctor, the curtain call. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mortimer, I've been away for 20 years, but every night I've dreamed of you. In London, I dreamed of you, and in Melbourne, I... There. Uh, tight and neat. Now, Doctor, your instrument. We go to work. Ah, please, Johnny, for me the quick way. All ready for you, Doctor. <laughs> nah, I gotta have a drink. I can't do this without a drink. That wine, remember, this afternoon. Where did the old lady put... Oh, here. 
Elderberry wine, I split it with you. We both need a drink. Very well, Doctor. We'll drink to Mortimer. <laughs> to my dear dead brother. Captain <laughs> meeting on the double. That idiot. He goes next. No, not Teddy. That's where I stop. I draw the line at Teddy. Now we've got to work fast. Yeah, I had the quick way. Yes, Doctor, me. one quick twist of the silk handkerchief. Hey, what? Hey, um, hey, the colonel's got to stop blowing that horn. It's all right, officer. You're taking the bugle away from him. We promised the neighbors he wouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> oh, hey, Mr. Brewster. Why are you all tied up? He, he, he was explaining the play he saw tonight. That's what happened to the fella in the play. Oh, yeah? Gee, they practically stole that from the second act of my play. I'll tell you <laughs> No, no, wait a minute. I'm going to leave you this way. This time, Mr. Brewster, you listen to the plot. Well, it starts... It starts in my mother's dressing room where I was born. Only I ain't born yet. Now, now then, we, we get back to my mother. There she is, lying unconscious in her lingerie. The fiend is standing over her with an axe. There. How do you like it so far, huh, Doctor? Well, it put Johnny to sleep. Oh, that's just the second act. Now the third act. Johnny, Johnny, wake up. Oh, I can't wake him. What's going on? Johnny, Johnny, it's cop, it's cop. Brophy. Oh, hi, Lieutenant. Uh, this is Mortimer Brewster. He, he's going to help me write me play. Did you have to tie him up to make him listen? The whole precinct is out looking for you. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. Give me the phone and untie him. Oh, gee, Mr. Brewster, I'll have to run through the third act quick. Hello, Captain. Brophy's here. You don't have to worry. Hmm? Yeah, we found him in the Brewster uh, house, so you can call off the big manhunt. Uh, you want us to bring him in? Manhunt? Oh, so I've been turned in, huh? Oh, no, buddy, you got us wrong. I suppose you and that stool pigeon brother of mine will split the reward. Reward? Grab him, Brophy. <laughs> you stay still, Mac. Now I'll do some turning in. There are 13 bodies buried in our cellar. Oh, uh, yeah? I'll show you. You come on down to the cellar with me. 13 bodies. Maybe you better go down, Joe. Uh, with him? Not me. He looks like Boris Carl. Ah! Oh, get him off me, Rooney. Help him. Uh, help him. Uh, get your head out of the way. Uh, oh. Well, what do you know about that? Imagine him claiming there was 13 bodies buried in the cellar. Ah! Yeah. Get him out of here. Well, I'll have to drag him by the feet. We'll take him into the kitchen. What a story. <laughs> thirteen bodies buried in the cellar. Sir, there are thirteen bodies buried in the cellar. Who are you? I'm President Roosevelt. What is this? He's the one that blows the bugle. Oh, dear, dear me. Brother Jonathan, the yellow fever victim. No, no, Colonel, he's a spy. We caught in the White House. Well, will you get him out of here? Now, you. <laughs> Didn't anybody untie you yet? Here, I'll do it. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> now, Lieutenant, listen to me. That crazy brother of yours has got to be put away. We don't want no more bugles blowing. Oh, yes, yes, I know. I have the papers right here. Uh, Teddy's going to Happy Dale. Now, about those 13 bodies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you imagine what would happen if that cockeyed story got around? And now he's starting a yellow fever scare. It's lucky I didn't fall for that story. <laughs> Thirteen bodies. I beg your pardon. I'm Mr. Weatherspoon of Happy Dale. I believe I'm to pick up a gentleman. Oh, uh, Teddy. Just finished my cabinet meeting. Yes, Mortimer. Uh, Mr. President, I have very good news for you. Your term of office is over. Oh, then I start on my hunting trip to Africa, don't I? Well, who's this? Trying to get into the White House before I've moved out? Who, Teddy? Taft! Oh, listen, me. this isn't Mr. Taft, Teddy. This is Mr. Witherspoon. He's your guide for Africa. Oh, bully, bully, bully. Glad to meet you, sir. Aunt Martha, Aunt Abby, I'm on my way to Africa. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, if the safari comes, tell them to wait. Aunt Abby, Aunt Martha, this is Mr. Witherspoon from Happy Dale. Uh, Teddy is going with him. No, he is not. 
Not while we're alive. The police want him to go. He, he blew his bugle again. That's right, ma'am. Well, if he goes, we're going with him. Yes, we won't be separated from Teddy. But we can't take sane people at Happydale. Look, will you settle this? There are still murders to be solved in Brooklyn. Yes. Oh, are there? Teddy's got to go. With the story he's telling, we'd have to dig up the cellar. He says there are 13 bodies buried down there. But there are 13 bodies buried in our cellar. I'll take your word for it, lady. I'm a busy man. How about it with a spoon? Well, they'd have to be committed. Well, Teddy committed himself. Can't they commit themselves? Can't they sign the papers? Certainly. Oh, well, then, if we can go with Teddy, we'll sign the papers. Where are they? Yes, where are they? Sign them up with a spoon. I want to get this cleaned up. Oh, my, we've overlooked one thing. Uh, we're going to need the signature of a doctor. A doctor? Oh, 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 yes, a doctor. Dr. Einstein. Uh, me, me. Uh, come over here. We'd like you to sign some papers. Uh, yes, please, I must go. No, just come right over here, doctor. <laughs> At one time last night, I thought doctor was going to operate on please, me. Please, <laughs> Yes, doctor, please. just come right over here. Sign right here, doctor. Uh, yes, very well. Uh, here. <laughs> there. Are you leaving us, doctor? Uh, I think I, I must go. Oh, aren't you going to wait for Jonathan? Uh, I don't think we're going to the same place. There, now. Everything's quite in order. Well, I'm almost relieved. I'm really looking forward to going. The neighborhood here has really run down, so... Well, Mortimer, we're all ready to go now. The house will be yours, and we want you to live in it. Oh, no, no, Aunt Abby. The, the house is too full of, of, of memories. Oh, dear, but you'll need a house when you're married. I'm afraid I can't ever marry Elaine or anybody. Oh, there's something else, Mortimer. You signed our papers as next of kin. Oh, of course, why not? But you see, dear, you're not really a Brewster. Not a Brewster? No, dear. Your mother was a widow when she came to us as a cook, and you were born about three months afterwards. But she was such a good cook that we didn't want to lose her, so brother married her. Uh, I'm not really a Brewster? Now, don't feel badly about it, dear. Oh, no. No. Oh, it's a tragedy, isn't it? Nobody knows who your father is. He might be anybody. You're right. You're right. Well, isn't it wonderful? He he might be anybody. I've got to tell Elaine. He might be anybody. All right, Jonathan, come on. I'm coming, Lieutenant. <laughs> Goodbye, aunties. So this house is seeing the last of the Brewsters. Well, I can't better my record now, but neither can you. At least I have that satisfaction. The score stands even. Twelve to twelve. Jonathan always was a mean boy. Never could stand to see anybody get ahead of him. I wish we could show him he isn't so smart. Well, ladies, perhaps we'd better be going. Um, Ma? Martha? Yes, Daddy? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Witherspoon, uh, does your family live with you at Happy Dale? I have no family. Oh, that must make it very lonely for you. Uh, I suppose it does. Uh, well, uh... Martha, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Witherspoon, I think at least we should offer you a glass of elderberry wine. Elderberry wine? If you grow your own elderberries? Uh, no, but the cemetery is full of them. Uh, well, uh, uh, you uh, don't see much elderberry wine nowadays. I thought I'd had my last glass of it. Oh, no. Here it is. Well, ladies, to a long life. You have just heard the Best Plays production of Arsenic and Old Lace, starring Boris Karloff and Donald Cook. Now, here again is your host, drama critic John Chapman. Joseph Kesselring never wrote a sequel to Arsenic and Old Lace, so we don't know what happened to Mr. Witherspoon. Perhaps someday the author will get around to it. 
In the meantime, we will have another best play for you next Sunday. It will be a rather strange and quite lovely piece, Dark of the Moon, which Howard Richardson and William Burney made from the old hillbilly folk song about Barbara Allen. Our star will be Alfred Drake. Let's all meet again next Sunday in the mountains called the Great Smokies. This is Chapman saying goodbye until then. Arsenic and Old Lace was transcribed and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Boris Karloff was Jonathan, Donald Cook was Mortimer. Evelyn Varden and Gina Dare appeared as Abby and Martha, Edgar Staley as Dr. Einstein, Wendell Holmes as Teddy Brewster, Joan Tompkins as Elaine, Arthur Maitland as Mr. Witherspoon, Ted Osborne as Reverend Harper, and Ed Latimer as Brophy. Best Plays is an NBC production, supervised by William Welch and directed by Edward King. This is Fred Collins speaking. Tonight, America's press conference. It's Meet the Press on NBC. At 6.30... KFI Los Angeles. Listen, a new Packard four door sedan costs just twenty nine twenty plus tax and license delivered right here in Southern California. Packard costs less for what you get than any other car. Up to thirty months to pay at Earl C. Anthony Incorporated, one thousand South Hope or ninety one thirty Wilshire Boulevard. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is Bela Lugosi, playing the part of Professor Antonio Basile, psychologist. The story is by J. Donald Wilson, who calls it The Doctor Prescribed Death. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. This series of tales is calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with the doctor prescribed death and Bela Lugosi's performance. We again hope to keep you in suspense. Professor Antonio Basile has a theory, but let him tell you about it. As a psychologist, I have worked out a theory. A theory I know to be sound. I contend that a person who has decided to kill himself can very easily be turned from this desire to the desire of taking the life of another. I can prove my theory. And if necessary, that is exactly what I will do. Yes, Professor Antonio Basile has a theory, but only a theory. And he's worried about what his publisher will say. So he visits the editor, whose name is Hellman. Hellman finishes the manuscript and tosses it on the desk. Professor Basile leans forward eagerly and... Well, Hellman, what do you think? Professor Basile, it's purely conjecture, simply a theory, and I wouldn't advise publishing it. I worked on that theory for a long time. I'm positive of it. I know it'll work. Suppose it will. What good is it? What good have you accomplished if you can prove it'll work? <laughs> Are you laughing at me, Hellman? It's so silly. An ordinary human being has suffered reverses. is sick of it all. He wants to leave it all behind. And you say he can be changed to want to kill someone else. I do. Self-destruction and the destruction of other life are closely related in the mind. The dividing line is very thin. It's ridiculous. And you won't publish it? Ranger would fire me. Why? He told me that, in his opinion, you should be in the asylum. 
Mr. Granger said that? Does he think I'm insane? <laughs> How do I know? <laughs> Hellman, Mr. Granger didn't say that. It's you who thinks I'm crazy. You've never liked me. For some reason, you are trying to tear me down. Well, we'll see, Mr. Hellman. We'll see. Now, wait a minute. I'll show you whether my works are illogical. I'll show you whether I'm insane. Oh, calm down. <laughs> I'm going to make you eat those words. I know you don't like me, but I'm going to prove that my theory is sound. Good night. Wait a minute. Basil, wait. You wait, Hellman. You wait. <laughs> Wait, Hellman. Wait. Professor Basile, seething with resentment, rushes from the office and strides angrily down the street. Insane, huh? I'll prove my theory. I'll find a subject. I'll find someone who wants to take his own life. And so Basile goes home, late for dinner. He finds a note from his wife, Myra, saying she's decided to attend the opera... And we'll be home around 11.30. Then Professor Basile gets an inspiration. He goes to the bridge over the deep canyon, the bridge called Suicide. And strangely enough, he hasn't long to wait. As he stands against the railing in the fog, a figure appears a few feet beyond, stops, prepares to leap. Don't do it! Wait a minute! Listen. Huh? That's very silly. Let Oh, me. Oh, no. I couldn't do that. I need you. I don't need you. Don't you know this is uh, against the law? You're not an officer. You can't stop me. It's 500 feet to those tracks below. Hard steel rails. And don't believe what they all tell you about not being conscious of what happened. You'd know. People don't die instantly. Let loose. They lie in agony for minutes and sometimes for an hour. It's a horrible death, I know. How do you know? I'm a doctor. Doctor? Yes. I can tell you much simpler ways, much less painful ways and quicker. You're a nice young girl, an intelligent girl. You wouldn't want it to happen this way. Maybe after I talk to you a while, you wouldn't want to do this at all. No? No. But come on, let's talk it over. Maybe a few minutes' talk will change the entire picture for you. What could you do to help me? If you'll come, I'll tell you. There's a motive back of your wanting to do this, and I'd like to know what it is. Nothing doing. Haven't you any relatives? Any loved ones you'd like to do something for? Yes. Then if you talk with me for a while... Maybe I can find my way clear to help those people. You sound crazy to me. Oh, no. All right, I'll... Where? My apartment. Let's go. Well, here we are. Come in, please. Well, what do you want to know? Now, sit down first. Are you hungry? No, I'm not that broke. It isn't pop. I knew that. I could tell by your clothes. Now, first, why did you come here? Why? Why, because you talked me into it. I <laughs> see. You're not afraid of me? Afraid? In my frame of mind. What could I lose? Suppose I told you that I really brought you here to kill you. Kill me? <laughs> you know, you're a very pretty girl, don't you? Yeah. That doesn't always mean so much. The right man, it might. That's what I thought. But I found out it didn't mean a thing. Ah. Then it was because of a man. I knew it. Really? How did you guess? I'm a student of psychology. I'm Professor Antonio Basile. I see. And you want to know what makes me tick? You want to know the reason behind my action tonight? That's right. I would like to know what happened to make you want to kill yourself. Suicide is a mental aberration. Yeah. I'd like to know what preceded the decision to destroy yourself. And what you thought about until the moment I stopped you on the bridge. What good will that do me? You said you weren't broke, but you also said 
You had some loved ones you'd like to do something for. I meant I wasn't broke to the point of being hungry. I have a few dollars. But you suggested help for someone in larger terms. Yes, I did. Who is the loved one? My mother. You are her only means of support? Yes. And you intend to kill yourself? Yes. That's being selfish, isn't it? Selfish? Yes. You are concentrating solely on self. You think so? What else? The first law of human nature is self-preservation, right? I suppose so. The second law is the preservation of family. Yeah. So you decide to deny the first law and destroy yourself. And as a consequence, deny the second and leave your mother alone and in need. You indicate a form of insanity. What would be normal? To destroy the other person. The one who has done you wrong. Have you hurt him? No. Then the one who has done wrong should be the one to suffer. You have no legal recourse? Legal recourse? No, I haven't. I'm sorry, say. And you would kill yourself to let your poor mother suffer because of the wrong of another. Why shouldn't he be the one to suffer? I suppose you're right. Why shouldn't he? What happened after all? Why not tell me about it? Were you married? No. I never seemed to find time to get a wrong marriage. What's your name? Gladys. Gladys Tanner. How long had you known him? Almost four years. And you always thought he meant to marry you? Yes. Until three weeks ago. Yes? On July 1st, he had to leave town for a week on business. He said he was going to Kansas City. When he came back, he seemed to be too busy to see me. Then a week ago, I found a snapshot along with several others in his desk in his home. May I see it? Certainly. It's a picture of him and another woman. But the picture was not taken in Kansas City. It was? No. It was taken on the beach at Atlantic City. And it's dated by the finisher, July 3rd. Since he returned, he's refused to see me. Yesterday, he finally said he didn't care to see me anymore. But I'd better forget him. But it isn't so easy as that, is it? No. I figured I'd done something. And blame myself. Do you... Uh, do you know this blonde woman in this uh, snapshot? No. Then it must be a woman uh, he has met uh, recently. You've known him for, for four years. I don't think you are to blame He's the one in the wrong. And he should be made to suffer. How? You were going to kill yourself. Why should you? Kill him instead. He double-crossed you. He deserves it. Now, let me go a little deeper into the situation. Whenever a person has reached the conclusion... To take his life... have made up your mind, Miss Tanner. Positive. Now, if you're careful, you won't be caught. No. But whether you are or not, I'm giving you this check for a thousand dollars made out to cash to be sent to your mother only after the man is dead. Write his name on the spare. There you are. I will know what has happened by the newspapers. And I will be told payment... Until I learn that you have gone through with it. It'll happen tonight. Very well. You are sure? You are determined? Absolutely. Nothing could stop me. Very good. But just what would happen if I did get caught? You won't get caught if you follow my instructions. I know. Now, here is a small revolver. It'll fit easily in your purse. That's all you need. Be sure to wipe your fingerprints off and leave the gun near the body. Yeah. Well, goodbye, Dr. Basile. Goodbye, Gladys, and good luck. Professor Basile watches Gladys as she crosses the street to the dimly lighted bus stop. 
Then he rushes to his car and drives away. A few minutes later, he comes to a stop at Hellman's house. Hellman, the editor who ridiculed his theory. Just a minute. Oh. Hello, Basil. Good evening, Hellman. Thought I'd drop out to have a little chat with you. Well, why this time of night? It's kind of late, isn't it? Eleven. Didn't think that was late for you. No? Uh, come in. Thanks. Sit down. What's on your mind? I want to talk to you about my theory you ridiculed so definitely. My theory about suicide. Oh. Well, I just don't believe it, that's all. And I said I'd prove it, didn't I? Yes, but what are you getting at? It's going to be proved. My theory is going to be proved tonight. Oh, well, that's fine. Go right ahead and prove it. I don't like you, Hellman. I never liked you. And I know you don't like me. I can't help that, Basile. What are you staring at? Is there someone here with you? Certainly not. Why? That's a woman's purse on the Davenport. Hmm? Oh, my secretary dropped by earlier this evening with the manuscript. She must have forgotten it. She's not here now? Of course not. Then I'll continue. I found a subject. A girl who was ready to commit suicide because a man jilted her. In a few hours, I was successful in changing her thoughts from suicide to homicide, and she is going to kill the man tonight. What do you think of that? There may be a dozen murders tonight. Ah, but you know which one I mean. You know about this murder. What do you mean? Because I'm going to tell you who the victim is going to be. You know who the intended victim is? Why don't you stop it? <laughs> but then I wouldn't have proved my theory. If you put this girl up to it, you're as guilty as she is. <laughs> you're insane, Basile. Hopelessly insane. You think so, Emma? The whole idea is mad. Too utterly ridiculous for words. <laughs> no sane man would ever think of such a useless, senseless idea. And for heaven's sake, stop laughing. I'm thinking about the victim... Then he learned. Who is the victim? Martin Harriman. Me? Yes, you. <laughs> I don't believe you. You will this time. Who is this girl? I know no girl who'd want to kill me. This one does. Now. Oh, nonsense. However, I wouldn't put a past you to hire someone to do something like this. No, no. This girl is no fake. This girl is serious. Deadly serious. You probably hypnotized some poor woman, figuring she'd never remember what happened. Oh, Herman, you underestimate me. Maybe I do underestimate your evil mind. But believe me... Put up your hands, Herman. Get away from that desk. I'll just take care of that gun, Herman. That's better. Well, since when did you start carrying a gun, Basile? Ah, a gun? Don't be silly. This isn't a gun in my pocket. It's just my pipe. See? <laughs> well, what do you hear, Herman? Uh, nothing. Oh, yes, you do. I heard it, too. The sound on the porch. I leave now. The back way. I put your gun in the kitchen. And I'll be very careful to remove all my fingerprints. You insane fool. Oh, fancy you. You, Herman, you are going to help prove my theory. <laughs> Good night, Herman. That is a devil. I'll have him locked up before he gets across town. Good evening, Miss. Mr. Hellman. Huh? How did you get in here? Through the patio door. What do you want? I wanted to talk to you. Very strangely. <laughs> You're just imagining things. And what are you doing here? I wanted to tell you something. Yeah? What? When you first indicated to me that you were through with me, I was terribly hurt. I thought all along that we were to be married. I couldn't understand... I tried and tried to think of something I'd done to cause our breakup. And then I happened to find this snapshot in your desk. Snapshot? Take a look at it. Kansas City. No, Atlantic City, New Jersey. You and a blonde. And the date is stamped on the back. A business trip. Ha! Huh. Well, what about it? 
I just wanted you to know that you weren't so slick. I wanted you to know that I knew about the blonde. That I knew you'd lied. Now that you've told me, what good does it do you? A lot of good. First, I thought you came here for money. How could you think such a thing? Well, I think you'd better go now. (laughs) I'm going. Goodbye, Morton. And good luck in your new venture. What venture? This one. Gladys. Gladys! Wish me luck in mine. Gladys stands staring a moment at the body of Hellman, then wipes off the gun, drops it to the floor, takes the professor's check from her purse, steps to Hellman's desk and writes a note. Then she puts the note in an envelope with the check, addresses it, stamps it, turns out the lights, and steps out into the dark street. At the corner, she drops the envelope in the mailbox and disappears. Professor Basile heard the shots. His theory worked. Hellman will torment him no more. The perfect crime. So he can go home to his wife now and go to sleep. Myra. Myra. Huh? What? Oh, oh, Antonio. What are you doing asleep on the Davenport? Do you know what time it is? It must be after midnight. I've been waiting for you. How was opera? Oh, fair. Nothing to brag about. Who sang the lead? Bill Chiotti. He wasn't very good. Bill Chiotti? Mm-hmm. He's a poor old fellow. A fellow? I thought they were uh, doing Ida tonight. No, they switched because someone was ill. Oh, I just as soon have stayed home. Have a night, Cup Myra? No, thanks. I'm tired. I think I'll go to bed. I belong presently. Good night. Then the night passes and the morning comes. The professor rises cheerfully and prepares for breakfast. Then. I get it, Myra. Yes. Are you Professor Basile? Yes. May we come in? We'd like to talk with you. Of course. What is it you want? Is your wife in? Yes. We'd like to see her, too. You are? Oh, I'm Lieutenant Davis. Oh. Detective Davis. Well, what do you want? Will you call your wife? Why, uh... I'm suddenly... Myra! But what's this all about? What is it, Antonio? These men are from detective headquarters. They want to talk to us. Really? What about? May I ask where you were last night, Mrs. Basile? Certainly. I went to the opera. What time did you get home? Oh, I imagine it was around 11 or shortly after. Mm-hmm. Were you at home last evening, Professor? Well, I was at the club and got home about 12.30. By the way, uh, do you know a Morton Hellman? Certainly. What about him? He's been murdered. Murdered? Good Lord. When? Around midnight last night. I found him this morning. How terrible. Why, I've known him for years. He was editor-in-chief of the company publishing my writings. I'm a psychologist, you know. Yes, we know. But uh, what do you want to know from us? We weren't connected socially with Hellman. Uh, just in business. Did uh, you know him, Mrs. Basile? Yes, yes, I knew him very slightly. Do either of you know of anyone who'd have reason to kill him? Uh, certainly not. Everyone thought highly of him. Did you ever hear of a girl named Gladys Tanner? Gladys Tanner? No. Did you know of a Gladys Tanner, Mrs. Basile? No. Is this your purse, Mrs. Basile? Why, of course it is. That's the one I gave you last Christmas, Myra. Well, yes. I must have lost it downtown. Where did you find it, Lieutenant? At Hellman's home. Hellman's home? Well, how in the world? Good heavens, but We how... found it on the sofa. Well, I can't imagine how it could get there. And this is the revolver that killed Hellman, found on the floor beside him. What? No fingerprints on it, however. What? what? May I see it? By Myra. This is your gun. I bought this for you two years ago when I went on the lecture tour. Yes, I think it's mine, but it just doesn't make sense. Did you have the gun in your purse when you lost it last night? Well, I... Perhaps I did. I'm so confused now, I can't remember. A thing... 
Now, think it is, it is terrible. Oh, I know. Oh, dear, I feel ill. Did you ever fire this gun? Yes, once last year up in the mountains. I wanted to see how it worked. Ever reload it? No, I'd never reloaded it. I, I just didn't think about it. Maybe I did put it in my purse. Why, I don't know. And, and whoever found the purse may have used the gun to... Oh, I just can't see this thing. This gun misfired on the first two shots. The other three killed Hellman. This is the most amazing piece of coincidence I ever heard of. Why would my wife want to do such a thing? Why should she get to Hellman? She hardly knew him. Are you sure about that, Professor? Of course. Well, sorry to say that I don't believe her. What? This is ridiculous. This is going to be a shock to you, Professor, but here's a snapshot we found on Hellman's desk. Taken in Atlantic City last July. Good heavens. Why, this is you, my... You and Hellman. You were at your mother's in Florida in July. <laughs> Myra, look at me. What does this mean? I can't. I can't. And I can't believe such a thing. May I have the purse, the gun, and the photo? Thank you. I'm sorry, but I'll have to take her down to headquarters. But I didn't kill him. I didn't. I wouldn't. I loved him. <laughs> Myra. <laughs> You better pull yourself together. You'll have to go back. You'll want photos and fingerprints? Yes. You better get it ready, Myra. <laughs> Certainly looks bad for her. Afraid it does. Looks like an open and shut case. Oh, uh, will you come along too, Professor? Certainly. And so it all worked out beautifully. Not quite as the Professor had planned. But then he changed his plan from the moment when Gladys Tanner showed him the snapshot taken in Atlantic City. And he realized that the girl's fiancé was Hellman and that the blonde was Myra, his wife. He had no intention of allowing Gladys Tanner to kill Hellman until he saw that snapshot. And when he recognized Myra's purse in Hellman's home, he decided to let Gladys kill him and the blame be placed on Myra. The perfect crime. But several hours later, after fingerprints and many questions, the professor is just about to be dismissed when Sergeant Rankin steps into the room and speaks quietly to Lieutenant Davis. What is it, Rankin? I stayed at the Seals' place, as you said. Well? A few minutes ago, a special delivery letter came for the professor. This will knock your eye out. Read it. Mm -hmm. Well, this fits perfectly with the writing we were trying to make out on Helm's desk letter. Professor... Here's a letter sent special delivery to you a few minutes ago, postmarked last night. Read it. Dear Professor Basile, your theory worked a certain degree. You convinced me I should kill him. Uh, I should kill him, uh, but when that gun you gave me uh, misfired twice, I, I almost quit. Go ahead, Professor. Read on. Then as I looked at him on the floor, the feeling of self-destruction came back. I'm going ahead with my plan. Here's your check. I won't need it. Besides, I lied to you. I lost my mother long ago. Better luck next time. That is Tana. And a half hour ago, they found her body beneath Suicide Bridge. Well, Professor, your perfect crime has failed. Failed, Yes. Failed, Wonderful but... setup on paper, but your theory backfired and you're up for murder. But I didn't kill him. But you planned it and you're as guilty as Gladys. She's paid her penalty, now it's your turn. No, no. I won't, I won't be hanged. Never! Drink and drink. And now the doctor lies on the sidewalk, 17 stories below. His entire theory worked in reverse. So closes the doctor prescribed death starring Bela Lugosi. Tonight's story of suspense. It came to you from Columbia Square in Hollywood.
This is the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when we present the noted actor, Mr. Sidney Greenstreet, in The Hangman Won't Wait. Spear, the producer, Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin, the musical director, Lucian Mahwick, the composer, and J. Donald Wilson, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Barbara Stanwyck and Melvin Douglas in Dark Victory. Lux presents Hollywood. Our play for tonight, Dark Victory, an inspiring play of a surgeon and a girl. Fate tried to separate them. Love brought them together forever. We want you to know how sincerely we appreciate your enthusiasm for this program and our products. Your purchases of Lux Toilet Soap and Lux Flakes, which enable us to bring you these productions, tell us in the best way possible that you like the Lux Radio Theater. Headline tonight are Barbara Stanwyck and Melvin Douglas in Dark Victory by George Brewer, Jr. and Bertram Block. Our guest is Miss Nina Roberts, hairstylist of Hollywood stars, and Louis Silvers conducts our orchestra. Our producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille, is unable to be with us tonight. As guest producer, we're happy to welcome back, through courtesy of B.P. Schulberg, one of the screen's outstanding celebrities. You've heard him before on this program in both this capacity and as a dramatic star. A great actor, a genial host, a splendid gentleman. We're proud to present Mr. Edward Arnold. Thank you, Melville Roig, and good evening, everyone. I considered it one of the greatest compliments I ever, uh, ever extended me when last January I was invited to the Lux Radio Theater to take the place temporarily of Cecil B. DeMille. I feel still more flattered and grateful to have been given that honor again, though I sincerely regret the occasion of Mr. DeMille's absence. But illness overtakes even the best troopers now and then, and while I know my regret is one you all share, you'll be happy to learn that his illness is not serious and that DeMille will be back with us next week or the week after, producing the Lux Radio Theater as heretofore. I'm particularly happy working with two such charming and important people as Barbara Stanwyck and Melville Douglas. Miss Stanwyck may not know it, but she's assumed a, a major importance in the Arnold household, being the idol of my 13-year-old daughter, Jane. The love of my daughter's life happens to be horses, and ever since Miss Stanwyck acquired a ranch in the San Fernando Valley and began raising fine horses, Jane's invariable greeting when I come home is, when are we going to get a ranch like Barbara Stanwyck's? Hello, Pop. <laughs> when it comes to off-screen activities, I have a little more in common with Melvin Douglas. We're both pretty fond of good music. Both have wives who are singers. And at present, Melvin and I are hard at work in a drive for the Symphony Society of Southern California. Miss Stanwyck comes to us from 20th Century Fox Studios, where her new picture is called Always Goodbye. Tonight we hear her as Judith Trahern. Mr. Douglas, who plays Dr. Frederick Steele, is a Columbia Studios and Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer star and is now at work with Louise Reiner in The Toy Wife. Our curtain goes up. The Lux Radio Theater presents another outstanding Broadway play, Dark Victory, starring Barbara Stanwyck and Melvin Douglas.
a country cottage on the north shore of Long Island. It's two o'clock in the morning. In the darkened living room, a telephone jangles wildly. From the hall comes Dr. Frederick Steele, a robe thrown hastily over his pajamas. He switches on a lamp over the desk and lifts the receiver. Hello? Yes? This is Dr. Steele speaking. Who? But I'm a brain man. Well, I haven't been taking any calls down here. I'm on a vacation. Oh. Have you tried Dr. Parsons? Oh, I see. I thought he'd be back by now. Of course, I'll come if you think it's important. What's the name, please? What's the matter with her? Hmm, she had it long? All right, I'll be there as soon as I can. There's another one coming, Dr. Steele. Steele? Who is he? Judith, what kind of a hostess are you? Come and join the party. Oh, Leslie, please, Martha's sick. Oh, she'll be all right. Well, I'm worried about it. <laughs> Leslie, see if you can keep them quiet in there, will you? And for heaven's sake, turn off that radio. I beg pardon, Mr. Herman. Dr. Steele is here. Thank you, Harvey. See what you can do, Leslie. Dr. Steele? Good evening. I'm glad you could come, Doctor. Thanks. I've been wondering if I came to the right place. Oh, you mustn't let the noise confuse you. I'll try not to. Where's the patient, please? It's Mrs. Blaine. My maid will show you to her room. This way, Doctor. Thank you. I'll be up in a few minutes. And it just came on me all of a sudden, Doctor. I had a pain here. Then I got dizzy just like that. And then I don't know what happened. I feel a little better now, though. But I'd feel terrible if I thought I couldn't ride tomorrow. We're having a hunt, you know. Really? Riding to hounds. Oh, you think I'll be all right, don't you? Yes, I think you'll be all right. Excuse me. But aren't you going to prescribe something? I'll take care of it. Good night. Well, Doctor? Did I leave my hat in here? Are you going already? How is she? Oh, she'll be all right with proper nourishment and care, and if my advice is followed, to the T. I dare say she'll be able to ride to the hounds tomorrow. I see. And what is your advice, Doctor? Don't give her any more to drink. Thank you. I'm sorry to have bothered you, Doctor, but I didn't know. It's all right. She's like a lot of women of your class, stomachache cases. Does your right eye always twitch like that? Only when I'm flirting with someone. <laughs> Good night, Doctor. Good night. Lots of luck tomorrow. I hope you catch the fox. Judith! Judith, we're way off. What's the difference? Well, they've all gone down the road. We'll cut across. I'll race you to the fence, Leslie. It's a go. Come on, Stardust, come on. The rails are up, we can pass right through. First one through the gate. Keep to the left or you'll miss it. Oh, stick to your riding, Leslie. Over this way, bear to the left. I know where I'm going. You're too far over. you miss the gate. Come on, Stardust, come on. Judith, Judith, for God's sake, you're going right for the fence. Come on, come on. Judith, look out for the fence. Look out, Judith. <laughs> Judith. Judith, are you all right? Judith. I asked you a question, Judith. Won't you answer me, please? What is it, Doctor? Did you take the medicine I prescribed? Yes. Did it do you any good? Yes, I told you it did. Why do you keep after me all the time? Because I'm not satisfied with your condition. Well, I am. I'm all right, I tell you. I had a bad fall. It didn't kill me. I'll get over it. You had that fall almost four months ago. Should be over it now. Well, I might be if you'd stop feeding me pills for a few days. Now, Judith, look at me. I saw you into this world, my dear. I only want to keep you in it, in health. I'm sorry, Dr. Parsons. Now, now what about those headaches? Do you still have them? At times. When did you have the last one? I don't know. Yesterday, I think. They're nothing. I've had them before. Before? Before you had the fall? Yes. Judith... I want you to do a favor for me, will you? Well, what is it? Now, now, please don't refuse me. I want you to go into New York with me. I want you to see a man there, a doctor I have great faith oh, in. Oh, Dr. Parsons, Now, I... now, please, Judith. I just want to satisfy myself that everything is all right. Now, would you do it for me? Very well, doctor. Good. I'll go and call him now. I won't be long. Hello? Hello? I want to put a call through to New York, please. Yes. To Dr. Frederick Steele. 
I tell you, Parsons, I can't do it. I told you on the phone I couldn't do it. No, but you've got to help me. It's important, Steele. This girl is one... I don't care who she is. I can't see her. I quit New York practice. Closed my office yesterday. I'm leaving here in about 20 minutes. Why don't you get Findlay? Findlay's in Europe. All right, then get Park. I don't want Park or any of the rest of them. They're no better than I am. I want you. (laughs) Can't be done. I'm leaving for Vermont. Very well. It's going to be a little embarrassing for you. Embarrassing? Why? Because she's out there in your waiting room. I brought her with me. I see. Now, Steele, you're always crying out about the sad lot of humanity. Well, there's humanity waiting for you in that room. You can't turn your back on it. All right, Parsons, you win. I'll see your patient. Good. But I'm still leaving here in 20 minutes. Come in, Judith. Judith, this is Dr. Steele. Dr. Steele? How do you do, Doctor? Oh. Miss, uh... Mr. Hearn, isn't it? Yes. Do you know each other? Slightly, yes. Well, that simplifies matters considerably. I'll wait outside, Doctor. Sit down, Mr. Hearn. Thank you. I had no idea you were this, Dr. Steele. I had no idea you were that, Mr. Hearn. Does it make any difference? Not to me. Fine. I know something of your case, Mr. Hearn. I understand you had a fall. Yes. I also understand you don't like to talk about your health. I don't. Why? It bores me, that's all. Most people love it. Is that light from the window too strong for you? No. But your right eye seems to... It's uh, just the same little failing, Doctor. Oh. How old are you, Mr. Hearn? I'm 27 years old, an only child, an orphan since I was 20. I weigh 115 pounds. I've had mumps, measles, and whooping cough, all at the proper ages. Shall I go on? Please. I'm interested in horses. I take plenty of exercise. I smoke to excess, but seldom drink. I'm said to have a sense of humor. Your headaches must interfere with that. I see you have my case history. They're pretty bad, aren't they? Those headaches. I can stand them. Mostly on the right side. Yes. How'd you happen to fall from your horse? We were riding for the gate. I misjudged the distance and missed it. My horse didn't clear the fence. How far to the right of the gate were you? They tell me it was about 15... How did you know it was to the right? I guessed it. Clever of you, Doctor. About 15 feet. I suppose you think I got what I deserved. How do you mean? Oh, that night you came to the house, you had a great contempt for the pastimes of the idle rich. Oh, I was a bit cranky that evening. You must make allowances for the hour. But you have a contempt for them? They don't appeal to me, that's all. Well, it's the only thing I know. What does appeal to you? Just your practice, I suppose. No, no, that least of all. Mm, You seem to be doing pretty well. Mm, Too well. It comes a little too easily, this feeding sugar pills to a Park Avenue clientele. Oh, I know. Stomach ache cases. <laughs> yes, you can call it that. It sounds awful. It is. Then why do you do it? Because, like you, Mr. Hearn, I'm caught in the swim. Oh, Doctor, what a relief to find out you're no better than I am. Yeah, but I'm leaving my practice. Clearing out. Retiring? No, no, just the contrary. I'm going back into medicine. Mm, that's a little deep. Well, I'm going to a remote village in northern Vermont to be a country doctor. Oh, yes, I remember now. But why? And why Vermont? I was born there. Oh, oh, it's just sentiment then. If you like. All the same, I think I envy you. (laughs) It must be swell to believe in what you're doing. Don't you? No, not the way you do. Oh, I'm not complaining, take it all in all. They dealt me a very good hand. I'm young. I have no particular responsibilities. I I won't cultivate them either. I'm freer without them. I'll probably marry someday. No hurry about that. And when I do, I'll build a house on a ridge I know with a glorious view. I'll have my horses, and with luck, I'll have... Oh, about 40 years of it. I think that's a pretty good setup. Do you? That light is in your eyes, isn't it? I wish you wouldn't keep harping on that. There's nothing the matter with my eyes. But you're squinting. I'm not squinting. I'll pull down the shade. That's better. Suit yourself. It's your office. What did you do yesterday, Mr. Hearn? What? Yesterday, what did you do? Why, I, uh, 
I went to the theater in the afternoon. I played bridge in the evening. But yesterday was Tuesday. There were no matinees. You're sure it wasn't the other way around? Oh, yes, I guess it was. What was the play? Oh, I, I can't remember the title. It wasn't very good. Too bad. How'd you come out at bridge? Let me think. I, uh... Quickly. Well, I can't remember. You lost, didn't you? Yes, I lost. How much? How can I remember? I play bridge every day. You've been losing a lot lately, haven't you? Yes. Playing badly? I suppose so. We're getting what cards are out and what's been bid. Why do you ask me all these silly questions? I told Dr. Parsons I'd try to make a diagnosis. Then... Then all this talk... You've been examining me, haven't you? Watching everything I say, every move I make. Yes. Do you mind? I guess it's all right. Thank you. Well, what have you discovered? I don't know. I'd like you to put yourself in my hands for a few hours to make a complete test. Would you do that? Will you? Oh, I'm going to surprise myself. I'll do it. I thought you'd never finish. It took a little time, Doctor. You've missed your train, of course. Train? Oh, yes. Well, how is she? Did you find anything? She has everything to live for, hasn't she? Money, position, everything. What's the matter? Well, don't stand there looking at me like that. What is it? Glioma. Brain tumor. Good God. Where? Temporal and parietal lobes. She has a right visual defect. Is it... Uh, can we operate? Yes. Will you do it? Yes. Probably won't help much. She'll be an invalid? No, there'll be a recurrence in about ten months. A short period of blindness. That'll be the signal. The signal? For the end. Oh. She'll die within ten months. And so ends Act One of Dark Victory, starring Barbara Stanwyck and Melvin Douglas. In a few moments, our stars will return in Act Two. During our brief intermission, we are going to give you an opportunity to determine your movie IQ. That is, to find out how well you really know your movie stars. A young lady is going to read some sentences which don't seem to have much significance. But hidden in each is the name of a famous screen star. Just the last name. See if you can spot it. Listen carefully. And remember, it's only the last name you're to watch for. Let's go. First sentence. She's a blonde. L is not her first initial. I'll repeat that. She's a blonde. L is not her first initial. Did you get it? That's Joan Blondell. She's a blonde, L is not her first initial. Oh, Mary, uh, maybe you'd better read that just a little bit more slowly. I can see some people in the audience straining to think. Surely, Mr. Roy. Sentence two. A ton of coal barely lasts us through the winter. Now, I'll say that again. A ton of coal barely lasts us through the winter. That was easy. Claudette Colbert. A ton of coal barely lasts us through the winter. Sentence three. On payday, vistas of joy confront us. Here it is again. On payday, vistas of joy confront us. Now, that's not quite so easy. Davis. Betty Davis. On payday, vistas of joy confront us. We named three of the loveliest, most charming women in Hollywood. Joan Blondell, Claudette Colbert, and Betty Davis. They each represent a different type of beauty. But about complexion care, they all agree and use Lux Toilet Soap regularly. And they give you another tip. We use Lux Toilet Soap as a bath soap, too, they say. They find this soap with active lather a sure way to protect the daintiness that is so essential to feminine charm. Its active lather removes perspiration, every trace of dust and dirt, leaves the skin really fresh, perfumed with a delicate fragrance you'll love. And now, Edward Arnold. We continue with Dark Victory, starring Barbara Stanwyck and Melvin Douglas.
With a strange willingness which she herself did not understand, Judith placed herself in Steele's hands and underwent the difficult operation. But she still doesn't know that her cure is only temporary, that certain death is waiting for her before a year is gone. In her hospital room, she's propped up in a wheelchair by the window, gazing up at Steele, who stands in front of her. And I'm going home in a week? You promise? I promise. Oh, I'm glad. It'll be grand to be home again. There's so much I want to do. You'll have to go easy for Oh, I will. What about riding? Well, not for a while. But soon? I hope so. You'll come to see me, won't you? Of course you will. You're going to come often. (laughs) I'm surprised you want me. Oh, I've forgiven you, Doctor. Everything you said. I'm feeling very noble just now. Are you? Mm Mm-hmm. I guess everyone feels that way after flirting with death. Was I brave, Doctor? You are very brave. You'll always be, I think. Thank you. I like to believe I was, anyhow. I'd like you to feel I was worth the trouble. Trouble? Dr. Parsons told me you were planning to leave the morning I came to you. Oh, that was nothing. I I just want you to know that I appreciate it. That I'm grateful to you. You know, it's funny. I, I never had faith in anyone before. Not real faith like I have in you. What have you done to me, Doctor, besides affecting a cure? Hmm? What are you thinking about? I'm thinking you'd better go back to bed. You've got a lot of resting to do before you leave here. I'll drop in again in the morning. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. Give him a good rub down, Michael. Yes, miss. How are you, Martha? I'm is this really you? Yes. Well, Alice <laughs> told me you were out riding. I thought she'd been drinking. Did you just get here? Ten minutes ago. Oh, you must be the first. Come inside. I've got a lot to tell you. Who else is coming? Oh, it's a big weekend. Harker, Les Clark, the Tards, Mabel, Jerry Levitt for you, and Dr. Parsons. To lend a medical flavor. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Martha. Anyone else? Well, I, uh... I, I mentioned Fred Steele, didn't I? <laughs> you very pointedly did not. <laughs> well, he's coming, of course. Hmm... I have rather bitter memories of Dr. Steele. He's very rude. Oh, he's not really. He's marvelous when you get to know him. You seem to know him quite well. I'm trying to. You've been pretty hard hit, haven't you? I'm in love with him. And he? <laughs> That's always the first question one asks. I don't know. He's so hard to see into. Oh, he's conscious of me. I affect him pleasantly and... He may be in love with me. But if he is, he doesn't show it. Mm, Why couldn't the Spaniards or the French have landed on Plymouth Rock instead of the Puritans? He enjoys being with me, I know that. And he's opened my eyes to a new world. He's the first thoroughly fine person I've ever come close to. Hmm. What's the matter? English is your common tongue. What else have you in common? Oh, don't joke about this, man. I'm not joking. If I married him, I I could teach him. Well, my pet, get him if you can and my blessings. Only, remember the man who went hunting with a butterfly net and routed out a panther? A panther. Yes, that would be just the thing for my farm. Farm? You have no farm. Oh, but I might have one of these days in Vermont, darling. Fred, come in. Oh, I didn't expect you until dinner time. I thought I'd come early, if you didn't mind. Oh, I'm glad you did. We can have a talk before the crowd gets here. Sit down. I'd like that. I may not see you again for quite a while. Why, Fred? Oh, you mean you're going to Vermont? I'm leaving tomorrow. So soon? It has to be sometime. Of course. How have you been, Judith? What? Oh, oh, fine. Let's have a look at you. No headache? None. Been sleeping well? Beautifully. Appetite good? Marvelous. You see? I know all the answers. Good. Now stand with both feet together. Close your eyes. How's the balance? Perfect. I find nothing wrong. There isn't. I rode today. Oh. How'd it go? How did it go? I wish I had a gift for words, Fred. For the first few minutes, I was tense. I I, I couldn't forget that day when I crashed into the fence. I saw the whole thing happen again. And then my horse responded. I put him to a hedge. We cleared it beautifully. The fields lay clear and green before us. 
I was free. And what was better, I was myself again. Oh, Fred, how can I ever thank you? Oh, don't. Let's talk of thanks. I owe you so much. I've been repaid a thousand times for anything I've done. And I never want you to feel under any debt to me. I think that's the nicest thing anyone has ever said to me. Are you so generous to all your patients, oh, Dr. Steele? Judith, you know what I mean. Oh, perhaps I do, and perhaps I don't. How much of what you say do you ever mean? I mean that I care so much that I'll be ready to come to you halfway across the earth whenever you call me. Is that better? You sound so serious. Well, it was a serious speech. It had such... such finality to it. Fred, what's disturbing you? Nothing. Yes, there is. Why do you choose just those words... Whenever you call me. I was trying to fit the role you picked for me. Oh, you're not telling me the truth, but that's your privilege. Oh, I'll get it from you sometime. Perhaps later in the summer if I should see you. What? Well, you see, a real estate friend of mine told me last night that I ought to have a place in the mountains. And where do you think he suggested I buy a place? Vermont. No, really? Uh-huh. Maybe I'll buy it. And then I can come up once in a while and, and stand godmother to the babies you bring. <laughs> Well, I'll have to arrange for them to be born between your horse shows. You think it's all nonsense, don't you? My interest in showing horses. But I love it, and I... I do it well. That's something, isn't it? Oh, I know. But uh, what of the more serious side of life, my child? <laughs> oh, don't worry. That's coming, too, when I'm married. Married? Mm-hmm. Are you thinking seriously of getting married? Why not? Is it unnatural? Look at me. Is it so hard to think of me in love? What's the matter? Nothing. Fred, what's happened? Nothing has happened. What are you hiding from me? Judith, why should I hide anything from you? Oh, don't evade. You're trying to protect me. From what? I tell you, there's nothing. That strange, solemn note that comes into your voice whenever we talk about me and my future. I've, I've noticed it before. Oh, you're imagining things. Oh, don't lie not to me. What's frightening you so? Judith, you're frightening yourself. Oh, I see. I see. This terrible thing in my brain is coming back. It is, isn't it? And this time it's going to... I'll die, won't I? Judith. I'm going to die. That's it, isn't it, Fred? Oh, God, Judith. Please. I'm all right. Just give me a minute. Light a cigarette for me, will you? Thanks. I'll... I'll have those headaches again and that... that awful confusion. No, you're not going to suffer again. That's all behind you now. How will it come? Quietly. Peacefully. God's last small mercy. I'll have no warning. No chance to be ready. There may be a moment. Near the end. When you won't be able to see quite as usual. You mean I'll go blind first? Just for a moment. Then you'll be perfectly all right again for a few hours. Fred, how long have I? A year? Eight months? Six? Possibly more. Judith. I'd rather you didn't touch me just now. Do you mind? I think I'd like to be alone, Fred. Why? I won't do anything reckless. I'd rather stay. I want to be alone, Fred. Mr. Hearn, about... Mr. Hearn can't see you now, Harvey. Well, it's about dinner, sir. There'll be no dinner tonight. Tell the guests that. When no, no, don't tell them anything, Harvey. I'll see you in a few minutes. Yes, ma'am. Judith, you can't do this. You're in no condition oh, to... Oh, please, Fred, it can't make any difference one way or the other, and I... I want to do it this way. <laughs> Pretty gay, aren't they? 
What are you doing out here, still? You want to be inside with the young people. I'm doing the same thing you're doing, Parsons. Watching her. Yes. Strange, isn't it? That girl in there, so full of life, so entitled to live, and a contemptible, meaningless organism puts a period to it. It's rather a bitter commentary on advanced medicine. <laughs> She'd be the first to tell you that. She's found out. What? She knows she's going to die. Good God. How did she find out? I told her this afternoon. You told her? Oh, how could you? We won't go into that. She caught me off guard. She was thanking me for saving her, talking so hopefully of her future. How did she take it? You know how she'd take it. Magnificently. But she's a lonely girl. She'll be lonelier now. She has courage. Thank God for that. She has friends, many of them. Friends? Those chattering fools in there, do you think they can help her? One word from me and they'd run from the house like rats. Steele, you wouldn't. No, no, I won't tell them. Where are you going? To be entertained, Dr. Parsons. <laughs> oh, come in, Dr. Steele. You're just in time to hear the pun. Oh, Miss Poppard, you'll be sent home. Without her supper? Without her supper. Because of one little story. Oh, one of your little stories, yes. <laughs> oh, you know, dearest, my suspicions of you are right. You're not sophisticated at all. Actually, you're a woman who's destined to be a mother and who have loads of oh, children. Oh, 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 Oscar and Judith and Peter and little Fred. Why don't you shut up? What? Fred. It's all right, Martha. It isn't all right. Judith isn't well. I am. I'm all right, I tell you. Will everyone please get out? No, no one is getting out. Judith, I want to speak to you. Will you come outside, please? I'll be right back, everyone. Well, I'm oh, I'm right. Right. Oh, that was rotten of you, Fred. It was the only intelligent thing I've done today. I'm not going to stand by while you put yourself through an ordeal like that. What do you want me to do? Sit upstairs by myself and think how in six this months... This isn't the time to face people who expect you to be gay and happy. I would have carried it off tonight if you hadn't interfered. And then what? Then? Nothing. You're wrong, Judith. There is something. Something more important than you think. You can find peace. Oh, he takes away my life and offers me peace. You left me too much for peace. Six long months. Oh, God, how long they seem. Now, give yourself a chance, Judith. Don't try to adjust yourself to this thing all in a minute. You can't do it. You're only going to make it harder for yourself if you try. Judith, trust me. I'm your friend. Too much, my friend. Oh, much, much too much. Oh, I'm talking in riddles. I dislike people who evade. But suppose I don't like myself. What of it? It'll be that much easier six months from now. Must be horrible to die loving oneself. I'm shocking you. No. Disappointing you, then? No. Well, why do you stand there and say nothing? Your eyes searching me, your mind, that beautiful scientific mind judging me. Well, what do you think of this exhibition? What do you think now of your calm, brave Judith who went into the operating room without a tremor? What I've always thought of you. I only want you to have the same faith in yourself that I have in you. Oh, you've never had faith in me. You thought there were too many bad spots. You dislike my world. You despise it. Well, thank heaven for that world now. At least my friends will help me cram my days and nights to overflowing. You mustn't tell them, Judith. Don't ever do that. Oh, I don't want sympathy. I want action. I want to move to live. The night shall be filled with music. I'll put on a good show, believe me, and I'll be satisfied with that for my epitaph. No, you won't be. You're too vital a person to be satisfied with that. There's the truth, and you've got to face it. The truth is I'm going to die in six months. There is no other truth. We all must die. The tragic difference is that, that you know when, and we don't. But the important thing is the same for all of us. To live our lives completely. <laughs> the doctor talks. Because I know that you want so much more than your friends can possibly give you. Because I want you to find some measure of fulfillment. Fulfillment? Haven't I been dreaming of fulfillment? Hoping and praying? Fulfillment? Oh, you... Oh, you poor fool. Can't you see? Don't you know? I'm in love with you. Judith. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. 
It was unfair of me. Judith. I never dreamed... Oh, it doesn't matter, Fred. It would have been much worse if you'd loved me, too. I know you don't think there's a place in your heart for love, and... And now I, I can never teach you. Never. Never, never. That's a terrible word, isn't it? Judith. I'm taking you away with me. Yes? Why? Because you need my help. Still my friend. Oh, go away and leave me alone. I can't rise to your height. I only wanted you to hold my hand. You can't even do that. You're no good to me. You're no good to me at all. Sit down, Judith. No, I'm not in your office now. You can't do that to me. Oh, don't you see? You'll only stop me living the few hours left to me. My friends can lift me out of this, but you... You mean defeat. Futility and... Death. Always and always that, and I won't have it. I won't let you spoil what's left. Judith. I want you to go away. I want you to go and stay away. I don't want to see you again. Ever. <laughs> We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. With the second act of Dark Victory completed, and with the third act uh, to come in a few moments, we go from the serious mood of our play into a lighter vein. We devote this brief intermission to a meeting with another backstage Hollywood personality who helps make motion pictures what they are. She is Nina Roberts, chief hairstylist of the United Artists Studios. Miss Roberts has been parting the hair of glamorous stars for 12 years, starting with Mary Pickford and Norma Talmadge. At the moment, she's working on the Walter Wanger production, Algiers. And the efforts of her 20 assistants are seen in such recent films as The Adventures of Marco Polo, Stella Dallas, Stand In, and The Goldwyn Follies. In the latter film, Miss Roberts achieved the distinction of giving Master Charles McCarthy his first shampoo, Finger Wave and Marcel. And I've been picking splinters out of my fingers ever since, Mr. Arnold. <laughs> Didn't Charlie feel like a sissy getting his hair done? <laughs> Indeed not. He was a little scared that his scalp might war. But apart from that, he didn't open his mouth. <laughs> well, probably because Edgar Bergen wasn't around. But why, Miss Roberts, was it necessary to operate on Master McCarthy's curls for, for the movies? Because the picture was done in Technicolor, Mr. Arnold, which demands much more attention to detail than black and white films. And here's a fact that might be particularly appropriate. Each star in a Technicolor picture uses special Technicolor makeup. Before this makeup is put on and when it is taken off, you will find that the stars make generous use of Lux Toilet Soap. They prefer it because its active lather makes it such a fine complexion soap. A soap that removes stale cosmetics thoroughly. Well, we're glad to hear you say that, Miss Roberts. A fact like that should be interesting to the women in our audience who also use Lux Soap. Now, uh, now about hair. From my casual observations, the present mode seems to have come directly from the history books. The modern girl apparently wants to look more like a page boy. Right you are. But the page boy, Bob, is now at its peak, which means another style will soon replace it. The pompadour. You'll first see it in modified form, with the hair swept up the back of the head and curls on top in the form of papillettes or ringlets. Hair will be worn sleek and tight to the head, so it will really look bobbed, and women will once again reveal the fact that they have ears. Well, there are many types of girls and faces in our audience, Miss Roberts. Would you make an attempt to distribute a little specific advice? You name them and I'll try. Well, let's begin with the general classification of uh, brunettes. Good. Dark hair usually looks best when it's sleek and well-groomed, because dark hair around the face usually shows a definite hairline. Blonde hair doesn't show a definite hairline, and therefore usually looks better curled. Very good. Now, what about the girl with a round face? She should wear her hair drawn smoothly from the forehead in a soft knot in the back. In the evening, a high dress 
will subdue the roundness of the face. Now, the girl whose nose is a trifle larger than she'd like it to be. <laughs> she should avoid both the high hairdress and a lot of waves on the top. She should keep a flat hairline, the head, and fullness at the sides in the form of curls or waves. And for those who wear glasses? My suggestion is never wear the hair pulled away from the face. A softly waved hairdress with some fluffiness around the temples is most becoming. And speaking of fluffy hair, Mr. Arnold, did you know that Lux Toilet Soap makes the hair grand as shampoo? And we use it at the studio all the time. But getting back to girls with glasses, they should choose hats with widely flaring blims, never off the face hats or turbans. You'll find all these types on the screen. So watch the pictures not only to see specific examples, but also to learn what's new in... Thank you. Thank you, Miss Roberts. <laughs> Barbara Stanwyck and Melvin Douglas in Dark Victory. It's late October. Four months have passed, and Judith is living desperately, cramming a lifetime into a new few short weeks. But she finds no, dis no satisfaction in her mad existence. No relief from the gnawing thought that her days are numbered. She's in a car now, on her way home from a late party. Faster, Leslie. Oh, you can go faster than this, can't you? Maybe I can, but I'm not going to try. Well, what are you doing? We're stopping. You might not care about your neck, but I'm very sentimental about mine. Now, don't you think we ought to turn for home, Judith? It's almost dawn. Well... You ought to get some sleep. Sleep? Oh. What's the matter with you? What are you doing to yourself? You can't go on this way much longer. No, I can't. Well, then why don't you stop? Everybody's talking about you. Not you, Les. Oh, not me, no. But I don't like to see you throwing yourself around. Not unless you throw yourself at me. Would you like that, Les? Judith, what is this? You can kiss me if you want. Judith, I never knew you could be like this. What's got into you? Oh, it's no good, Les. Judith. Let me go. Let me go, please. Oh, you were right. I can't go on this way. I can't die like this. Die? What are you talking about? I'm going to die in two months, Leslie. What? It's as certain as the night is passing now. You're practically holding a dead woman in your arms. Does that frighten you? It is rather repulsive, isn't Judith, it? Judith, I... That's why I've been living as I have so cheaply, so stupidly. But it's over now. I'm leaving tomorrow. Where, Judith? Oh, away, away from all this. As far as I can get. The stars are so bright, aren't they? It's been a grand autumn. With all the colors. The old year puts on a fine show near the end. That's what I have to do. I have to learn how to die. I'll go home now, Leslie. Good evening, Jenny. You're late tonight, Dr. Steele. Yes, I had to stay at the Fraser's house longer than I expected. It's after 9 o'clock. I know. I saw the train pull out as I came by the station. You're tired, aren't you? I hadn't thought about it. Maybe I am. Well, I don't like your looking so tired. Oh, don't worry about me, Jenny. And don't fuss. Remember, I'm not in the second grade any longer. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, so am I, Jenny. Don't pay any attention to me. I'm all right. Oh, I thought coming back here would... Well, it'd make everything different. It hasn't. You're not contented here, are you? No, nothing is ever complete, Jenny. There's no such thing as perfection. I've learned that. And you didn't used to think so. But I've learned. You see, I came very close to it once, Jenny. Almost to the thing itself. I held it in my hand. But there was a little flaw, and because I couldn't compromise... I lost it. I don't know what you mean. No, oh, it doesn't matter. Good night, Jenny. Good night. Who is it? Who's there? 
Judith. Judith, darling. Darling, it's cold. Come in. I came to you, Fred. I came to you after all. Oh, Judith, darling. Here, sit down. Are you all right? Yes. Let me... Give me your coat. How'd you get here? I walked. You walked from the station? There wasn't any taxi. Fred, I've got to speak to you. No, no, not tonight. Let it wait until tomorrow. No, I've got to tell you now. I've come a long way. You'd better hear me. All right, go on. I've done what I said I would, Fred. Yes. Everything. It was no good. It didn't work, Fred. I was afraid it wouldn't. I should have brought you with me. I failed you, Judith. No, I failed myself. But last night I reached the end, so I've come. I won't demand much. Your strength can help me face myself. Oh, darling, I'll give you so much more than that. I don't want more. I wouldn't know what to do with it. Now. I love you, Judith. I want you to marry me. Fred. I want you to marry me, Judith. You do. You really do. Oh, that's very precious. I'm lonely, too. I need your companionship and your love to make me whole again. Oh, darling, be careful. We mustn't make it harder for ourselves. Oh, you're still afraid that I'm just your friend. No, no, I'm not. You do love me, and I'm grateful. But it's too late. A shadow's fallen on my earth. It mustn't fall on yours. But, darling, it's been falling since time began. Even as we speak... The earth is shouldering eastward. Come here, darling. Between now and now, there's been birth and the passing of life, sunset and dawn, weariness and answering sleep. And your shadow is mine. And your victory over it, that's mine too. I must never interfere with your being a doctor. You're kind of a doctor. You must promise me that. It must be part of our bargain together. Oh, I want to help you. I must give you something of me that will live on in your work after I've gone. When I've done that, I shall have done everything. I understand. I promise, darling. <laughs> We have a deficit for the month of $43.17. That's splendid, Mrs. Steele. As I recall, it was over 100 last month. At this rate, we'll soon be living within our income. No, don't tell the doctor. He won't even mail out his bills. Oh, Jenny, who did collect the bills before I came? The patients collected them. <laughs> and still doing it, some of them. Here's John Hunter with a bill of $8 rented four months ago. My dear, if John Hunter ever paid a bill, the entire country would rock on its foundation. I know, and he's such a kind man. He looks just like a whore. Hmm. I'll take it. Hello? Yes? Montreal? Well, Dr. Steele isn't here. Is it person to person? I see. Well, he ought to be home soon. All right. An emergency call. I don't like that. Oh, Jenny, they wouldn't call him to Montreal, would they? It's possible. Oh, you mustn't fret every time he goes out of the house. I know. I grudge every minute he's away, every second. Well, then you shouldn't have married a doctor. Oh, please don't say that. Oh, I didn't mean it, ma'am. Jenny, what was he like when he was a little boy? Who? Dr. Steele. Was he a nice little boy? He was not. He was nasty. All little boys are nasty. Oh, he wasn't. Oh, very well, then, just as you wish. <laughs> Oh, dear, I wish it wouldn't cloud up like this. What? I don't like it getting overcast so suddenly. It means a storm. Storm? But the sun's out. Why, it's bright out today. Oh, it was. You mean it's getting dimmer every second. It's getting so dark, I... <gasps> Jenny. What is it? What is it, Mrs. Steele? Nothing, I... I'm just dizzy. Well, sit down here. Here, sit down here. There. Is it all right? Yes. Yes, it's all right now, Jenny. Oh, 
Oh, you frightened me, ma'am. Oh, it was nothing. And, and Jenny. Yes? You mustn't tell the doctor. You mustn't. Do you hear? Oh, but... Do you, you hear, see... Jenny? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Montreal? Hello, I'm waiting for a call from Montreal. All right. Hello, Platt? Steele speaking. Do you want me? Oh. Yes. Is the skull fractured? Fred. Shh, Montreal. Well, what are the chances? Well, no. No one very sick at the moment, but anything might happen. No, no, not from what you say. No chance unless you operate. Yes, it is. Very delicate. Yes, I've had good results, but I... Oh, you must, Fred. You've got to go. Wait a minute. But, darling, it means at least three days. But you must. You can save a life up there, Fred. Tell him you'll go. Hello. How about the trains? Yes, I can make that one. All right. Goodbye. There's a train at six in the morning. But I... I don't like this, Judith. It's all right, Fred. Believe me. Almost time, darling. I know. Decent of you to sit up with me. I'll have to leave in a few minutes. Yes. I don't see why Platt can't get someone else up there. There are plenty of doctors in Montreal. But none like you, darling. I was going over your books last night. Yeah. What'd you find? Oh, certain debts owing my husband that cannot be paid. Not one that you haven't repaid a thousand times. Have I really been a good wife? You've been a wonderful wife. Oh, I've loved it so every minute. How can I make you understand? Fred, look out there. Out of the window. Somehow it's been like that. Shining and quiet. It's deep winter. Deep winter. And behold, snow was upon the earth in silence. And all things had been fulfilled that were to be. And there was no emptiness under heaven. Judith, dear. If anything should happen... Oh, my God, Judith. Shh, darling. I walked to the mill dam yesterday. I haven't been there lately. Oh, we must go soon. Yes? There's snow on the evergreens. Is there? Fred... I found out at last. What? What it means to live up here. Why you wanted to come back. You must never leave here, Fred. You must go on living here. Always. You'd better go now, darling. I'm not going, Judith. I'll call Platt and tell him. Oh, darling, come here. No, I thought I could, but I can't. Fred, remember our bargain. No, words, that's all. I didn't know what they meant. I didn't know what I was to lose. It's my life now. Mine, this little time in all my life, and then... Then to have it taken away from me. My wife, whom I love. I can't stand it. There's a limit to what a man can bear. Fred, we have just one minute together. Look at me. I was never to fail you or keep you from your best. We've had our love, and we're complete. Nothing can hurt us now, for what we've had can never be destroyed. That's our victory. Our victory over the dark. And it is a victory, because we're not afraid. Thank you, darling. And you'll never, never look back? Never. Hold me close, darling. Oh, God, I'll hold you this way forever. Forever is now. Isn't it? Yes. 
Goodbye, darling. Goodbye. Good luck. Come on, Good darling. Luck. Mrs. Steele, is the doctor gone? Yes. He left this piece of paper with me. It has the address where he's going to be. He said in case you needed him. Give it to me, Jenny. Yes, ma'am. But, Mrs. Steele, you're tearing it. I'm not going to need him, Jenny. Because someone else needs him more. Who? Who needs him more? Someone who's going to live. Slowly the curtain falls and our play, Dark Victory, is ended. And now let me observe one of the happiest customs of the Lux Radio Theater by bringing back for a curtain call Barbara Stanwyck and Melvin Douglas as themselves. There are two things in particular, Eddie, for which I want to thank the Luxo people. Dark Victory is certainly one of them. It's such a grand play to me because it presents a down-to-earth problem that might confront any of us. But more than that, it proves that a kind of happiness can be found apart from the usual boy-gets-girl variety. It also shows that when you're faced with a situation which you're helpless to change, that you can be happy through honest acceptance of facts and by making the best of circumstances. That's an admirable philosophy, Barbara. I'd like to add just a little of what you've said, a word about doctors. Oh, you should be able to do that, Melvin. You came pretty near to becoming one yourself. <laughs> well, the nearest I came at it was to serve for a while in the Army Medical Corps. But there are times, as Doc Victory's pointed out, when surgeons and doctors are quite helpless to aid materially certain conditions. But they're constantly seeking. And little by little, they're constantly finding. For all we know, in some obscure laboratory, a doctor at this very moment may be making a tremendous discovery. Believe me, it's rather heartening to realize that in these troubled times, there are men who forget color and race and creed in a battle for all humanity. But, Barbara, you said there were two things for which you were grateful. Yes. I want to go on record once again for the product behind this program. I'm sure if all our listeners could come to Hollywood and see how popular Lux Soap is in all the big studios, they'd realize how much we depend upon it as it keeps our complexions exactly right for the camera. I always use Lux Soap at home, too, for the very excellent reason that, to me, it's the finest complexion care in the world. Coming from you, Barbara, we're especially glad to hear that. And now, Eddie, what about giving us another one of your recipes? I understand that poem of yours on how to make sauerbraten was quite a sensation. <laughs> oh, I can do other things besides cook. Really? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. I've been doing a bit of uh, vocalizing, you know, singing. <laughs> well, I know you're just begging to be asked, so go ahead. Well, what are you going uh, to won't, sing? <laughs> won't exactly be singing. It's a sort of a recitative, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it was, it was written by Franklin P. Adams and set to music by my friend Richard Hagerman. Uh, he's the noted musician, composer of Kapanzaki, and former conductor of the Metropolitan. It's called Rich Man, and Mr. Hagerman was brave enough to come here tonight to play it for me. Are you ready, maestro? The rich man has his motor car, his country and his town estate. He smokes 50 cent cigars and jeers at fate. He fribbles through the live-long day. He knows not poverty, a pinch. His lot seems light. His heart seems gay. He has a cinch. Yet though my lamp burns low and dim, though I must slave for livelihood, think you that I would change with him? Ha! You bet I would. Actor, poet, musician, Eddie, you're wonderful. Good night. Actor, poet, mu... Oh, well, what's the use? Good night, Eddie. <laughs> the play you will hear next Monday night is the drama of A Hunted Girl, our radio adaptation of that highly successful film, Mary Burns, Fugitive. Filled with excitement and romance, it's the story of a small-town girl who thinks she's in love with a man who later turns out to be a ruthless gangster. 
How real love and sanctuary finally come to Mary Burns provides an hour of great radio entertainment, especially when our stars will be three such superb and popular performers as Miriam Hopkins, Henry Fonda, Mary Astor, and Lloyd Lloyd Nolan. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Miriam Hopkins, Henry Fonda, Mary Astor, and Lloyd Nolan in Mary Burns, Fugitive. This is Edward Arnold wishing you all good night. Current this scene at the MGM Picture Art Man of Pan Returns. And in the Columbia film, there's always a woman. Mr. Arnold begins work shortly on the Columbia film, You Can't Take It With You. The screenplay, Dark Victory, is owned by Selznick International Studios, producers of the recent Technicolor picture, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Louis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox Studios, where he directed music for Shirley Temple's new picture, Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Your announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the National Columbia Broadcasting System. isolated on a remote plantation in the crawling Amazon jungle, and an immense army of ravenous ants is closing in on you, swarming in to eat you alive, a deadly black army from which there is no escape. Escape. Produced and directed by William N. Robeson and carefully contrived to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to the Amazon jungle and to a creeping, crawling terror as Carl Stevenson told it in his gripping story Linogen versus the Ants. I first met Lanningen while performing my duty as district commissioner. As my boat neared his plantation landing, I saw him upon the riverbank, regarding me with mild interest. A great hulk of a man with bristling gray hair, bulky nose, and pale eyes. His entire appearance somehow suggested an aging and shabby eagle. He escorted me to the terrace and had a drink brought. I came quickly to the point of my visit and issued my warning. Leiningen puffed placidly at a huge cigar and listened as I told him, unless they alter their course, and there's no reason why they should, they'll reach your plantation in two days at the latest. Uh Uh-huh. Well, it was decent of you paddling all this way just to give me the tip. Tip? Commissioner, even a herd of crocodiles couldn't drive me from this plantation of mine. But these aren't creatures you can fight. They're, They're an elemental force, a gigantic catastrophe. Ten miles long, two miles wide, ants, nothing but ants, and each one as big as your thumb, and each of them a fiend from hell. Unless you clear out at once, there'll be nothing left of you but a skeleton picked as clean as your own plantation will be. I'm not getting out. But you can't fight Yes, I can. I've got the best weapon there is, Commissioner. Intelligence. But can't I make you understand the hideous... I think it is you who do not understand... In the three years I've been here, I've met and defeated more than one catastrophe. Flood, drought, the plague. Events which caused many of my neighbors to flee for their lives. No, Commissioner, all my life I have lived with one creed. The human brain needs only to become fully aware of its powers to conquer even the elements. Leiningen, your obstinacy is endangering not only your own life, but the lives of your workers and their families. You don't know these ants. I tell you, you don't know these ants. Well, 
But Flanagan merely sat there puffing at his cigar and regarding me with a smug grin. And I knew it was hopeless. As I boarded my launch and cast off, I realized I'd never met a man like that. And I could not I help, help wondering, wondering what about the strange look in the commissioner's eyes as he boarded his launch and cast off. Undoubtedly, he thought me insane. No. <laughs> Well, he would not have been the first to think so. But I, Leidenchen, knew my own powers. I was sure of myself. I knew that intelligence directed aright always makes man the master of his fate. That night, I called my Indian workers together in front of the plantation house. I saw their faces go ashen with terror as I told them that the ants were coming. I watched them as they milled around, muttering... I said nothing more to them. Finally, one of the men stepped forward. Blas, the foreman. Uh, Patron, we have worked hard here for these three years. Uh, all of us. We have built the finest plantation in this district. We all share in it. It has been a home for all of us and our families. Now the ants come. So? Uh, those ditches we dug last year, the pipe we put in the ground, that was for the ants? Yes, that was for the ants. If we moved our families across the river, the ants could not reach them? Yes, that's right. And you? Uh, the ants are mighty. We know what they can do. All of us think that you are mighty. Patron, we will stay with you and fight against the ants. I knew that the men would give me that answer. I counted on it. I thought of the commissioner and wondered what he would say in such unquestioning confidence. Would he still think I was insane? All that or had he dismissed me out of my mind? mind? One man who calmly evaluated his chances against a deadly menace coolly decided he could win and was willing to stake his life on it, to risk a horrible death for it. It was terrifying. And yet it was fascinating. The next morning I sent for my assistant. Together we went to the huge map of the district which hung from a wall of my office and checked the last reported position of the ants. Last night they had reached here, about 70 miles above this fork in the river. Traveling southeast? Uh, yes. Directly toward Leinenshaw. Toward uh, whom, sir? That plantation at the bend in the river belongs to a man named Leinenshaw. When would you say the ants will reach there? Oh, yeah, I, I don't know... Uh, I imagine about uh, tomorrow noon. Tomorrow noon, still time. Uh, still uh, time? Uh, what do you mean, sir? Why, why nothing. But what did I mean? Still time for what? For Lanagan to flee or still time for me to... Even as I rejected the thought with horror, I knew that the fascination of that man was more than I could resist. That Lanagan's fight was drawing me back toward that plantation and death. I knew now past all doubt that I was going back. I had to. It was 10 o'clock in the morning when I rounded the bend and saw Lanningen's plantation before me. I put in at the dock and tied up the launch. Then I saw him standing on the bank above me, arms folded, stubby cigar in his mouth, and that same smug grin on his face. I made my way up to him. Ah, back with another warning, Commissioner? No. Back to stay a while? Yes. <laughs> you don't seem surprised. No, I'm not. You expected me? I thought you'd be back. Yeah, come along, we'll get some horses. You'll want to ride around the plantation, take a look at the defenses I've rigged up. Yes, I'll want to see the defenses. And the ants. We'll be getting a glimpse of them before long, I should think. Yes, the ants. The defenses Lanningen had devised were quite impressive. Surrounding three sides of the plantation like a huge horseshoe was a ditch, 12 feet wide. The ends of this horseshoe-shaped ditch ran into the river which formed the fourth side of the plantation. 
and at the upriver entrance to the ditch, Leinenjen had constructed a dam by which the river water could be diverted into the ditch. A large hand wheel controlled the floodgate of the dam, and apparently Leinenjen had ordered it opened immediately after my arrival. For as we now approached the ditch and rode along it, I could see that it was nearly full. Ah, how do you like my first line of defense, Commissioner? It's reassuring, like a moat around a castle. To... <laughs> Unless the ants know how to build rafts, they won't reach the plantation. But this is only the outer moat. There's a better one than this. Now, come along. We'll go up to the high ground where the buildings are. We can get a view from there. Leinenchen. Huh? I didn't see any women or children around the plantation or any animals. Yes, that's right. Moved them across the river. And even you think there is danger. Not because of danger, Commissioner. Matter of efficiency. Efficiency? Yes, yeah, cuts down on the efficiency of the men if they're worried about their families. Critical situations only become crises when oxen and women get excited. I see. Ah, here we are. Yeah, see the ditch? It's much smaller than the others. Yes, you've noticed how all the buildings are on this piece of high ground. The inner ditch surrounds them, and it's lined with concrete. But even filled with water, this is no barrier. It's not big enough. Why, if the ants get this far, they'll... They'll get no farther. This ditch wasn't built for water, Commissioner. You see the pipes leading into it? See those storage tanks on the hill? Petrol. We can throw up a wall of flame. Care a bit they won't like that? I hope you're right. Lannigan, look. Over at the edge of the jungle, all those animals. Yes. Running like the wind. Everything from jaguars to monkeys. Good heavens. Remember, they don't have any ditches. But can they escape? Now, they'll be all right as long as they don't get caught between the river and the ants. They can outrun the crawlers. But if they get trapped, it's either the ants or the crocodiles. Ah, look, look. Up there over the horizon. There are your ants. Look at them. It was a sight I will never forget. Over the range of hills, as far as I could see, crept a darkening hem, ever longer and broader until the shadows spread across the entire slope, then downward, downward, uncannily swift, and all the green herbage on the entire slope was being mowed as by a giant sickle, leaving only the vast moving shadow extending, deepening, and always moving nearer. Uh, they're a hideous lot. Leinenjen, we can't last against that. Look at them. Why, they will fill your ditches with their corpses and still have enough to destroy every one of us. We've got to run. Well, I... Uh, I... Uh, no, they haven't gotten to us yet, and they never will. The hostile army was approaching in perfect formation. No human battalions, however well-drilled, could ever hope to rival the precision of that advance. Along a front that moved forward as uniformly as a straight line, the ants drew nearer and nearer to the water ditch. As they approached, two outlying wings of the army detached themselves from the main body and started marching along the sides of the ditch, no doubt expecting at some point to find a crossing. And during this hour-long flanking movement, the main army remained still. Across the scant 12 feet of ditch, I stared at them, and they stared back at me. Solid mass, every one as big as my thumb with reddish black body and long legs. Suddenly, a sound so unearthly as to freeze our blood jerked our heads in the direction of the jungle on the far side of the ditch. Coming toward the ditch at a stumbling gallop was a singular being, a writhing animal-like blackened statue with a shapeless head and four quivering feet. It was a stag covered over and over with ants. Leinenjen threw up his rifle, and the stag fell lifeless to the ground, its agonies at an end. Horrified as I was, my curiosity impelled me to glance at my watch. I had to know how long the ants would take. After six long minutes, only the white, polished bones of the stag remained. Now I could see a change in Lanningen. Gone was the sporting zest of the novel contest. In its place was a cold, violent purpose. 
He had to beat the ants because he now knew how long it would take them once they got to us. Around four in the afternoon, the ant scouts, having found no crossing, there was a stirring among the main army. And then an immense flood of ants about a hundred yards in width commenced pouring in a glimmering black cataract down the flower slope of the ditch. Thousands drowned instantly, but the rest began using the bodies as bridges. Lanagan immediately swung into action. The dam, open the floodgate a little more. We've got to get the water in the ditch moving faster. Si, senor. Uh, look at them drown. The but they keep coming. Even though the current carries many of them away, they're advancing. Well, we'll fix them. Blas! Yes, senor. How about those shovels and petrol sprinklers? You passed them out to the men? Yes, sir. It has been done. Then get all hands here in a hurry. This looks like the spot for action. Hey, hey. Commissioner. Yes? Beginning to see what I was talking about? What do you mean? About intelligence being more than a match for anything it tackles. Take the ants. They've got no intelligence. If they had, they'd have attacked along the whole length of the ditch instead of a narrow front like this. They'd have been across by now. Uh, too bad I'm not running their campaign for them. You can joke about it like that with ants halfway across the All ditch? right, man. Busy with the shovels now. Dump some sand and quads on them. See how they like that. You with the petrol sprinklers. Stop pumping. Uh-huh. <laughs> they don't like it, Commissioner. They don't like it a bit. Look at them. Yes. But look at the ones on the far side of the ditch. Whole clumps of them rolling into the water. The rest are using them for bridges. Yes. Smarter than I thought. And they're widening their front, too. Some of them are getting across. Uh, grab a shovel, then, Commissioner. Make them regret it. <laughs> What's the matter? They kill him, my shovel, senor. Let on my eyes. It's the petrol, idiot. Toss your hands in the petrol. Don't stop now. The rest of you, club him. Club him. We cannot hold it back, senor. We must run. Keep at it. Keep at it. Don't stop now. Uh -huh. Ah, the water's moving faster. And now I've got the floodgates open. Yes, they can't hold their own against the current now. Uh, look at him, Commissioner. The water's carrying him away. We've beat him. We've won out. It was true. Leiningen had won. At least the opening round. The floodgates were left open to forestall any night crossing. But when dawn came, the dark blanket was still there, motionless across the ditch. Then we notice a feverish activity on the other side of the plantation. Here, a grove of tamarind trees lined the far end of the ditch, and every tree swarmed with the crawling insects. But instead of eating the leaves, they were merely gnawing through the stems so that a thick green shower fell steadily to the ground. Well, it looks as if it's feeding time for our friends, eh? Blas. Senor. Have all the petrol pumps brought here. Get every one over here except the lookouts on the other side. Then pass out the shovels. Uh, si, senor. Going to deprive them of a meal? A meal? Aren't they cutting down the leaves for food? No. I wish they were. It looks like I underestimated them when I said they didn't have intelligence. What do you mean? I said if they wanted to get across, they'd have to have rafts. And that's just what they've got. Those leaves are their rafts. Even as he spoke, the leaves went tumbling down the far bank by the thousands. The current drew them away from the bank, and each leaf carried several ants. Don't worry, as long as you can keep spraying them and shoveling dirt on their rafts, they can't land. But there will be too many. It's true. Look, more leaves in the ditch all the time. Why, they'll have a solid carpet to walk across in a minute. Uh, not so fast, Commissioner. I've still got a trick up my sleeve for them. The water! The ditch is drying up! Yes, yes, of course it's drying up. That's the plan. Those are the orders I sent to the dam. Are you mad? As soon as it's empty, what's to prevent the... Look, the water's way down. It's almost dry. They'll be able to come across the bottom. They'll not make it. The man at the dam will have opened the gates by now. To flood the ants? Right. But what a chance to take. If anything should happen... Uh -huh. ah, here it comes. Here comes the water. Yes, we'll give the crawlers a ditch to ride in. Right out to the river. There. Uh -huh. Look at them go. Heinengen's tactics were successful at first. The violent flow of water at the original depth raced through the ditch, overwhelming leaves and ants and sweeping them along. Three times the ditch was emptied. Three times the ants raced across its bottom and three times the rushing water arriving just in time carried them away. 
But the fourth time, as the water lowered nearly to the bottom of the ditch, we waited in vain for the rushing waters, Ayer. and then... Ayer. What's the matter? What's gone wrong at the dam? Just as the man at the dam lowered the water almost to the bottom, the ants attacked. Before he could open the floodgate, he was almost surrounded. He ran. The ants kept coming. They are across the ditch. Leinenson stood motionless, absorbing the news of his defeat without a word. Then he raised his pistol and fired three shots into the air. The prearranged signal for all the men to retreat instantly to the second line of defense. The concrete ditches more than a mile from the point of the invasion. Soon after we arrived there, the natives commenced straggling in silently. Leinenson waited until all of them had gathered, then he spoke to them. Well, lads, we won the first round and lost the second, but we'll smash the crawlers yet. Anyone who thinks otherwise can draw his pay and push off. There are rafts enough on the river and plenty of time still to reach them. You stay, then. Good. Thank you, lads. And you, Commissioner. I, I can't persuade you to give up the fight? You cannot. Then I stay, too. Yeah. I knew you would. Senor, senor. If you are the answer, read the ditch. They are trying to get across? No, senor. I didn't think they would. There's plenty of food out there for them. My fields and orchards, the work of three years. Ought to last them until morning, anyway. Yes, we were safe for that night. But the next morning, the black swarm was solid around us and their shock troops were hard at work. They were dropping shreds of bark and twigs and leaves into the petrol-filled ditches, forming a floating bridge across the surface of the liquid. Leinengen stood silently watching this operation, and I could see a grudging admiration in his face. Then, after several hours, the attack came. Down the ditch they poured, millions of them, and across the bridge of twigs, rapidly approaching the inner side. Leinengen sat motionless, watching them. Watching them. Leinogen, for the love of God, don't sit there like a statue. They'll be on us in a moment. Let them fill the ditch first. Ah. Now. All right. Everyone back. Blas. Hand me the torch. Now we'll see how our friends like a little heat. Flames from the ditch shot into the air, devouring ants by the millions. It was some time before the petrol burned down to the bed of the ditch, but when it did, the devils came back for more. Again, Lannigan fired the ditch to destroy them. And still again they came on, but at each successive firing, the task of the ants grew easier because of the film of ash which now covered the petrol. And as they returned to the assault time after time, a slow, sickening horror crept into my mind. I looked quickly at Lannigan, then at the petrol tanks. He read my gaze and nodded slowly. That's right, Commissioner. We could hold them off forever if our supply of petrol was unlimited. But it isn't. We've got enough to... Fill the ditch once more. Lanagan, isn't there any way, any way at all? We've got to do something I we can I know, can't... I know. There must be a way. There must be. Yes. Yes. What is it? We'll flood the whole plantation. Flood? But how? The river's higher than any point except this high ground we're on now. If the river was dammed all the way, it'd overflow that stone breakwater and flood the whole plantation. We've got to close the floodgate at the dam. That'll do it. You're mad. The dam is more than a mile away, more than a mile away. Lads, of... listen to me. Listen, lads, I'm proud of you. Now, there's still a chance. By shutting the floodgates on the dam and flooding the whole plantation from the river, the moment I'm over the ditch, set fire to it. That'll allow time for the flood to wash away the ants. Then all you'll have to do is wait for me. It's impossible. You can't get to the dam, let alone back. That's why you're wrong, Commissioner. I'll get there, and I'll get back. Take care of things while I'm gone, huh? I watched him as he calmly pulled on high leather boots, drew gauntlets over his hand and stuffed the spaces between breeches and boots, gauntlets and arms, with petrol-soaked rags. He shielded his eyes with close-fitting mosquito goggles and plugged his nostrils and ears with cotton. Then the natives drenched his clothes with petrol. Blas, who acted as doctor to the men, smeared a salve over him, and finally Lanningen was ready. As he stood calmly surveying... It's ready for the run, I realized that this is as it should be. I, Leinogen, would meet the ants and defeat them, or be defeated by them. 
<laughs> Leinenchen versus the ants. Yes, it was right that it should be like this. But now there was no more time for thought. Only action. I took a deep breath and then bounded across the ditch and among the ants. I ran. I ran in long, equal strides with one thought, one sensation in my being. I must get through. I dodged the trees and shrubs. Except for the split seconds my soles touched the ground, the ants would have no opportunity to alight on me. I ran on. I was halfway to the dam before I felt ants under my clothes and a few on my face. I struck on them mechanically, scarcely conscious of their bites. And the dam drew toward me slowly. And the distance grew less, less. Finally, only a hundred yards away. Fifty. Then I was there. I gripped the ant-covered wheel, but... Uh, oddly, had I seized it when a horde of ants flowed over my hands and arms. I strained, and slowly the wheel turned. And turned more. And the floodgate was swinging slowly shut. Then it was shut. And the water was rising. Rising behind the breakwater. Closer to the top. Closer. And then it was spilling over. Flooding of the plantation had begun. I let go of the wheel and started back through the ants. I was coated from head to foot with the fiends. Tongues of fire stabbed at me as they bit into my flesh. I almost lost my head with the pain as I ran, knocking ants from my body, brushing them from my bloody face. And then one bit me just below the rim of my goggles. I managed to tear him away. But the agony of the bite and its venom drilled into the eye nerves. I saw now through circles of fire into a milky mist. I was almost blinded. But I knew that if I tripped and fell... I ran on, my heart pounding as if it would burst. Blood roaring in my ears, a giant's fist battering my lungs. And then I could see dimly that wall of flame at the ditch, but it was too far away. I could not last half that distance. I stumbled and fell. Felt myself being swarmed over, devoured. Tried to rise. A great weight. And then suddenly the vision of the half-devoured stag in my brain. Six minutes, then nothing but bones. I couldn't let that happen to me. I couldn't die like that. To my feet. To my feet. Drag myself forward. To the flame. The ditch. The ring of flame. Closer now. Only a little closer. It seemed we had waited for hours when all at once through the blazing ring around us an apparition hurtled and fell full length on the ground. It was Leinenchen, alive with ants, unconscious, with glazing eyes and lacerated face. We rushed to him, stripped off his clothes and tore at the ants that covered him. His body seemed almost one open wound. In one place, I could see a white bone. Later, as the curtain of flame lowered, I looked out where the blanket of ants had been and saw only a vast expanse of water, covering the entire plantation and working its way to within a few feet of the concrete ditch. The ants were gone, drowned. And Leiningen had won. He lay on his bed, his body swathed from head to foot with bandages, but alive and still in command. Everything in order? Everything's in order. I... Told you I'd come back. Uh -huh. Even if I am a bit streamlined. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and tonight brought you Leinengen vs. the Ants by Carl Stevenson. Adapted for radio by Robert Reif, with William Conrad as Leinengen and Lou Merrill as the commissioner. 
Music was conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhr. Next week... You are groping through a dark alleyway in the French Quarter of New Orleans, with terror driving you on, and always before your eyes is the malevolent stare of a voodoo man, striking you with a deadly curse from which you must escape. Next week, we escape with William Irish's eerie story of a voodoo-haunted band leader, Papa Benjamin. Good night, then, until this same time next week, when we again offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Esther presents the Screen Guild Players. The Lady Esther Screen Guild play tonight, Dark Angel. The starring players... This is Ronald Coleman. This is Merle Oberon. This is Donald Crisp. Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in one of the most beautiful love stories the screen has ever known. It is a radio adaptation of the Samuel Goldwyn picture, Dark Angel, and it stars Merle Oberon as Kitty Vane, Ronald Coleman as Alan Trent, and Donald Crisp as Sir George Barton. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players in Dark Angel. was in the last war, and then as now, men fought and suffered, and lived in the hope of going home. And now, after almost a year in the mud of France, Alan Trent has come home, home to the lovely English country house where he was raised, home to his childhood sweetheart, Kitty Vane. Ah, Kitty, Kitty, if you knew what it means to see you, to talk to you, if you knew how frightened I've been. Frightened? You frightened, Alan? Yes, frightened. Frightened of coming home, of finding that you had changed, that you didn't feel the things I wanted you to feel. Frightened now of saying what I want. Alan. Or maybe I can't say it all. Maybe I can't say any part of it. I'm scared, Kitty. Kitty, I've so much love for you. I... It's like something you've saved up for a lifetime, and then it all comes at once. Alan. Alan, I wanted to hear that so badly. Oh, but you must have known. I wasn't sure. I said to myself, I've always been around. Perhaps he's just used to me. Perhaps he'll meet some other girl. Oh, Kitty, if you weren't here, I'd stop living. I'd stop breathing. I'd stop wanting to breathe. Don't ever go away. I won't, ever. I promise. Alan, we ought to tell your mother. What should we tell her? We're going to be married. Day after tomorrow? Tomorrow. Why, you shameless <laughs> hussy. <laughs> Alan, dear. Mother, we were just coming into... What is it? What's wrong? They just phoned a telegram from the village. The war office, Alan. The war office? Not my leave. It hasn't been cancelled. I'm afraid you'll have to go tonight. You're to sail from Folkestone in the morning. Whom else could we ask, sir? 
You're our vicar. If you'd just marry us tonight, before I go... Alan, I've uh, tried to explain to you. There must be some way. You've known us all our lives. And no two I'd rather see joined in marriage. Even two hours ago, it might have been possible. Now it's too late. Too late. I'm sorry. I have an evening service. Alan, I wish there was something I could do. Well, thank you anyway, sir. God bless you both. Good night. After all these years, Kitty, we're two hours late. Two hours that may change our lives. No, they won't change our lives. Alan, I'm coming to Folkestone with you. Oh, darling, you can't. Why not? Well, if we belong to each other. I marry you, Alan Trent, in front of a church. And I marry you, Kitty Vane, for always, until the day I die. Not half a bad room to start our married life, is it? Is it, darling? Oh, Kitty. I, I'm sorry. I was listening to the guns. Oh, they're far away, Kitty. Across the channel. Don't hear them. They'll stop. All those things going by. Down there in the street. They aren't far away. Oh, it takes a lot to run a war. Motor lorries, horses, tanks. And men. Thousands and thousands of men. And in a little while, you'll be one of them. You'll be gone with the rest of them. You'll be... Stop it. Oh, listen, darling. They're going. I'm going. There's nothing to be done about it. We must face the truth, Kitty. All we have is tonight. One night to live a whole life together. So we'll have to pretend. We're married, you see. We've been married quite long, and we're having dinner with our family. Yes, with our family. Now, would you like another glass of Sauterne, my dear? Please. Uh, tell me, uh, do you think uh, Mimi is old enough for some wine? Mimi? Uh, that's our youngest, don't you remember? She's right there at the foot of the table. <laughs> Children, Agatha, Bertram, Harold, Mimi, this is a very special occasion. Your parents' 25th wedding anniversary. 15th. Uh, please, my dear. Uh, children, uh, 25 years ago, your mother was a lovely sight. The most beautiful girl I ever saw. And your father, children? Uh, Kitty, uh, can't you do something with Mimi? She just bit little Harold on the arm. <laughs> Mimi, behave yourself. Now, children, as I was saying, your father was the finest, dearest, kindest... Your father loved your mother as no one ever loved before. Your mother loved your father since the world began. Since before time. Since... Since... Five o'clock. Time to shove off. I'll get my wrap. Oh, no, no, please. Don't come. It would only make it more difficult. Just sit right here and close your eyes. That's it. That's a good girl, Kitty. That's a brave girl. I love you. I will always love you. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, Alan. Goodbye, my love. Another letter today. Oh, such a wonderful letter. Aren't all of Alan's letters wonderful? Oh, but this is very special, you see. He thinks he'll get another leave just as soon as they... As soon as they what? Kitty! It's... It's nothing. Only... Just then I felt such a sharp pain. And it's silly, isn't it? I thought I heard the guns. Remember, men? A small patrol. It's dark. Jerry's can't see us if we hug the ground. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Single file. Ten, twenty feet apart. I'll take the lead. All right, come on, let's go. Captain, sir. 
There's a big one coming over. Look out, sir. You all right, sir? Captain. Captain. Captain Trent. I won't believe it. I won't. What if he hasn't written for a month? Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's had no chance to write. Two months. That's not so long. Maybe his letters have just gone astray. Anything could happen in a war. Three months. What if it's true? Four months. What if it's true? Six months. Six months. Oh, Alan. Alan, I loved you so much. That's it, sir. That's fine, fine. Just keep the cane out in front of it. That's fine. You're making real progress, sir. And you've only been here five months. Is that how long it's been? Five months? Didn't you know, sir? I'm afraid I lost track. The dead don't have much use for time. Ah, oh, now, really, sir. That ain't no proper way to talk. Sir George is doing wonders with you men. A regular miracle worker he is. Can he give me back my sight? Ah, uh, I know, sir. You're on the bitter side right now, but that'll pass, you mark my word. Wait and see how you feel six months from now. You sent for me, Sir George? Yes, Crane, I did. Mills has been telling me you want to leave. Oh, I've been here long enough, don't you think? Mm, a year next week. I'm afraid our training school hasn't helped you very much. Oh, if that's true, it's my fault, sir, not yours. You've been finding something within yourself, haven't you? And you don't want to talk about it? Well, then, the rest is just routine. I'm assigning Mills to you as an orderly. I'd rather not. Those are rules, Crane. He'll take you to your home and get you settled and... I'm not going home. I have no home. And your name isn't Roger Crane, is it? It's as good a name as any other. Your card says that when you were picked up, all means of identification had been destroyed. And later, you gave your name as Roger Crane. I could have checked that, you know. I know. I've been grateful you didn't. As a matter of fact, I even had a clue. It was among your personal things. A picture. A picture? The picture of a very pretty young girl. And across the bottom was written, Come back to Kitty. Why aren't you going back to her? Because I'm blind. Because I won't be pitied. So because that's... I won't let myself be a nuisance. That's been your fight. Well, all right. Then fight it through. Go home. Do it for me. Help me to prove to myself that my work hasn't failed. That you can go back to your friends and live among them like an ordinary man. You think I could? Yes, Crane, I do. I wanted to... Every hour, every day. It's still early morning. The sun is out. Before it goes down, you can be home. Before it goes down, I can be home. Yes, it's true. Think of it. Before it goes down, I'll be... I'll be home. I'll be home. Think we're coming into Medford now, sir. Yes, that, that, that's the whistle for the crossing, just outside the village. Oh, it won't be any time at all now, Mills. Our place is just 15 minutes from the station. Oh, 20, perhaps, in that dilapidated old cab. A cab, sir? Won't there be anyone there to meet you? Oh, I know. I, I didn't tell him I was coming. Uh, I decided it all so suddenly. Well, you, you won't mind me mentioning it, sir, but, uh, well, I mean, if, uh, if they don't know, uh, uh, mightn't it be a bit of a shock to them, sir? Huh? A shock? Oh, I, I'm sorry, sir. I, I'd better be getting the luggage out. I'll be back in a minute, sir. What a shock. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Even if she's brave. Even if she tries to smile. Take my hand, darling. I'll help you, dear. 
I'll always help you. That's him. He's blind. It's the girl I'm sorry for. Having to help him day in, day out. Well, why didn't he stay away? He loves her, he says. Take my hand, darling. I'll help you. I'll help you. Help me? Help me? Did you call, uh, sir? Oh, sorry, Mills. I, I... I'll get the rest of this luggage, then. No. I think you'd better leave it here. But we're just pulling in to Medford, sir. It doesn't matter. We're not getting off. Lady Esther has presented Act One of Dark Angel, starring Donald Crisp, Merle Oberon, and Ronald Coleman. In just a moment, we will hear the Lady Esther Screen Guild players in Act Two. But first, a word from our hostess, Lady Esther. Deep in every woman's heart is the belief that she could be more fascinating if only she put her mind to it. Don't you think that's true? A woman can make herself look more fascinating. And the way to start is with the face, which is your subject, you. And frame it as you would frame a lovely painting. Now, the very first step, perhaps the most important step of all, is to find a truly flattering face powder. By that I mean not just a covering to hide the shine, not just a lifeless film or coating on the skin, but a face powder that gives your skin a youthful radiance of its own. So many women have written me <clears throat> that just changing to Lady Esther face powder has made a thrilling change in their appearance. They say my powder does wonderful things for the appearance of their skin, helps to make it look softer, smoother, and more youthful. They say it gives their skin a certain clean, fresh look that everyone admires. Well, there's a very good reason why my powder is so unusually flattering. You see, Lady Esther face powder isn't just mixed, just sifted, the way ordinary powder is made. My powder then goes through the patented and exclusive Lady Esther twin hurricane process. The tiny particles of color and powder are blown together with the force of hurricanes until they're perfectly blended into a delicate film of beauty for your skin. Try Lady Esther face powder and see how much smoother it is than ordinary powder, how it helps hide little lines and blemishes. See how deep and lovely the shades are, how Lady Esther face powder adds instant new beauty and interest to the appearance of your skin. It's two years later now, and Alan Trent, or as he now prefers to call himself, Roger Crane, is living in a little cottage in the country with Mills, his orderly. Now, them are roses, sir. Real roses. Every petal turned like a lip for a kiss. <laughs> you know, Mills, sometimes you come dangerously close to being a poet. Oh, why, only this morning Tim Whiteley was by. Ed Gardner for Sir Gerald Mordaunt, he is. And he dropped me a compliment on the roses he did. Did he? Oh, my word, sir. And I told him I wasn't the one who deserved it. I said Mr. Crane did it all himself, he did. Really, sir, it's plain remarkable how you get about. In the garden, in the house. Uh, I mean, considering that... Uh, 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 well, I mean... Uh, you mean uh, I can't see, Mills, hmm? Now, Mills, would you believe I see some things better than you do? Every bush in the garden, every chair in the house, every ashtray, every door... Even the telephone. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Roger. Is that you? Well, Sir George, how are you? Oh, Where are you? In London. I've been wondering about you. Haven't heard from you in weeks. Oh, I've been busy, that's all. My roses, you know. Look, Roger, I'm a bit on the tired side. Thought I'd get away for a day or so. Could you stand a guest? When can you come? The late afternoon train. We'll be looking for you. It'll be wonderful to see you again, Sir George. <laughs> Good dinner, a warm fire, and brandy Napoleon 1815. Ah, it was good of you to bring it, Sir George. May I pour you a spot? Please. You know, when I was a kid, I used to think Napoleon made this himself. Spent that whole year making brandy. There you are. Thanks. 
I never could understand how he had time for Waterloo with all that brandy making going on. Uh, how is it? Not bad. Not bad? Well, what's the matter with you? Roger, I may as well say it. I want to get something off my chest. Yes? That time you left the training school, you remember a certain picture? Yes. I know her name now. Kitty Vane. Yes, that's right. Kitty Vane. I didn't pry. Her picture's been in all the magazines. She's made quite a name for herself, riding to hounds. Has she? As a matter of fact, there's a picture in this week's Tatler, right here on the table. She used to be a guest of Sir Gerald Mordaunt. Sir Gerald? Not two miles down this very road. Yes, I know. Sometimes his gardener drops by to envy our roses. Alan, are you quite satisfied here with your roses? Oh, yes. Yes, quite satisfied, Sir George. I see. Uh, by the way, uh, when is she riding with Sir Gerald? This weekend, I believe it said. She's there now. Yes. Well, good night, old man. Good night, Sir George. So near. So terribly near. Oh, Kitty, it could have been so different. So very different. Hello, darling. I'm home. Kitty, dear, you're so late. Now, don't scold me. I know I'm late. I met the vicar, and you know how hard it is to get away from him. I brought a sirloin home for dinner. I'd better go and give it to Cook. Oh, no, don't go. Oh, but darling, the sirloin. Now, now, which is more important, me or the sirloin? Well, you, I imagine. Now, your hair's all blown about, and your cheeks are flushed, and your nose is cold. And you look beautiful. <laughs> I look like an idiot. And so do you. <laughs> the way people always look when they love each other too much. Uh, Kitty. 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 What is it, Roger? Anything wrong? No, I... I must have dozed off a bit. I'm afraid I knocked the fire screen over. That's strange. I could have sworn I heard you call Kitty. Did I? Roger, you're sure you're right with yourself? I thought I was. Now I'm not sure. Maybe I've lied to myself. Maybe I just pretended I had a life. Maybe I told myself I was happy. Roger. I always knew sometime she'd be close by me like this. I should have put a thousand miles between us. I knew that, but I didn't have the guts. Now I've found myself out, the work of all these years, thrown away. Isn't there something I can do? Not a thing, I'm afraid. Sorry I let go like this, old man. You, you better go up and get some sleep. Good night, then. Good night. Sir George. Yes, Mills? Is he all right, sir? He seems to think so. Look here, Mills. Is there another telephone in the house? In the kitchen, sir. An extension. Then be a good fellow and put a call through for me, will you? A trunk call, sir? No. Sir Gerald Morden's place. I want to talk to Miss Kitty Vane. Sir George, you mean to say that on your own authority, without even asking me, you... I'm sorry, Roger. I knew that it was right and that it had to be done. I had to see you get this thing straight. Now, please understand. Did you tell her I was blind? No, just that you were here. Is she coming alone? I think so. She didn't say. She ought to be here any minute now. I'll go to my room. You want to be alone, I'm sure. I won't be tricked like this. I won't. Mills! Mills! Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. Mills... Is the room as it usually is? Oh, yes, sir. Quite the same, I'd say. Ah, it's got to be absolutely the same. Now have a good look. Uh, my pipe. Matches. Cigarettes on the table? Yes, sir. Everything in its place, sir. Ah. Uh, wh wh what's in that big flower bowl tonight? Uh, the usual thing, sir. Yellow ro tea roses. Good. Thanks, that's all. Uh, no, wait. Uh, where's this week's tattler? Right here, sir, by the lamp. All right. What? Well, there's someone stopping here, I believe. Looks like a lady, sir. Yes. A very pretty lady. All right, Mills. Show her in. Right, sir. In there, ma'am. In the study. Thank you. Alan. Alan, darling. Hello, Kitty. Come in. Come in. It's really, really you. 
I always knew somewhere, sometime. That uh, we two would meet again? Yes, I, I think I always knew it, too. Alan. It's good to see you, Kitty. Sit down. Here. Uh, this chair's the most comfortable, I think. Uh, cigarettes are right there, and you'll have some coffee, won't you? Alan, you've so much to tell me. Oh, that's a long story. First, I want to hear about you. Uh, you'll take uh, sugar and cream, of course, if I remember correctly. You... Alan, where have you been? Where? Oh, I've been here. Been trying to write a bit. Not very good at it, though. I I'm afraid I, I spend too much time in the garden. Uh, the Those are my roses. I'm terribly proud of them. Alan, what is it? Uh, what is what? After all this time, after thinking you dead, after all this time I come here and find you. And you talk of roses. What is it, Alan? Tell me, darling. There's very little to, to tell. No, you've suffered. Something's hurt you. Why don't you tell me? Alan, Alan, why didn't you come home? It's hard to tell you, Kitty. The, the war... The war did something to me. I've changed. Changed? Oh, I don't know. When I came out, I, I wanted to be alone for a while. Start all over. Build a new life. I always meant to come back someday, but... Oh, I liked it here, and... <laughs> well, I just didn't come back. You mean you found... You found you'd stop loving me? That was it, Alan? I love you, Kitty. I... I loved you then, but... But in a different way, I suppose. I... I... I didn't have the... Courage to tell you. I see. I understand. I loved you then. I love you now as much. I love you with all my heart. I've never loved anyone else. I never will again. Goodbye, Alan. Won't you even shake my hand? Your... your hand? I've been holding it here. I... Alan. Look at me. What color dress am I wearing? Please. Please go. Please. So that was why. And I was so stupid. I couldn't see. I was the one who couldn't see. No, Kitty, no. You love me, you do. You love me still. Kitty, think what it means. It I... means life again. I've been dead. Oh, dearest, how could you know me so little? Kitty, listen to me. No, I won't. I, I won't. You made me promise once never to go away. I never shall. Never. I'll be with you always. Always. Oh, Kitty, if, <laughs> if you knew how I've dreamed about this. To hear your voice... To have my arms around you again. <laughs> darling, darling, you're crying. I know, and it's no time to cry. I won't. If you kiss me. Well, then just... Just to kiss the tears away. Forever. Forever. Mr. Coleman and Mr. Chris for bringing us the story of Dark Angel. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players are grateful indeed that you could be our guests tonight. And now, before we tell you about next week's program, here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. You just can't use Lady Esther face powder without looking younger, lovelier, more exciting. Now, I'm not saying this. Thousands of women are saying it. Women all over the country who've listened to me just as you are listening now and decided to try my powder and see for themselves if it really is so different from ordinary powder, so much more flattering. Well, they let us say that they convinced themselves. So many of them took the trouble to sit down and write me nice long letters and tell me all about the wonderful things my powder does for the appearance of the skin. Yes, every day women are discovering that Lady Esther face powder, made a new way by my patented twin hurricane method, is a delightfully new and different kind of face powder. Not only is the texture softer and smoother by far than the texture of ordinary powder, not only does it cling longer and keep the skin looking cool and fresh in hot weather, but even the shades are deeper toned and more lively, shades that add extra glamour and excitement to your summer skin. 
So why don't you, too, try Lady Esther face powder? There's no better judge in the whole world than your own eyes. And unless you're very different from thousands of others, I'm sure that what you see in your mirror will convince you that Lady Esther face powder is the most flattering powder you've ever used. Lady Esther, next week will present that delightful comedy with music priorities on parade. It will star Betty Rhodes, Jerry Colonna, Vera Vague, and Bob Crosby. Be sure to listen. Ronald Coleman appeared through the courtesy of the sponsors of his program, the Electric Auto Light Company. Merle Oberon can soon be seen co-starring with Paul Muni in the Columbia picture, The Love of Madame Sand. Donald Crisp is soon to be seen in Metro Golden Mayor's Technicolor picture, National Velvet. Truman Bradley saying goodnight for Lady Esther. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.